this meeting of the uh, Dunedin City Council, uh, where we consider the uh, annual plan. So to begin, uh, there is firstly no public forum today, uh, neither are there any apologies. Uh, declarations of interest, are there any changes to the declarations register? And so I imagine that uh, Councillor Hulam will be a little bit late. Uh, any, no, any, are there any changes to the declaration register? Very good. So, um, so there are uh, no, uh, no need to put a motion regarding that. Uh, yes. I've got to move that we accept it. Okay, so we'll <laughs> um, I move that the council uh, notes the elected members register attached uh, in attachment A. Councillor Mayhem, all those in favour? Against? Carried. Uh, the next, the first of our reports for today, our report number four in the supplementary agenda is the CEO overview uh, for the annual plan. Ms Graham, Mr Logie and Ms Allen will speak to the report. Do, are there any questions or would you like to... Um, Make commentary? Okay. Take it away. Good morning, councillors. Uh, you have in front of you the um, overarching report um, prepared by staff um, as a background to how we've developed the annual plan budgets. As you um, are aware, these budgets are exceptions only and um, reflect any changes vis-a-vis um, -vis year three of the current long-term plan. The budgets have been prepared um, in an entirely different financial environment than when the 10-year plan was prepared. So we have had inflationary pressures and a range of other changes that have had to be incorporated into these budgets. and. Um, in the draft, staff are required to um, propose a rates rise in the draft and the draft was prepared with 6.5% as the proposed rate rise in line with um, the financial strategy. And that seemed a, a logical place to set that number and so that's how the budgets have been prepared. Um, what the budgets show is that there is still quite a lot of work to do to, um, to, to make the forward position sustainable and it, the report signals um, a whole uh, raft of work that needs to be done as part of the next 10 year plan process and we're signalling signaling that early because and you'll see um, in paragraph 14 of the report we detail some of the things that we think will need to be a focus for the council and for our community as we start working on the next 10 year plan and that includes really serious discussions and, and look at how we deliver some of our services at the level of service that we deliver, um, how we have a sustainable capital program, um, how we integrate the Council's aspirations around the strategic refresh and then um, what what we do with um, water depending on where the reform agenda of the government um, lands and at this point there's still some uncertainty about what the impacts of that but we've been required um, by law to prepare um, that we are required to prepare the LTP as if water is going and so that's what the Act requires us to do and so that's the basis that we we have approached these budgets as well. I know there's been some commentary about that but the current legislative settings require that that's the approach we take so that's what we're doing. Um, and there are a range of other things that we will need to look at. The capital expenditure budget is always very challenging. We have the interest rates which we have signalled have increased um, and that's and given the um, level of capital work that has been undertaken this year um, that that has impacted on our costs and so interest rates are, re are c something that we are very conscious of and as such we've worked or are working to try and pull back the capital program to that which is in year three of the 10-year plan which is a just a tad over 145 million dollars so that's the assumption that we have built into this budget as well. Um, and we are working really hard with the teams the, and the main capital delivery teams to work out what that will look like in order for you to consider it in May. 
uh, that we're simply not in a position to present it uh, at, at the moment because there is still a degree of uncertainty in many of the budgets, especially the transport budget, which is proving very challenging. Um, but the teams are working on it and we will um, present that to Council. Um, I think the other main highlights, I think, Gavin, is there anything else you think? So just in relation to the capital budget, just so you're aware, you may or may not, not notice, remember when we did the capital budget for this year, we put a timing adjustment of $6 million in to bring the, the program back to 189. We've done the same in this budget, so you'll notice that there's a negative capital budget currently sitting in governance and support, and that's effectively a $10 million adjustment. So effectively, the, the, the budget that we're working on at the moment is 156, and we've, we've indicated that we need to take another 10 out of the program to get us back to the 146, which is what on, what's on the 10-year plan. In terms of um, water, the water budget that we've included in the numbers here is the budget per the 10-year plan. So uh, you'll remember that we put a small uplift, we put a $15 million uplift in this annual plan for the, for the purposes of getting this to a stage, um, we've taken that out and just put their budget back to the 10-year plan. One of the challenges we're going to have is that with the legislation being enacted at the end of last year, anything we do that's different to the 10-year plan um, will require some sort of DIA approval. So therefore we have to be very careful about what we put in our budgets. And, and I can give a practical example of that. We have. Um, is it water treatment plants, Simon? The, main, the maintenance work for the water <coughs> treatment plants is a um, <coughs> ELT have signed off a contract for that, um, for the ongoing maintenance of our water treatment plants, which you know is a very sensible and prudent thing for us to have done, but it requires sign off by the DIA, and they've yet to sign it off. And so, um, and we will need to have conversations, I think, with the DIA about what's going to happen with that, because we need some certainty to be able to continue to maintain our water treatment assets. And then just a couple of other follow-ups of depreciation. So obviously we've got the increase in depreciation that we've uh, indicated through the financial reporting for the current year. And um, the bulk of that sits in three waters. Again, probably not prudent at the stage to rate for that, given that, that, that there is a change imminent based on the current circumstances. Obviously by May we, have more, we may have more information on the water reform and whether that's going to be delayed or not, but certainly to rate for that in the current environment is probably not the right thing to do. Um, at that Valuation for Three Waters is going through, it's been peer reviewed by a, another valuer. They have come back with some recommendations. There's a chance that the valuation may go down slightly, but um, the depreciation may or may not change. So it may change, but it won't change the fact that we'll end up with a deficit budget. It may just change the quantum of the deficit. Um, in terms of interest, um, we have increased the interest expense by $9.5 million. The interest rate we've put in the draft budget is 4.85%. We're currently paying 4.35. Given that there's a probable 50 basis points uplift going to occur today, 4.85 seems to be the, the place to start, albeit that because our debt is hedged, we technically will have a slightly lower rate. But there are still indicating that, that there could be further increases as we head into the new financial year. Um, in terms of the 9.5, about 5 million of that rate relates to the rate increase from 3.6 last year to 4.85 and the balance is the additional capital or the additional debt that we're required to fund the capital program, both this year and obviously flowing into next year. When we've done this budget, um, we've talked about funding depreciation and recognising that we can't fund depreciation at that level. So what we've done, and if you go over to, I think the, the important table is on page 10, note 46. So what we've tried to do this, we've, we've done a, what we call a funding impact statements. So what a funding impact statement does is it takes the income statement and removes all the non-cash stuff, so it starts talking about cash. Um, so what we've done here is shown the, the cash that's going to come out of our operations. So as you can see, it was 58.6 million in the current year. It's going up to 60.4 in the proposed budget. So the good thing there is it's not going backwards, it's, 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 it's going up, so that's a positive. Um, the subsidies and grants for renewals, that is primarily NZTA funding, and that decrease is a reflection of the FAR rate going down. But you do need to be aware they are not fully funding our renewals expenditure. So the effective FAR rate for, for transport is actually 33%. So we are having to fully fund a chunk of our program now, because NZTA are not fully funding. And that's across the country, would be fair to say, Mr Drew? Yep. Um, we have the increase in investment, so it's a capital injection we put into um, DCHL each year, primarily to provide some funding for the stadium and the stadium operating company. 
So what that shows is that we've got a funding surplus deficit on our renewals. Uh, this year is 41 million, which is an indication of the uplift that we put into the to the budget. Um, next year dropping to 23. So effectively, to correct to, to correct that, you would have to be looking at a, a rate increase just to get that back to zero, of around 11 percent, 11.5 percent, over and above the 6.5 that's included in the budget. How many percent is that? 11. So it's, it's two million dollars as a as a percent on yep. on rates. And that's me. Yes. Any questions? So, Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor, um, and thanks for the CEO report. It pulls no punches, so thank you. It's um, it's, um, it's it's in our faces, and and of course factual. So, two questions, and I think um, a couple have been answered by your overviews. But going back to the the big hit, which is obviously the revaluation, particularly three waters, and the depreciation cost. And the mention that I think it was in point 33 or 39 <coughs> that the valuation will may be reduced um, once it goes through the the audit review. Is there also a chance that it may may increase? Not based on the peer review information that we're seeing. Okay. Um, and I think you've largely answered the second question around the 4.85 percent. Um, interest rate setting and that's obviously I mean a lot of crystal ball gazing here but we're likely to see in what four hours another increase um, an increase is ahead do you think this is conservative or do you feel confident that's a, a good place setting so the last prediction we had from um, Denise Treasury was that the 4.35 would like to likely to be the hedge rate going into the new year however Given that we had the increase this year, I've, I've been relatively conservative and recognised that there is going to be increases that flow through. So it might be that it starts the year at 4.35, but there may be an increase in the 1st of January, which is what happened this year. So, And just so we're clear here in terms of the comment the CEO made around the depreciation cost, and if we were um, of a mind to pass that on to the ratepayers, we're looking at 17% or thereabouts just for that one item, is that right? Yeah, and that would obviously trigger some sort of consultation with our community, because and, and effectively it goes beyond your, the current financial strategy. And final question for now is, in point 33, it talks about the there's no increases have been factored into the draft budget around salary increases for existing staff. Can you just give me a sort of general guide of what, say, a one percent one percent cost would be? Sorry, rise would be. In about eight hundred eight hundred thousand dollars. So okay, thank you. That's really helpful. But the um, the budget allowance, the vacancy that we are carrying uh, at the moment, gives um, if these drafts are approved, gives an an amount of money that could be applied to a salary increase if those vacancies weren't filled. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question around paragraph 20 on page 7, which talks about the um, that we're not delivering a, a balanced budget. And I note that the um, Local Government Act clearly requires us to deliver a, a balanced budget. So I just wonder what are the what are the consequences around not delivering a balanced budget? So um, previous councils will recall we had an unbalanced budget um, a couple of years ago when it related to COVID. So it's all about financial prudence, given that the current environment in relation to the three waters reform is still yet to be determined. Um, I think there's a degree of argument to say that it would be, we'd have to be careful about increasing our rates to fund that depreciation if, if going forward we don't actually own those assets anymore. Um, this is not dissimilar to, if you have a look at the annual plan for Wellington City Council, uh, for the current year they had a $67 million operating deficit. And they, so there is a set of resolutions that council will have to approve when we do the adoption in um, June. So we can circulate those resolutions so that helps councillors understand what, what the decision making will have to be made. So this is my stage one accounting question. So if we have a, a net deficit of 38.476 million, does that, do we, do we borrow for that or does it kind of carry over? What are the consequences of that? Oops. So again, you go back to page 46. If you look at our cash surplus from operations, it's actually gone up by 1.788 million. 
Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, this question is actually for next year. Um, the changing of the asset value of Three Waters assets will obviously eventually, if, if we are to, if we get to keep them, will eventually come to the point that the ratepayers will have to deal with a new water rate which will reflect that asset. Um, given we will have to deal with um, the level of uncertainty that faces the next 12 months when it comes to those assets, are we going to bring them, <laughs> that's a bizarre thought, are we going to bring them into the long-term plan consultation um, even though at that point we're told not to actually talk about three waters? Uh, the, the report flags that three waters reform time and imp impacts is something that is a conversation we're going to have to consider as part of the long-term plan. And so I think we'll have a better idea in maybe the next four to six weeks about what that looks like, but I, at this point I don't think we can rule anything out. So it sits outside the scope of this year's planning simply because of everything that's to come down. Thank you. Councillor Van Der on page six, capital expenditure. Capital expenditure was forecast to be 204 million. And uh, we're now wanting uh, something more sustainable, which is in line with the year 10 plan of 145 million. That's a massive, almost $60 million difference. How do we attend to account for that? What it's going to get pulled back. So when we present the detail budgets, when we when we detail the capital budgets for in May, we will provide that analysis square. But effectively, it's not it's not not doing things. It's just reprofiling the timing of the work. We we currently have the capital teams looking at work that is currently contracted, work that is currently in delivery, and work that hasn't yet started. So we get a good sense across all of the main areas of um, what can and can't be rephased, I think that's Gavin's word, and we, it's a, and there's a lot of projects. So if you break down transport, for example, which is a large budget, there's any range of projects and then you look at that timing. And also we're talking with our contractors about, um, and I know this is to, near to your heart, about sustainable um, finances, it's about sustainable delivery for the market as well, and we think possibly in part that us having had our foot on the accelerator of our capital program has been inflationary in and of itself to a degree. So we're about trying to find a good balance with the market. So there's a lot of those conversations happening. Then we'll come back to council and say, here are your options, you choose. Given that we've had our foot on the accelerator, um, what particular capital projects are we now able to defer and put the brakes on? So that, that goes to my point and that's what we're looking at. So the analysis is now happening about what's being delivered. So stopping a project that's in delivery um, comes with a, a large degree of cost usually. Stopping something you haven't yet started, far simpler. And then things that are contracted um, need to look at what the, the contract requires. So we can't answer what projects yet, but in May there will be a full breakdown for Council to consider where it wants to um, set the capital program. On paragraph 22 and page 7, you highlight that it's the transport budget that is the most challenging uh, because of increased costs. Is our uh, capital transport uh, budget costs uh, uh, the ones, therefore, that you are going to have to most um, well, look at most closely to, to slow, defer or put into reverse? No, no, all the capital budgets are subject to equal scrutiny. There are different challenges um, in the transport budget that Mr Logie alluded to, in part because of the far rate and the fact that we are already rate subsidising a degree of that capital programme. And so they're different things, and, and Gav's going to jump in now. So just so we're clear, that comment on note 22 relates to the operating budget, so it's actually the maintenance component of the budget, not the capital programme. So there are challenges in terms of increased requirements for um, health and safety and traffic management that are coming through, and some of that's been driven by the, the national direction on, on um, traffic management for, for these sites, so that's where the costs are coming through. So that's purely the, 
the, the maintaining, not the capital projects. Uh, thank you. Councillor Cherry. Thank you. Um, just a follow-up question from Councillor Malley. Um, so um, you mentioned that potentially in the next four to six weeks we will hopefully know what's happening with three waters. So potentially come May when we're actually finalising the annual plan, there could be quite a change to, the, to our budgets. I suspect that the government won't change the settings that quickly because they'll have an if, if they're going to change things. I, I, we might have more clarity about the shape of the entities, for example, and what's going to happen, or if they're going to continue with the entity model. Um, they, My sense is that they won't change the expectations for the annual plans, but the, what we're required to do for the next LTP, which is prescribed, may change. Um, and one more question is a follow-up from Councillor Vandiver. So, um, on the draft annual plan that we're going out for consultation, which is exceptions basis, we won't actually be consulting on the changes to the capital program? No, because what we're proposing will be in line with year three of the LTP. And phasing, phasing um, differences won't, well, are unlikely to trigger significance. Uh, Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, two questions. Uh, Mr Logie, you mentioned the Wellington City Council uh, having an unbalanced <coughs> budget. And I recall when we previously had one during COVID, um, it was alarming, but the world didn't end. Uh, and I wondered if you could tell us uh, wider than that, are, are there other examples of unbalanced budgets at this time, uh, given the Three Waters um, question marks around uh, when and so forth? So Wellington was the one that stood out for me because that actually affected this year. I suspect there will be some challenges for all territorial authorities for the 23-24 budget. So we may we may see start seeing more of those unbalanced budgets coming through. Thank you. That's helpful to know. Uh, second question: um, the draft budget will have been prepared um, and very ably, might I say, uh, prior to Cyclone Gabrielle. Are there any? Um, has any thought been given around the flow-on impact of the cyclone? And I'm thinking of things like insurance costs and so forth, um, which will take a little while to play out. Any thoughts on that at all? So we've budgeted insurance. We've obviously allowed for an uplift in insurance um, for the 23-24 for the year. Very hard to predict. I think potentially it might not be cost of insurance. It might actually be capacity. So it might actually be your ability to buy the insurance rather than just the price. And were there any other uh, aspects uh, following uh, Cyclone Gabriel that you're thinking may change things between now and May? Well, I, I think the um, how Wakakotahi respond and what that means for um, territorial authorities outside the disaster area will be interesting to reflect on because I've already signalled that there are billions and billions of dollars of roading work required. Um, but we don't have any certainty around that yet. So uh, there is a range of uncertainties. And I think to Mr Logie's point about the insurance, um, as part of the LTP, all of those back-end functions and, and you know how we insure and what we insure and even if we do insure are going to be things that we need to discuss because it may become to a point where um, you know, we want to look at different options for that. Thank you. Thank you. There, thank you. Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I've got a couple of questions around uh, page 8, starting with uh, number 34. Um, and I know we have received uh, some answers to some of the questions, but they have in turn raised more questions for me. So, for example, the uh, increase in uh, community events costs, ostensibly. Um, picking on Thieves Alley, for example, and there may be some questions here that you can't answer, or off the top of your head. Are you able to tell me this year roughly how many vendors were at Thieves Alley? 150. 150. And I'm a, there it is a pay for presence at the event? I'm sorry, Councillor, I don't have that level of detail, but during our budget discussion uh, on that, um, that topic, we can make sure we can answer for you. 
So we don't know whether people have to pay to have a stall there? Uh, the exact detail I'll, I'll have to, to check, sorry. Because uh, my curiosity is how much we're then contributing to run an event that on the assumption it is a pay event, uh, I'd be curious to know that so if we can be finished with that that will be outstanding and on the assumption then that we are contributing to it, perhaps a weak clarification as to why we're paying for a pay-as-you-go, if it is a pay-as-you-go event. Number two, uh, the, sorry, my second question on the same page uh, is around uh, item number 29. We have just under four and a half million in personnel costs uh, array for incorporating an increase of 41.9 FTEs. On over and above the 41.9, that 4.3 or 4.4 million, how is, is that spread over and above the 41.9? Did I make that even vaguely mm -hmm. coherent? But I think I know how to answer it. And so um, when staff are appointed, say their salary is $100, um, they don't get appointed at top of grade, so they get appointed at 85% of $85. And so that amount represents the increases that we've had to pay for staff where there's been movements or um, so that's what that is. And more than any work that you've done on this, understanding my question was very impressive. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. Uh, thank you, Councillor Gilbert. Uh, Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, just, uh, just wanting to know if, uh, with the three waters, is that is it fair to say it's cr the government reforms around three waters are creating uncertainty on our budgets and pressure on the budgets? Would that be fair to say? In general, probably all over the country, but we have, we can only focus on us. But the bit of the question that I think I can ask, answer is that they are they certainly creating uncertainty. God, putting pressure on our budgets. I, th I think what the budgets show is there are some decisions that we think are prudent to make, given that we don't know the future of Three Waters. And Mr Logie talked to some of that around how we might deal with the Three Waters depreciation in particular. Thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just a general question to the Chief Executive in the context of of the pressure, the budgetary pressure from various sources, um, I, I would assume that, you know, is, it a, is it fair to assume that work on resilience and the security of our lifelines into the city is a business as usual task? And if so, it, are you confident that it is satisfactorily funded at this point? We've had, as you would expect, discussions about um, network resilience for some of our key lifelines. Um, I think that it is part of business as usual and the team are um, as well prepared as they can be um, in that space, but whether it would be resilient to a Gabrielle style event, I don't know what is. Uh, Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, Gavin, a question I ask on a regular basis of these um, meetings uh, when it comes to budgets and uh, rate increases is 1% increase equates to 2 million, okay, just for clarity for those listening and, and watching. Um, and then across we have about 52,000 ratepayers. 55,000? Yeah, 55,000. Okay. And then obviously the rate bill is made up on several components, and this increases only on the general rate, correct? When we get to the rating method, we talk about the increases, so there's some increases proposed for some of the fixed charges as well. And that's a, that's, that's a separate, the 6.5% we're looking at the general rate or across the whole, across the... But it'll vary depending on which rate we're looking at. So... At the bottom line, if we're looking at a 6.5% increase in what we're reading in the papers, what would that add to the general, uh, to a residential rate bill on average? 
there's a paper that um, gives a whole range of examples to that, the rating method paper, page 114, has a whole series of examples. Do you want me to read some out? <laughs> Just because I know there's people listening and watching, and that's one of the questions I always get. What value of property do you want me to... Oh, just just an average property value, so... The, so, median value of um, 590, rates increase of 6.7%. Pardon? It goes up $184. And maybe just to reiterate, this is a valuation year for 23-24, so individual properties, depending on how they've moved relative to the average, will have different impacts, and the table will talk about that. So just clarifying that, then on average we're looking at around $3.60 per week increase. It's hard to average, but on the basis of the median house value, yes. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you again. Um, this is potentially an unfair question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Um, and it goes back to my initial point around thank you for a report that pulls no punches. And I think that's really important as governors that we get the facts. Um, and it, reading this report and reading between the lines, there's a lot of conversation around potential threats to levels of service, tough conversations ahead, particularly next year. Um, and I don't think, I think we'll all agree that the high inflation, high cost environment we're living in ain't going anywhere soon. So my question is, um, cost savings while maintaining levels of service literally can't exist in the current environment. So at some point, something's going to have to give and when it gives, that's going to be decisions, hard decisions we're going to have to make as a council. There's a question in there, I think, somewhere. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I, th I think there was a conversation at a previous council meeting about vegetation control. In fact, potentially accepting that there may have to be a change in level of service due to the removal of a particular chemical that we currently use. So you've already started probably having those conversations. And, and I'll just add, there are broader conversations and again highlighted in um, the LTP discussions when we look at the revenue and financing policy which I think is a much misunderstood document about the impacts that it can have and it's about weighing up where you have the public and private benefit conversation and the rates and revenue policy is that document about where you charge for what, is it rates or is it user pays and that, that that's partly where there needs to be a very serious discussion, I think, with our community about what that looks like in the next LTP. Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. Uh, one more around, I think it was on page seven, yes it was, um, specifically around the car parking in the central city. I may get lynched by some, but I'll be lauded by others for asking this question. Um, with difficulty enough as it is finding, uh, for example, if I'm delivering in the mornings, Authorised car parks are uh, often taken by people who aren't authorised. Uh, five minute car parks are often parked in for 20 minutes or more. Is there facility, as we look to change the uh, time period and the costs and things, is there facility to have it uh, more regularly monitored as part of the pers extra personnel costs? We've got new technology, which I think you will have seen yesterday, pay by plate, and then the enforcement team, I think, will be doing a, a very thorough job in that area. So, so the pay by plate uh, will speed up, potentially, the, the process, rather than having to stand there and sort of write out tickets and check, blah, 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 you go to the thing and you... So, theor in theory, uh, the wardens who are wandering around will be able to do the job faster and more efficiently? Correct. Um, Councillor, the, um, it's a much more efficient process because it also um, takes a licence plate so it gets rid of all the processing. Deputy Mayor Barker. I guess this is a, a health check question about the levels of service 
and the annual report which we haven't received yet. And can we just have a, some background on why council, I know, but I just, want, I just want to get some background on why we haven't got the annual report um, so that we could have looked at the levels of service and made decisions around that. Yeah. Um, the, there have been a range of delays with audit, um, mostly because of um, availability of audit staff. I think there, there are a number of audits that they are behind in, and we are now, um, and we signalled it at the last council meeting, expecting the annual report in March. So when we look at our levels of service, um, did you, I, I'm, I'm aware you've seen the draft, do you, are we achieving many of those or are we still struggling to achieve those in the current climate given that we had a COVID shutdown last year has it affected what we've achieved? The, some of the levels of service show a, a positive improvement. The, there are challenges with ones relating to visitation where the measure, measures are how many people visited a facility and we had um, COVID lockdowns and COVID restrictions so that um, has affected some of those and then um, some, as we've discussed before, some of the measures are really quite challenging um, when we rely on um, the residents' opinion survey. And so the the, um, the delivery about, like for example, the um, water pressure reading and how satisfied people are with that, our leak detection and our leak um, repairs are improving, and yet um, the people are un less happy with the, the water. And so, the, so it's a decent conversation about um, making sure we've got the right measures for the level of service that we're trying to deliver and then holding ourselves to account for that and making sure that we've got the team structured to be focusing on those. So the, the annual report will be at next week's meeting, is that correct? No, it's coming to March. We scheduled, we um, signalled that in the January council meeting in the Ford Work Programme that was coming to March. And now that appears to be the end of questions. Any more? Any more? Okay, so that being the case, I'll now move that uh, Council adopts the draft 23-24 operating budgets for the purpose of community engagement as shown in attachment A. I'll also uh, we note that any resolution made during this meeting relating to these 23-24 annual plan reports may be subject to further discussions and decision by the meeting which is important to uh, note. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Benson Pope. So now uh, we've moved into debate, and so uh, do we have any speakers to this motion? I'll uh, uh, have a um, first go, and then uh, take, a, take a list of names, as we, as we have. And to me, uh, the staff have worked incredibly hard on these budgets to actually get a slight decrease in the projected uh, rise in rates for, this, uh, for the next coming year, which was 7% uh, in the long-term plan, to bring them down to 6.5% in the current economic uh, uh, climate, they have strived mightily uh, to achieve that. And we're, along the way, there are no obvious decreases in levels of service. And as I look through the, um, the expenses that we see, staff costs have gone up 5.7%, operations and maintenance costs gone up 1.7%, consumables 4.7%, occupancy 9.3%, depreciation of course is colossal, 44.7%, but interest itself has gone up 69% as a percentage of what we are paying. So it's a very, uh, very large price increases that we are facing, and in fact all of the country is facing, and as, as individual householders we are all well aware of this, so I think uh, just as we are making um, cuts in our own households or adjustments in our own households, the council has done extremely well, the staff have done extremely well to achieve um, this level of rates increase in the environment we have, so I commend them for their efforts. and. Uh, I would like to call for other speakers to the motion. Does anyone else wish to speak? Councillor Vandervis. Nobody wants to hear that I told you so. But here we are with an unbalanced and unsustainable budget. 
I want to thank Chief Executive uh, Graham for having a very uh, concise <laughs> and very um, open uh, overview of where we sit. I think it's the best, best one that I've seen in a very long time. It tells us very clearly that our capital spending has been unsustainable. It tells us very clearly that we are going to, and I'll quote, <coughs> need to review a range of services to ensure services can be delivered on a sustainable basis. Mayor Raddick has said that <coughs> there's no obvious decreases in levels of service, yet the need to review levels of service indicates that we are going to have to look at reducing some levels of service to be sustainable going forward. CEO Graham has signalled that we are in, and I quote, an entirely different financial climate than three years ago. This is very obviously the case, but it's equally obvious that the extremely low levels of interest that we enjoyed the summer of almost free money uh, has drawn to an end and we are looking now at a long winter of increasing interest rates and difficulties with supply chains and massively increased costs in many areas which simply can't be achieved, uh, which we simply can't achieve our planned um, capital expenditure and even operational. This council and the previous council in particular has not addressed the issue yet of having no uh, substantial dividends from our council companies. We have not addressed the issues of how much <coughs> things are going to cost in the future because of the uh, increased interest rates. And the, um, uh, the keenness of the idea that uh, a dollar spent today is better than a dollar spent in the future which has been promoted as one of the reasons for this massive capital spending that we've embarked on these last few years. Uh, the idea that a dollar spent today is better than a dollar spent in the future is now shown to be untrue. A dollar spent today is going to give us an awful lot of interest cost in the future. And that dollar, if it's not spent on something that has a robust uh, business plan showing that it is in fact an investment rather than just spending, that dollar is going to continue to cost us uh, going forward. Uh, most obviously to me there have been a number of projects which this council has agreed to which uh, with a little foresight and now easily with hindsight, we should simply not have done. Um, a brief selection would include the $10 million park and ride uh, supposed investment, which I simply see as a spend that again had no real uh, business plan. The $16 million diversion of traffic behind the railway station um, because of supposed <coughs> issues with the one-way street in the hospital. The $32 million of further cycleway spending, cycleway spending which has been uh, extraordinarily high for a very long time now and which we now have very strong evidence of being very poor value for money. South Dunedin cycleways for instance remain relatively unused and the cost of a lot of these cycleways has been extraordinary. If you look for instance at the 800 metres of cycleway that goes from the BP station in Andy Bay 
uh, and curves up towards the harbour, uh, you'll find that it was $1.2 million. Oh dear, it, it would appear that my time is up. Um, can I just close by saying that what we have now in this annual plan is a financial climate emergency. <coughs> Thank you for hearing me out. Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I did like what you said at the end of financial climate emergency because things are difficult. We've we've seen we've, we all households are putting up with inflationary pressure, interest rates, um, and we also have the uncertainty related to the the three waters form. And when you look at the the unbalanced budget, that really is the 38 million of depreciation, which we. Um, which is a really challenging thing for us to face and, and all of the uncertainty of Three Waters is making that very hard. I have some individual concern, I had quite a a lot of individual concerns that I'll raise as we go through the papers and we'll have a look at that. But I just did want to talk about levels of service and I asked a question about um, the annual report and I know that's being held up because of audit but I would have really have liked to have seen that to give us context in which we're making these decisions. The levels of service is basically what, what our ratepayers are getting for the money that they're giving us. So really important to see how we're performing in those and, and previously we'd been achieving around in the, the 40 to 50 percent range so I really want us to, to have a good look Look at those. Um, I also point everyone to paragraph 14, which is the work that we as council, as governance, are looking to do in the next year, which is um, looking at those streamlining um, opportunities of delivery service, reviewing the levels of service, and when you read them, some of them are pretty airy fairy, which makes it really challenging to um, to to measure them. Uh, the strategic refresh, which is something that I'm obviously very keen on because that's about our vision and what we, where we're going as a city and we absolutely need to get on top of that for the 10 year plan. The grants review, I think that's really important and there's no clarity through here about how much money we are um, we are granting and I, I know that's really difficult because there's little pockets and decades worth of uh, grant handing out so that will be very very helpful to see the, the total sum of that. Um, three Waters Reform we've mentioned, the investment plan I think Councillor Vandivis mentioned that around trying to get more money out of our CCOs which is really really important. We've got is it $1.4 billion of assets sitting in there and we need to make them work for us? And the revenue and financing policy as well. I think we're going to be looking somewhere near the end about um, public-private good and that's really important for us to make clear. I think I've also got some questions coming up around um, where we put our fees and charges up around 3% per year when we're in an inflationary environment of about 7%. So we, we do need to look at those and it looks like there's hundreds of them. So. It'll be a long day. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Gilbert next. Yes, no. I think it was two hands waving. It might have been uh, Councillor or assisting yes. Deputy Mayor Barker. Okay, so there I've got uh, uh, Councillors O'Malley, Houlihan, Walker, and Gary. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just, as we get go into this, we should all remember this is the last year of a three-year budget cycle that we'll be going into next year as a long-term plan. Um, and therefore, in many respects, the unbalanced budget is coming from the fact of the uncertainty that's coming forward, which we'll have to address actually more next year than this year. I do want to touch, though, on capital expenditure. Um, deferral um, has, by definition, in its name, meaning that later on you're going to have to face it at some point in the future. Dollar spent now versus a dollar spent in the future, well, yes, inflation is one, um, interest is one component, but inflation is the other component. And obviously, it would be the balance between the two as to whether that is a reasonable spend. But I think the issue really needs to be focused on this. I had flagged at least three years ago that our water bill should go up by about $1,000 a year if we were to match ourselves with the asset management plan and, and what we're actually spending right now. So $1,100 a year to $2,100 a year. If we're looking really at only, not only, but a $300 to $400 increase to, to match that asset management plan, then in fact that's actually better off than I thought we would. Um, so I actually am quite comf comfortable going forward with whatever that will be, but that is actually mostly next year's debate, not this year's debate. Um, we are facing, though, two things coming up right now, and that is um, inflationary pressure on us right now and the legislative uncertainty around this very massively large asset base that we have and therefore we are basically coming forward with an unbalanced budget largely due to the 
uncertainty of whether we should or should not put that funding into the three waters now because the Department of Internal Affairs have given us a, an environment in which we're uncertain as to whether or not that would be actually at risk and therefore bad for the ratepayer. So if we want to put any blame anywhere, we can look north. Um, we will eventually have to adjust our rates to our infrastructure requirements. And I, I don't know, I'm a bit of a big electricity user, but my electricity bill is bigger than my rates bill. And we need to get things into context. We've got massive, massive infrastructure in the city and we want to pay nothing for it. And the bottom line is, if we do that, we will have it taken out of our hands and then we'll lose control of what we pay for it. So as we go forward with this budget, remember, it's not just about always cutting corners, it's about making sure you're spending the right amount of money on the right things at the right time with the level of certainty that you need to make sure that you are not going to regret it later. And deferral is not necessarily good business. Thank you. Councillor Lamb. Thank you, yes. <clears throat> I'm, I agree with a lot of the things that Councillor O'Malley has just said and I, um, I think if residents are concerned if, there's, if there is a rate increase, I, I think we can squarely lay it at the government's feet at the moment because the pressure that councils, all councils all over the country, but, but, but obviously we have to talk about ourselves, is there's confusion, there's pressure and there's uncertainty around three waters. We don't know what's in, what's out, what's, you know, and it's, it's not fear on councils, it's not fear on the ratepayers, and once again, it's government interference that's causing major stress, a lot more work, and a confusion. And, and in the end, possibly rate rises for our residents, and that's not acceptable. So yes, we need to fix things. However, our infrastructure, as Councillor O'Malley alerted to, is a large system, um, but we have started to invest in it a lot recently, and a lot of our infrastructure is, is far more up to date than many of the smaller councils around the country. So I think we can certainly say that we're doing our bit now. We probably haven't for some of the time previously, previous councils, but this the council I think can say that we have invested in infrastructure. The other thing I'd like to say, um, just to rebut what Councillor Vandiver said around cycleways, I live in the West Harbour and yes there is um, a lot of work going on around cycleways around there but we are going to have one of the best cycleways in the world and I expect that we will have tourists and residents, you know, I plan to use it and I'm going to get my kids out there using it. That'll be difficult to get them, get them off their uh, devices, but we'll try. And to go out and use those facilities and look at our beautiful environment. We have world-class environments here in Dunedin, Otipoti, and those that and a lot of that infrastructure, let's put it in, into context here, a lot of that's been paid by Waku Kotahi, and I'm sure the following speaker will confirm that when we hear from Councillor Walker later. But, you know, it hasn't been us who's taken the, a lot of that. We have had to pay some of it, but a lot of the cycleways has been paid by Waku Kotahi. So I think we're very lucky to get it. It's world class, and some people have commented to me, it does seem that they've gone a bit further than a lot of people expected. But look, it, it is actually, when you look at what they're doing, the work is exceptional. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the intro, uh, Councillor Houlihan. Um, um, not for the first time around this table, um, Councillor Vandervis has inspired me to speak when I wasn't going to speak. So just in, in, in to Councillor Houlihan's point, yes, the West Harbour um, cycle, shared path, uh, I say shared path, it's primarily walkers actually, and families and kids and joggers who use it is 100% funded by central government via Waka Katahi, and we should be grateful for that, and I don't disagree, we'll probably have one of the best, world's best um, city-based um, walking and cycle uh, in pieces of infrastructure. Um, I just wanted to talk about um, Councillor Van Der Visser's, while going to some other points, his, his, he alluded to the $1 spend and the value we get from that, and that's always open to political debate, that's why we're around the table, and we can argue till we're blue in the face where that $1 should go. And he gave a couple of, of examples, he used the park and ride and the cycleway spending. Um, the park and ride, of course, is, 
has fabulous upsides for our, our 2030 zero carbon goals. And I don't think any of us have to look any further than, than TV news and what's happening up north and the tragedy that's accrued there and other examples that are increasing regularly around the world. You may snigger, Councillor Vandervis, but the, the facts are the facts. Um, so uh, all speed to anything that, uh, that, that helps us get to those zero carbon goals. Cycle waste spending, um, he's a regular critique of that. I've cycled in this city for 20 years. I currently cycle every day. And one thing I've noticed over the 20 years is the massive, massive increase in people who are now cycling. And that's because previous councils have been brave enough to invest in the infrastructure that has, if you want to talk about the value of $1 spend, the massive intergenerational health cost savings for one that run into the, the millions and perhaps the billions are incalculable. And we're probably one of the poorest countries when it go, comes to factoring those benefits in. And the more we do that in the third most obese country in the OECD, again, it gets my tick. Um, and also, I just wanted to, uh, to, to applaud Councillor Malley for uh, reminding us all that we have, we have massive infrastructural costs in this city. And I also, I also applaud him for, for making that comparison. He mentioned electricity. But many families spend more in a year on buying lottery tickets than they do on, on, on their rates. So we have to get in perspective the value. And when I sit down with people and tell, you, and tell them what they get for the rates, they're often surprised because the list is endless. Um, in a more generic point, with my one and a half minutes to go, as I mentioned earlier, and I thank the team and I thank the CEO for being brave to bring us a report that does put out there the challenges we have. We're going to have to make some hard decisions. And she is also right in saying that we're going to have to look towards that rates and revenue policy, because we are going to have to look the public in the face and ask them what they want rate funded and what, what they're prepared to pay for out of their own pockets. And I think that conversation's probably long overdue. It'll be hard, but we have to be honest up front with our community and ask them to give us feedback on what they're prepared, prepared to pay more for. Um, thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you. As I sit here and listen to colleagues, um, I have to say it's ironic that the very people who are around this table previously have um, talked about how we have let our infrastructure slip and we need to do uh, more capital delivery uh, are saying exactly the opposite now. It's the community that asked us to accelerate our capital delivery uh, and uh, to deliver better infrastructure, more resilient infrastructure, and that's exactly what we're doing. Um, but I wanted to just uh, talk about the context we're having these discussions in and acknowledge the layers uh, of challenge uh, post-COVID, uh, supply chain issues and escalation of uh, costs, um, a fiscally challenging time, uh, on the tail end of COVID, interest rate rises, um, along with uh, alarming inflation, which is being very widely felt in our community. Um, the Three Waters uncertainty has been mentioned, uh, and the um, depreciation-related uh, issues uh, are significant for us. There's so much we don't know yet. Um, and then on top of that, we have Cyclone Gabriel. Uh, and the flow and effects of that, potentially insurance, uh, the funding from Waka Katahi at a time uh, when that is important to us too. So we've got all of that context to take into account. Uh, and going forward, we've acknowledged that we have to signal to our community some very significant conversations around a number, number of areas. The levels of service being one, the cost of resilience, which should be in everyone's minds now following uh, Cyclone Gabriel, if it wasn't before, and the speed of the capital delivery program. And I just want to pause on that particular topic for a moment um, and say, just refer back to a comment I made a few weeks ago in a meeting, that these are the times when we need to uh, translate our concern around climate change into decisions. And it's why we've made decisions in the past. And I uh, concur with Councillor Walker and Councillor O'Malley uh, around uh, some of the projects we've chosen, the park and ride, the transport projects. We've done them for a reason. And I want to say to some colleagues, wake up. 
and the expression, you're living in la-la land, came to mind. Um, we need to wake up and we need to carry through uh, our concern uh, around climate change and what that means, and also uh, the issues that we face right now. So yes, it's an unbalanced budget, but I reminded you all that we had one of those post-COVID and the world did not end. There's a reason for it. It's not something we're going to be promoting long term. We are going to be looking at how we uh, look at a sustainable budget going forward. I think the staff have done an outstanding job and I want to compliment um, CEO Graham and Mr Logie uh, and staff for the extraordinary work they've done in bringing us a draft budget um, that is at one challenging uh, but it it is something we can, I believe, live with and discuss. Uh, and the 6.5 rate rise is not a surprise. There's a little room for manoeuvring there, and it's in line of the ten -year, with the 10-year plan. Uh, so compliments to the staff for getting to this point right now, uh, and I look forward to the discussion which will ensue. Councillor Lucas. Thank you. Um, I've really struggled to um, come to terms with this budget. I feel like, as um, a colleague said, alluded to me, as I feel like I've come late to the party with coming in at the end end of the process, and um, I feel that it's um, very hard that we're um, it's only an exceptions budget that we have in front of us, and uh, and going forward, it's very hard to um, I guess have an impact on the budget that that we're facing for the year ahead, um, and I think that we need to be very careful and be very fiscally responsible and prudent that we do not raise expectations because we do have some very hard conversations to have which obviously a lot of them in terms of service delivery are not going to be had during this discussion and on this annual plan and I just think we do not want to be um, looking to add anything in that will raise expectations that realistically we cannot continue to provide that service um, and I just um, I guess I'm just signalling to my colleagues is as we go through the next day or so um, just to be mindful of the environment that we're in and, um, you know, be responsible. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. I think the as we go through this, pro, this meeting and also future meetings before we actually sign off the process at the in, end of May, early June, is the fact that we've got opportunity to hear from the community what they think. And I encourage the community to come and talk to us, engage with us, and share their thoughts. I think the bottom line, as I see it, is that this is very challenging times, not just for us here in Dunedin, but around the country. And to be honest, I was surprised that it was only going to be budgeted at six and a half. I anticipate it to be higher, based on all the headwinds we are facing. And that's why I asked, what is the increase on average per household at $3.50 on, on an average property price? And I think that, let's start there and let's just say to people, and I don't want to bring up Mike Law, previous Councillor Mike Lord's an analogy, but going down that pathway, what will you get for that increase of $3.50? And I think that's important to note. If there are people that don't agree with where we're heading in this draft budget, tell us where we've got it wrong. Tell us where we've made, we're making the mistakes. But if there's those in the community that think we're on the right track, please come and tell us that as well. As I read through these papers, I'm trying to work out what would I take out? What would I remove? And what does the community not want? When we get talking about playgrounds and play spaces, will we want to defer that and defer that? Will we push that off? When the community's been crying out for places like that? What is it we would remove? And I think that's going to be the challenge. The other aspect, as I went through with my economic development hat on, is actually this money, most of it, is spent in our town, in our city, in our community. These are local companies doing a lot of the work, employing local people. 
for the infrastructure especially. The DCC is an important employer in the city. And I think that's important as well. At the time we're tackling the government over the hospital and the challenges they face, we need to take on these headwinds as well and accept them and move on. But my plea is to the community. Before you go and skewer us on social media and blast us for what we're doing wrong, come and communicate to us one-on-one -on -one or to the table as a whole. We would love to hear your thoughts, but based on all the information I've received, I think we're on the right track. Thank you. Okay, so uh, in uh, uh, pointing, putting this motion and uh, looking at the facts and figures, I once again repeat that I think the staff have done a marvellous job in a very, very difficult environment. I would uh, direct you, the members to item 17 on page 6. In terms of the capital budgets, we've had a really significant reduction. So across the board, there's been a lot of cuts within Council and a lot of reductions. So there's a significant drop here, uh, you know, $50 million less in capital <coughs> expenditure. And I also uh, point out item number 37 on page 9. Depreciation has cre increased enormously by 45%. And this is due to a one-off change in rating method, a uh, change in valuation. So this is a notional figure based on what the, value, the, the assets of the city are worth. And so that has gone up quite a lot, and therefore we should be depreciating them by that level in order to make a balanced budget. But however, it is actually a notional figure. So our renewals and our capital development is carrying on a pace, but this here is a very large one-off change in valuation method, which has meant that depreciation has risen enormously. So it's not, strictly speaking, necessary for us to fund that, because that's not a demand that all these things must be done this year. And this valuation method will carry on into the future or may disappear <coughs> entirely if the Three Waters assets get taken off our books. However, uh, it's beyond the pale for us to uh, add another 17% increase to rates in order to fund that depreciation. And it, it's merely a, it's a, it's a significant factor, but it's a notional one rather than a, an absolute requirement and urgent thing to be done this year. So I commend the staff for what they've managed to achieve with their budget to keep our uh, rates increase to a minimum. And uh, in the environment we're at, I think they've done very well. So on that note, I'd like uh, to put the motion. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Division, hey, do we have anyone against? Division. Yes, uh, division. We call for division. Councillor Acklin. Aye. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Mayhem. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. Aye. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. Aye. Councillor yes. Aye. Aye. Carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to item five. The um, annual plan budget update from property services. Uh, do we have, yes? <laughs> Ms. Nielsen and Mr. West to speak to that. Do we have any questions? Councillor Vandervis. On page 17, um, it, uh, under nine fees and charges, 
it suggested that rental fees for community housing are proposed to increase by between 4.6 and 5.6 per cent, <coughs> being six to twelve dollars per week. <coughs> My understanding is that the <coughs> council community housing uh, rental levels are actually a bit less than half of what you would pay as market rentals. Can you tell us or give me some rough indication of how much rents would need to be raised for community housing rents to be uh, approximately half of market rents faced by other renters? No, I haven't done that work, Councillor. Is that is that something that you could um, perhaps email me with later? And am I correct in assuming that currently community housing rents are less than half of general market value? We don't know that for sure. Sorry, Councillor. Thank you. Look forward to getting information later. Uh, no, and if I could just um, step in here, Councillor, it will depend, I think, on what Council resolve around this, because I'm loath to have staff do a whole range of additional work that they wouldn't normally be doing, and so um, I'm just not sure how easy it would be for um, Ms Nielsen to actually um, do that analysis, and it's not something that we had, have on the work plan at the moment, because that's not um, what Council has asked us to do. My apologies. I'd, uh, I'd simply assumed that there would be some understanding of what market rents were and that it would be a very easy calculation, but if that's not part of their purview, uh, I'm surprised and disappointed, but understand that that would be a lot of work. Uh, it's because, as I understand it, we have so many different rents for different types of properties, and it's nodding. Yeah, there's different types of properties and a lot of them don't compare well to market rent and to be fair, I, we don't hold market rent information because the portfolio hasn't been historically driven by market rents. Councillor Melly. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just following up on that question, am I correct? It was my, it's my recollection that at the, in the last triennium, the Council made a decision based on the affordability, the ability of the renter to pay rather than the market rent. Is that correct? The policy doesn't guide rent setting, but the revenue and funding policy does guide our user pays split. But, but the answer, I think the answer to your question, Councillor, is yes, that is the case. And what I would say, Councillor, is if you are interested in changing that policy position, and then um, the LTP is the time for that, potentially, because the revenue and financing policy, as I've already signalled, is the driver, and the, there's a, a, a really detailed piece of work that needs to be done to understand the consequences of how you might change the settings in that, and you'll see how we're not meeting it in its current form anyway for community housing, if you've read that um, part of your paper already. Councillor Benson Pope. Just being asked, thank you, and answered. Thank you, Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. Not to belabour the point, uh, but I'm curious as to the thinking when current inflation is 7.2, we the percentage increase here, the highest is 5.6, so we're not even matching inflation. I'm just wondering about the, um, the thinking that went on behind that. Um, I think we've tried to, to come up with a balanced um, uh, increase here, Councillor, and, and the 3 to 5 per cent is probably at the higher end of what we've done in recent years, uh, but admittedly it's not as high as inflation. Uh, and I think you'll see that reflected through a number of the fees and charges today. If I could just add that many of our tenants, and, and will tell me if I'm wrong because I might be, are on fixed incomes. And so that means that their incomes are not necessarily going up by the rate of inflation anyway. Very good. Uh, we have Councillor Lucas, then uh, Councillors Mayhem, Witherall and Gary. Uh, thank you. Um, on point number five, where you talk about personnel costs going up by 2.9%, they've effectively gone up by more. Am I correct in understanding that? Because the housing officer has moved from 
from property through to governance? I've read in later papers that the housing officers moved to governance. Uh, no, the housing officer is a seconded position at the moment from Kayanga Aura. Um, and uh, in the budget that you, the, in the report you've just looked at, it, it is proposed to fund that for the coming year to undertake the housing plan. Uh, it's never actually sat in the property budget. Another question, and, and so also that's moved to property is the road stopping revenue. So that's an, also another increase in your revenue is for road stopping of about sixty thousand. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Mayhem. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I just want to raise, as I have done before, um, community housing is not market rent housing. And I feel like this is something we have covered before. Is it not true that this is subsidised senior housing? And we've already made an increase here of 5%, $6 to $12 a week increase already, which is higher than what we are proposing as a rates increase. And I do not think that living in a one-room bed sit should be driven by market rent. Do you agree? So I'll jump in there. That, that's not a question for staff, that's a question for your colleagues, councillor. <laughs> so uh, i just point out a small correction that 5% um, is less than what rates are going up by. So uh, councillor, uh, councillor Witherall. My question has been answered, thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Uh, two questions. The first was around community gallery hire fees, and forgive me if I couldn't, if it was there and I just didn't find it. What will that mean for the cost for community groups in, in dollar terms? Um, I think you'll find that on page 23 under the fees and charges, Councillor. My apologies. Um, thank you. I'll look at that. Um, and just going back to the salary changes, I need that see that word used throughout the papers um, is that it doesn't say a salary increases and yet the personal co personnel costs have gone up by a certain amount. Can you just define that a little more please, what the salary changes? It might be a, it might be a question for the Chief. It's in line with what I said earlier that the, um, as, roles, as people progress through the grade. Um, you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we appear to have exhausted questions. Would someone like to put the motion? Move the motion. Move the motion. No? Councillor Abelli. Seconder, Councillor Mayhem. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Only briefly, and much to say that some of the stuff that's discussed today was actually, question today was actually coming from previous council policy, where we had set the um, fees and charges for community housing are around more the ability of the person to pay than the, than the market rent. That was a decision made and obviously as the CEO suggested if we want to change that decision next year would be the appropriate place to do that. Um, and of course um, whether that person is able to pay or not would depend on how much the um, um, retirement benefits have gone up during that period of time as opposed to the rates of inflation. So that would be the market if you're taking the logic it's the affordability to pay, setting the rate, not the market value of the building, then, then the amount of income the person's getting in would be the determinant of their rise. So I'm pretty sure we're fairly much in line there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lillian. Thank you. Um, yes, Councillor Vandivis raised market rents earlier, but social housing or community housing I don't think can be compared to market rents. However, what I will say around market rents is that they have increased hugely um, over the last well, just increasing every year probably, but um, the pressures of um, interest rates is affecting everybody, but especially landlords, and so that reflects in the costs, once again, that go back to the tenants, but also, um, like council um, reforms have hit um, landlords as well. There's been numerous reforms on the RTA, which is the Residential Tenancy Act, and that has put a lot of costs up for landlords and therefore going back to the market again. So those are some of the pressures that are on the um, market rents. 
Um, I just want to say, you know, our council is, I think, the second or third largest, third, second, second largest um, community housing owner in the country. And um, I, I'm, I'm really proud of that. I have questioned in the past uh, the fact that we lose money on these uh, properties often, often, um, over that when you look at the annual budget, it often comes back that there's a loss. But as some councillors around the table have highlighted, I mean, they are there and heavily subsidised for um, the reason that a lot of these people can't afford market rents. Um, and it is a struggle for everyday people to afford market rents. But what I would say is it's something that we need to be very aware of in our city. And I've had some meetings over the last week about a crisis we've got in the city around homeless people and people trying to get any type of housing. So uh, community housing is going to be continually in demand. It's not something that's going to lack from demand, but it, we, we have certainly a lot of pressure in that area and I think I applaud us for putting funds into this because it is a, a service that's needed and sadly there's a lot more people who need it as well and I mean we can't afford to cover all that but we need to consider the implications of many many people in our city that don't have a home. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just thank the staff for the work on this, um, and I'll just I'll, I'll continue in the vein of community housing and those people on fixed incomes. I think it's a really important subject, and I won't uh, relitigate what um, or, or, um, state again what Councillor Malley said around where we can affect and change that policy if we have a mind to do that. And uh, in terms of Councillor Houlihan uh, mentioning that we lose money and that, I'd say, well, losing money equals fantastic well-being outcomes, actually. So it's, a, it's an equation that we need to, to weigh up. Um, it's not just about money. It's about, it's about what we do and what we, what we think is right. Um, and I'll just finish by continuing um, the, how, the, from, from Councillor Mayhem's great question. Um, um, and, and pointing out, and I think we're, we're all aware of this, and I think we agree with it, that the poorest in our community are always going to dis disproportionately suffer more in times of um, financial strife, and we're in that period of financial strife, and it ain't, it ain't going anywhere soon. So I think um, we should do everything we can as a council to protect and insulate um, those those people and I think past councils um, around this table have been really progressive in doing that and uh, my hope and wish is that we uh, at this new council continue to do that thank you, thank you. council vendors we have as I understand it um, at least 900 um, community housing uh, places and that is a lot and it's commendable that we're able to provide so much community housing. The issue for me is one of recognising that there are far more people unable to access community housing that have to pay market rents. People who are under an extraordinary amount of financial pressure never more than now. People who, in many cases, as I understand it, are having to pay double or more <coughs> of what those few lucky people that are able to get into our community housing uh, have to pay. And <coughs> they're paying the increased rates, they're paying uh, market value rents, and for us to continue to further subsidise uh, community housing at a level that is less than half of what these less fortunate uh, renters are having to pay, to, m to me it starts to create a, a real issue, especially when those <coughs> renters are having to subsidise those others in community housing. The reason for looking at market rents is not because we want community housing to be at market rent levels, they are vastly below. 
the reason for looking at market rents is to look to see what it actually really costs in the market to have a rental um, uh, facility. And we need to make sure that we keep that in mind with our costs regarding community housing. I can happily vote for this property services uh, recommendation uh, on the basis that the um, rents are going to increase uh, a little bit um, less than inflation. Um, but I would very much like to know more detail about the extent to which all the other renters in Dunedin are subsidising these incredibly low rents in community housing. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, we've debated whether, how, we, how we look after people in our housing. We've got 936 units, and of those units, 71% of people in those units are old age pensioners. To get in there, they have to have low assets, low income. Old age pensioners are on pensions. These are not rich people that we're talking about. We're not subsidising an amazing lifestyle. And I, I challenge the word subsidy as well. I think about we are looking after people in our community so they can have a decent place to live, a safe place to live. And we're committed to that. I am challenged that we're having this conversation again. We, we are on the back foot. When we looked back in many of those reports, we had about five years where some councils had chosen, five to seven years, not to put the rents up. So perhaps they're behind, but it's also about affordability. We're not looking at market rents. When we're looking at people who are on benefits, it's about what percentage of their benefit can they actually afford to pay for accommodation and still live a decent life. And I hope that people in Dunedin actually care about our community and the, the most vulnerable people that we're looking after. So it, it makes me sad that we're, we're, we're having this debate yet again. I appreciate um, that some people want to look at market rents and put it put it like that. And it is challenging for homeless people in our community. It's challenging for everyone in our community to pay their rent. But in this case, we need to look at what we're doing and we're looking after people, old age pensioners in the majority, in housing that we can provide. And I'm really proud that we do that. Councillor Gary. Thank you. I just want to remind colleagues and refer you to page 127, which talks about, um, and it's not the, the section we're on at the moment, but it's certainly irrelevant around uh, rates revenue of 10% towards uh, community housing. Um, and so all of that information is there, and that policy was established some time ago. And we also, re reminding colleagues, we also worked on the criteria um, for our community housing, such that the um, the level of expectation in terms of the queue uh, was managed differently uh, and successfully. Um, I too am, am concerned and saddened we are having this conversation in the manner in which we were having it. Of course, we need to be fiscally responsible and we have signalled an increase. However, for some of our tenants that will be very challenging. Those small amounts will be very challenging. Um, and, and some around this table need to take off their hats as landlords of investment um, property and uh, remind themselves that as governors of this city, we we are providers of community housing. It's quite a different thing. And I commend uh, Councillor Mayhem for the excellent question that she asked uh, and clearly feels passionate about. Uh, if we are to be thought of as an inclusive city, uh, one that has a social conscience, it's how we treat our most vulnerable and our elderly. That's how we should be judged. Um, and uh, I uh, fully support uh, what has been suggested here? Uh, it's it's a pity we we have to make an increase. Uh, it is a it is a small one, uh, but it will have an impact, and we need to remember that. Um, but I support the motion. Very good. We have the motion on the uh, board in front. Do you want to have your right of reply, Councillor Milley? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to ask, how would raising the rates and, and, and things, the cost of living in community housing, help the homeless? It's kind of like kicking a dog for sleeping in front of the fire because it's cold outside. I think we've, we've made a commitment to this, 
And we can adjust our commitment to it and whether we care what our role is in society at the long-term plan, because this is an exceptions only budget. Um, but it doesn't stop people coming forward and debating this over again, and that's fine, that's their position. I just feel that it would never be my position that I would ever ask someone who's unable to pay to pay more than they can afford, and we set the rates around what they can afford to pay, and that was what it comes down to. And what's the point of having community housing if we're not going to look after our community? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll now put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Sorry, was there a call for division? So, division. Councillor Acklin. Aye. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Mayhem. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. Yes. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Motion carried unanimously. At this stage, we'll have an adjournment for five minutes. Can I have a, a seconder for that? Thank you. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. And um, we'll come back at 25 too, because our lunch is at 12.30, so it's more than an hour away. So uh, we'll take a, take a break to stretch your legs and walk around.
Item number six. Item number six. Outram Glen facilities upgrade. Mr. West and Ms. Nelson will uh, speak to. Do you have anything to say to the report? No? Happy to take questions? Are there any questions? Councillor Lucas. Um, thank you. Um, have you looked at maybe sealing or concreting an access way down to the beach, I guess, to the river as part of the upgrade? Um, and also in terms of the um, access way in, what about looking at separating maybe um, like a cycle way in, because it's used by a lot of cyclists, pedestrians, or just yeah. No, I guess we've we've attempted to respond to council's uh, resolution of last year, which was particularly focused on the the road upgrade and the um, the toilet, um, but also looked at a few options either side of that, but not not an extensive range of them in in detail. Um, and I'm just trying to get my head around the 537,000 proposed for the turning circle, which seemed a lot of money for a turning circle. Um, and I understand there's complication with land ownership and things like that, but it does just seem a huge half a million dollars. Yeah. I, I can't give much explanation into how that cost is broken down, but I can tell you that you would need to cut into the rock. So not very far down the soil is rock. So there'd be some work in there. And uh, there's a re because of how the cut would have to be, there's a retaining wall. And the instant you start to need a retaining wall, engineers just add thousands to projects in my mind. I, I just clarified as a cost, we work with the transport department, so we, we've developed it and it's based on their you know, experience and knowledge of these things. So it, that does seem a lot, but yeah, it's, quite, it's more complicated than it looks. Thank you. Now that I understand about the retaining wall, I hadn't, hadn't thought about that. Um, I just want to foreshadow later on, I'm going to move option one. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary, and then I've got Councillors Houlihan, Benson Pope and Walker. Thank you. As part of uh, a redevelopment, if we should support that, um, will the owner, this various landowners, so I'm assuming there'd be some sort of formal agreement put in place if we're doing it. Yeah, I think it, I think it covers it in the report, Councillor, I don't know which paragraph, but um, yeah, we certainly have to have those uh, negotiations and agreements in place dependent on the outcome. So Sorry. do you consider that those would be fairly straightforward? Um, the, there have been discussions over a number of years with the various landowners from time to time and um, I think generally they've been receptive and I, I, I I'm looking over in uh, uh, Scott in the corner, but I think the, the relationship with Doc particularly has been closer. Yeah. I have a couple more questions. Um, one was in paragraph uh, 40. Oh, just lost it. Uh, here we are. Disadvantages of option one, which was around the significant and regular vandalism. Um, what measures in doing any kind of redevelopment would be put in place that are anti-vandalism? That are there any? It's an interesting situation. We've currently, <laughs> with the Portaloos, for example, uh, the first year they got knocked over, pushed over, and completely broken. The second year we did place. Uh, boulders or rocks around them to try and avoid that situation and avoid the use of cars. They still got knocked over. <laughs> Is it your view that with a um, with an improved uh, amenity that that would discourage vandalism because that does happen in in areas that is it? That's hard to say, but I personally would say that if you improve uh, um, a facility, then one would hope there would be some community pride and a, and a more of an awareness, but that's... What I would, would say is staff have flagged the risk and councillors in upgrading this facility do need to be aware that regardless of any community pride, there is still a risk of hoons and four-wheel drives going in and um, driving into things. 
Sure, thank you. And my final question, did you consider in developing the options, and, and I was delighted to see that could, one could be done from um, existing budgets, so well done there, but um, I wondered whether you had considered the possibility of flagging something like the barbecue as being a a project the community might get involved with. It's been my experience that the likes of service organisations are often looking for a project to support um, in, a, in a time when we are fiscally challenged. I just wonder if that is an option. That certainly is an option that we could look at. Councillor Hulan. Thank you. Um, could you explain the difference, because there is quite a dust problem down there, the, the difference between the otter seal and a resurfacing, like what, a, you know, what exactly is otter seal? I didn't know what it was. We'll get Mr. Sorry. Sorry, Mr. Drew, if you could answer that. Oh, he's not here. Oh. It's in the... It's a... It's a so, so there's a in report twelve. There is a um, on there's a report on just on Otto Seal, and it talks about what it is. It's a, um, a an emulsion of bitumen and um, chips, you know, gravel that gets put on. It lasts up to five years or more generally, but it's not tar seal. Things kind of in between otter, like, but would it so the otter will be looser? Is that what we could what you'd expect? And will it, I suppose, my main question is will it refrain dust? Will it? Yes, microphone, wet vaulted toilet. Whoever came up with this idea for these is terrible, it's not very good. Um, wet vaulted toilet. And then it's got a brackets flushing. Could you just explain that? Sure. Um, there's no water utilities to the area, so we have on-site water to allow the toilet to flush, um, and then it's taken away and refilled by service, rather than the toilet we have at the moment is a long drop. No running water, no flushing. Councillor Bitsa Pope. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of questions about um, about the uh, barbecue first. Um, in addition to what's been asked already, thirty thousand dollars. Do you want to uh, perhaps tease that out a little for us? Please? Yeah, sure. So the barbecues. <laughs> A <laughs> pretty high quality steak. Um, the barbecues that we looked at are similar to what we've put out at Terrioni recently. So the barbecues themselves need to be really durable. We've already highlighted the risk of vandalism. So they cost 17000 There's also a need to build a concrete platform to put those on and a shelter, if you like, so uprights and a roof across the top. And there's some additional um, logistics in getting it out there. And that's pretty much what it comes to. To continue, um, sounds sounds understandable and reasonable. However, you do flag twice in the report the vandalism issue. I'm assuming we're talking about a gas barbecue here. Yes. Well, good opportunity for further vandalism. The other question I want to ask about is um, the toilet. Um, um, I'm aware because I have a uh, brother-in-law who's a plumber who is responsible for the maintenance of toilets, public toilets in Gisborne. That toilets provide a wonderful opportunity for mischief. I'm not going to be more detailed, but clearly the current arrangement, unsatisfactory as it might be, um, provides less opportunity for mischief than a flushable toilet of whatever nature that would be the case, isn't it? This, the big problems in on the East Coast are deliberate blocking of toilets. Uh, and I'm asking if you are aware of those problems and do you have any concerns about that? I probably couldn't comment on whether a flushing or non-flushing would be more susceptible to mischievous behaviour. But I can tell you that the non-flushing version has been filled with 
an eight foot wooden log in the past, so it is susceptible to mischief. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll avoid the perfect opportunity to get into the world of puns. Um, just uh, around vandalism, which I think has been addressed, but also um, the, the barbecues. Um, my question is, is I'm, and I'm just thinking of where there's barbecues currently in the city, is there any data on their usage? Because um, I'm thinking particularly of the one on the West Harbour walkway, and I have to say I'm a regular user and I've ever seen it used once. I'm just wondering if we do analysis on that. Sorry. I think the answer is no. And I think it was in point seven here, just going from my notes, um, there was an, a, an analysis of 31 people using it per day. Um, is that considered busy? That is the dock walking track, uh, not the not the rest of our from Glen. Finally, onto the toilet, and I'm aware obviously that we did that consultation back in May 2021, and we came up with a robust list of, of places, and those people in those communities fought hard to get on that list. Is there any risk to any current people on that risk, um, if, if we're of a mind to do this, and if so, where is there any thought as to which year we, could, we would place this one? Um, sorry. What I'd say is that at the time that Council voted for that last, we were clear that we would be revising it on a regular basis based on, um, and it's, it's listed under the table in attachment B, um, so that we would be reviewing it on a regular basis. And I think if Council vote for this uh, option to include a toilet at Outram Glen this today, we would go away and, and do further work on what that would mean to the existing um, list. Great. That's the answer I expected. But I just, can I ask, how do I get this a question? Can, can you guys make sure that we don't do that to the detriment of people who, I say, have fought hard for many, many years? And I'm just looking, for example, Purukanui Reserve into year eight. I mean, that's a regular group that comes to the, the old Chalmers Community Board and West Hub Community Board now. So I'm just, I'm just flagging that to be conscious of people who fought hard in the past. What I would say, Councillor, is that the um, long-term plan gives us an opportunity to recast all of these um, budgets, potentially, so. Uh, thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. It's, it's more an um, implication of whether we go with option one or option two, because as I read it, the difference is really the formation of the turning circle. So f to Mr Drew, I assume, um, through the Chair. Um, in the absence of the turning circle, what does that do to the design and traffic flow in the area? Similar, although I can't speak with any detail because I'm not across the detail of that project. I, as we like them, I assume it's not a vanity project to turn a turning circle. So I, there must be a <laughs> there must be a reason that it's there. That if we didn't fund it, what would the implication be? You you'd wouldn't resolve the congestion issues that are reported when the Glen is busy. And then the other one is, do we have to instruct whether it's otter seal or gravel? Because at the moment it's otter seal or gravel. Uh, we've obviously left that for council's decision, and if you have a preference, it's unfortunate it is in the same option, but the cost is pretty pretty much the same as you'll see in the papers. And it's obviously up to the mover then, probably, if there's a, a request, because it, it is, at the moment, a bit ambiguous. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. My question is around the um, programme for the changing places, bathroom and the new public toilet locations, which was attached in. And I w wonder, when we got them into this order, was there such a thing as a toilet matrix? So here's the Outram Glen toilets being put through the toilet matrix. Yes, it has. It was put through at the time that we were considering the 10-year plan for toilets. And where it ranked was lower because of 
the vicinity of alternate toilets. So if we make a decision today about putting toilets in, will that, the, the, will that then for go back through the toilet matrix and then be put in a certain year? I'm like like Councillor Walker, I'm very aware that there's been a lot of work put into um, where we where we put the toilets in, or is the fun, or, or is it because the funding is already here that that's not going to affect those other toilets? I maybe would refer to the CEO's comment actually, which was um, I think council has an opportunity next year to revisit the the 10-year plan and and funding for public toilets moving on from the 10-year plan so um, whilst that doesn't exactly answer your question I think it indicates that you would have an opportunity and we could put further information to you next year what, what I would add um, by way of a further answer is Council knew we had a toilet matrix and requested this work directly, and so we're responding to a resolution of council who was responding to what was the number one priority of the Mosgiel Tyre Community Board. And since that time, staff have done work. We've got um, ongoing costs associated with having to maintain and look after those po the portaloos that are there anyway. So the situation is different, probably, than when the broader matrix was considered. And so, um, what is proposed, if Council is of a mind that we progress one of these. Um, it would be done in the next financial year, or potentially even this finan next financial year. Very good. Uh, we appear to have exhausted questions. No, we have one more. Councillor Gary. No. Yeah. Another question. Yes. Yeah, it's, um, it's come up actually due to Councillor O'Malley's question and the fact that I probably, like all of us around here, am not a, an engineer. So in terms of, can somebody just give me a, just a quick overview of the differential between gravel or otter seal in terms of, you know, because there is a 5k difference there, is, is one, so who, who's going to answer that? I'll try and see what, if Simon says that I'm wrong, but I might know the answer. Simply, auto seal will suppress the dust and last for five years or more. The gravel would need to be maintained on a more regular basis. Is that about right? Correct. The only thing to add is a, an auto seal is almost waterproof, and so that's the thing that means it requires less maintenance. And supplementary, I can't get otter is out of my head. Otter, otter seal um, <laughs> presumably has been. It's been used and is in situ throughout the world, for, and for how long? It's yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, it's called different things in different places. So, for example, Central Otago call it Eco Seal, uh, <laughs> um, but yes, it's it's a common um, product, low cost um, seal. Very good. We have exhausted questions now. Councillor Lucas, uh, you uh, have uh, indicated that you want to move the motion and seconded by, uh, I saw the hand go up from Councillor Benson Pope, was that correct? Yep, correct, seconded Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, would you like to speak to the motion, please? I would, thank you, and I would like to move um, that it's uh, the access way is surfaced with Otter Seal, um, as Councillor O'Malley alluded to. Um, and I, um, I think in, in light of my earlier comment about being fiscally prudent, ideally we, I mean, we would love the Rolls-Royce option of the half a million dollar turning circle and also the almost half a million dollars to, to um, seal the whole access way in. But I think you know, almost a million dollars into the budget for that is, is not being fiscally responsible. Um, I live five minutes away. I'm a, I'm a big user of Outram Glen. I think um, the docks estimate of 31 people a day is way underestimated. I was there two weeks ago. In the space of two hours, I counted about 400 people. Um, and there was, with some work on the turning circle, um, I think um, was alluded to in the report at a minor cost. I mean, cars were able to easily turn, um, and it, it would make it easier. Um, but um, 
of, of luck would have it in terms of timing. Um, Party in the Park was on Sunday and the Mosgiel Torrey Community Board um, had a stand there um, and had a chance to consult with, you know, and it was an informal consultation with people about what the preference was for Outram Glen. Um, also a member of the Community Board um, spoke with um, a group of Outram Elders to clarify what the wishes of Outram community. Um, and I, and they, they also um, are, want to be fiscally responsible. They agree that it doesn't need to be sealed and they also recommend not to seal is sufficient. Um, and they would also like to have a look at that separating the walking and cycle way for safety. Um, the toilet upgrade is essential, as I said, I mean, in the space of two hours there was like 400 people there the other day. I mean, the, there is a real need for toilets. Um, the existing turning areas, if improved, is sufficient and it makes a relatively easy three-point turn. Um, and they also commented on the half a million dollars seems an unnecessary cost. Um, they would like to look at the access of the beach so that it's retained and improved and preferably with maybe looking at some kind of concrete ramp or whatever. I mean, there's many elderly and less mobile visitors currently use the dirt track to get down to the to the beach. And one of the great things about Outram Glen, it is a place that provides shade. I mean, if you go to the beach, there's not much, you know, shade. There's lots of lovely willows, there's lots of shade. So it is used by a lot of um, elderly um, and um, and less mobile people because it's, it's quite easy access to. Um, and one of their comments is maybe um, some consultation perhaps on where the barbecue is um, in the future, you know, so that to help um, restrict some of the vandalism, whether there's um, a better place for it, that, you know, whether that's up with this historical society, but within, within that Outram area. Um, but I think it's a great opportunity to upgrade a really, really well used area um, and it's used by not just people of the Mosgiel, Tauri, Outram, I mean they come from across the city to use that area and it's, um, it's a special area, I mean lots of schools access it for, um, for river safety and water safety and um, it's just you know, a fantastic opportunity that I would hate for it you know, to be lost but to be lost this this chance, but as I said, I just think we need to be fiscally responsible, and there, there is the ability to fund this work within existing budgets, and um, I commend staff um, that that can be done that way. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. I just want to say quite a few councillors have um, raised concern about the possibility of other toilets dropping off the list. What I would say and remind some of those councillors that the Mosgiel Community Board has raised this issue for many, many, many years and there's been an issue with the fact that there's shared land ownership there, DOC, um, ORC, um, ANAS and the private owner and that has meant that project has been put, I think it's fair to say, on the too hard basket for a long time. So it's not that we're getting priority here at all. This toilet and these facilities are well used, as Councillor Lucas just said, and um, they're in need of, of um, a revamp, and they have been for many, many, many years. This does not mean I don't support other toilets around the city as well, because I do. There's certainly the West Harbour one at St Leonard's, I think, is a brilliant idea on that walkway. But um, I, I certainly think this, uh, you know, deserves to be considered, and it's something that they've raised numerous times. And my preference would be option two, but I will support option one. Um, to, to get it through, but yeah, I mean, option two would be the better one, in my opinion. Thank you, Councillor Vincent Pope. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think um, the mover's speech covers um, pretty much all the issues, uh, and there's no doubt that the area is an extraordinarily popular recreational reserve um, for everyone and I believe this sort of work is overdue. Um, I hope that the, the moderate trimming of vegetation will end up being a good solution rather than extraordinarily uh, expensive turning circle, but it does get congested. congested. As to the um, concern about vandalism, uh, well, it would be nice if it would go away, but I don't think it will. Uh, uh, sadly, I think that's something we just have to um, tolerate and cope with. Uh, so uh, I think a new toilet appropriately sited would be a welcome addition to the area. I also wonder if the barbecue might, might not attract other 
vandalism issues, especially given the gas. Um, but that's something that um, I think we just have to cope with. Although I quite like the idea of the suggestion of an alternate location, and that might be something that could be discussed with the local community as well. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Uh, I fully support uh, this motion and I want to acknowledge the process uh, to get to this point and, and yes this matter has been around for some time. Uh, the Mosque Hill Tauri Community Board led by Chair Joy Davis brought it to Council in the annual plan um, and then that uh, resulted in a resolution of council. It was their number one priority um, and it was great to see, and it's landed here now, it's great to see that process working where the the community boards, uh, community plans uh, have got a pathway through to uh, us at council uh, and we can deliver on them. So that's uh, really good to see. Uh, I understand it's a very well used area um, and in these times of tight household budgets this is a free family activity um, and it's part of the Kiwi summer experience going down to the river. So uh, I think this is a, a very positive uh, development. I commend staff for finding um, the money within the existing budgets. I fully support the use of auto seal um, and I and I'm willing to support the delivery of the barbecue by council, but I would like to think that we might have discussions with the likes of a service group in the area because I think that engagement's really important. I've seen in other developments in community areas uh, that engagement's really important in terms of a feeling of ownership by the community and looking after it by the community if you fundraise within the community for something like that. And I'm talking about the 17000 for the barbecue itself. Uh, but very happy to support. Well done, everyone involved. Yes, I'll just um, add, a, add a comment that I think... Uh, that having this increased amenity at Outram Glen will increase uh, usage of the area and then possibly uh, the local community might fundraise to make the turnaround or an additional parking area because they, um, you know, uh, to uh, enable even greater numbers to use it. And I think, I'm inclined to think that uh, increased usage and increased community pride in the area will decrease the level of uh, vandalism on these facilities and I think the additional eyes and uh, vehicular traffic, also cycle traffic, uh, going and using the area will make a difference and the more people use it the, the more difficult it is for people to vandalise the area uh, unobserved. So I think that will help the whole thing so I'm very happy to support this motion. Uh, would you like to uh, your right of reply, Councillor Lucas? In that case, I shall put the motion. All those, <laughs> all those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next item is number seven, which is the reserves and recreational facilities. So this is the over, overall annual plan budget. Uh, welcome to the Chair, uh, Mr McLean and Mr Pickford. Uh, do you wish to speak to the report? Uh, thank you Mr Mayor, happy to take questions. Are there any questions? Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you Mr Mayor, I just want to ask a question around the Dock Ranger program and just understand some of the, the history of that. I think that I've, I've asked those questions internally and it really looks like it's about freedom camping. Would that be correct? Uh, thank you, Councillor, and through the Mayor. Um, yeah, so that's the, the genesis of the program um, and we worked with uh, Department of Conservation a few years ago and, and realised we had some pretty similar uh, outcomes we wanted to achieve, so it was about working together. So um, that's around the freedom camping, and and again for us the um, reserves and beaches bylaw. So. Oops. so, so what's the total value of the um, the ranger program for the, for the council? Uh, 
Uh, so that um, that falls under the uh, the wider freedom camping um, project. So, which includes our uh, security company who take care of the freedom camping enf enforcement. So, um, it's the total value is two hundred and sixty thousand. Um, so that's one hundred and seventy four of that is with allied security, uh, and the remainder is with the um, shared ranger program with DOC. So, Thanks. <laughs> I'm curious about. The measurements around this, um, because it is a, a $260,000 program, and I know I was involved with the, the Freedom Camping bylaw when we put that into place, I think it was 2011 when we were working hard on that, and there wasn't any money in the budget for enforcement. So do we, do we find people when they are um, breaking the rules? Thanks, and through the mayor. Um, yes, yeah, so our first port of call is uh, education. Um, so we've seen a. It's, it's actually a little bit difficult to tell with uh, the last couple of years had reduced camper numbers, um, but we we're seeing a steady trend of awareness and reduction in in, in infringements being issued. But um, yes, yeah, so, but yes, we do issue infringement fines um, where appropriate. But um, definitely the first first. Point is uh, is to educate. So some of those infringement um, fines would go back into the budget to subsidise the security that we have to put on. Uh, so the so any infringement revenue would be shown in a different line. It's essentially revenue coming in, so it would offset the the costs for for the department. I know this is budget meeting, but I just want to ask a question about you talked that it's also about um, enforcing the be beaches bylaw, and I wonder um, what impact the enforcement has had on, on some of the behaviour, because we get through social media some concerns about wildlife on beaches, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Can you just talk a little bit about the education role and the impact that that's had? Certainly, thank you. Um, Yes, yeah, so we've seen, uh, or certainly anecdotally, a, a real reduction in the number of vehicles accessing beaches. So that's through awareness, so on-site signage, um, and through the rangers. So if they see vehicles on beaches um, acting relatively innocently, it's uh, that's then they'll they'll approach them, um, give them some information, and a lot of that's centred around the the ecology of the beach and the wildlife that's that might be present, and also about the enjoyment for other other users. Generally speaking, um, people are really receptive to that, uh, and it was just a case of them um, not being that aware. So, um, with the people that are a little bit more deliberate, so we follow up in a in a in a different way. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the um, in your point eleven, you talk about these four. Um, grants and subsidies that have disappeared, were they all one-off grants with no expectation of continuation? I thank you, Councillor, and through the, through the Mayor. Um, so the, yes, but some of them were uh, over multi-years. So the, um, the Otago Artificial Turf Trust, that was to underwrite a loan um, to the Otago Hockey Association for the provision of turfs down at Logan Park. So that's in its final year now. Um, the Predator Free was a, a, a set time frame, three years, um, so that's coming to an end. Um, Dunedin Gymnastics Academy, they came la to last annual plan and Council agreed at that time to fund them for a year. Uh, and the Salmon Anglers, um, that, was a, that was an ongoing grant, but they notified us fairly recently and said that they are um, folding the trust and they handed uh, this year's allocation back. In the case of the of BNC, it may well be that those organisations come back to us during this annual plan for further support, or or not, as the case may be. Uh, they they may. They may. Yep. Councillor Lucas. 
Um, thank you. Um, just in respect to um, the Mosgill pool, and bearing in mind this is year three, um, and it's only exception, so I mean, I would have imagined that budgeting would have been done for Mosgill pool because you would have done some for this financial year anyway and for next financial year. Um, so I'm surprised there's such an increase, and it appears from what's in here that you're budgeting for a loss to run the Mosgill pool. I'm just trying to get my head around it. Uh, thank you, Councillor, and uh, through the Mayor. Uh, um, so we've we've had, it's been closed for a little while. So there's um, an, an obvious increase forecast. Um, I will caution that it is a forecast. We haven't had a year-round facility yet at Mosgill. So <coughs> excuse me, we've had to um, benchmark off similar facilities that that are um, opening and how they've how they've gone. Um, when we build our budgets, we look at uh, revenue and and expenditure uh, at the site level. Um, we're also funded by general rates, um, so that sits at the activity level. So when you apply the general rate um, across the Mosgiel things, so it looks to balance itself out um, in the forecast of approximately $2.8 million. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> the rates... Uh, for Mosgill Pool, the rates contribution for the year is, uh, thank you to my finance colleagues this morning, um, 1.75 million, and external revenue of around 1.1 million. Very good, uh, Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. You've sort of touched on the answer to this question when you were talking about uh, referencing similar facilities for, for Mosgiel, but I'm curious, when we're setting the rates and fees and things for um, entry and lane hireage and all that sort of stuff, do we reference other comparable facilities in other comparable cities, or, or are we kind of flying our own flag, as it were? Uh, thanks, Councillor. For Aquatics, um, we are reviewing the fees and charges. Um, you'll see that there are a lot. Um, so, <clears throat> and we'll bring that back in time for the next 10 year plan. Um, so, one of the things that we have undertaken uh, in preparation for that is to do some benchmarking around similar facilities in other, in other places. Yep. Councillor Lucas. Thank you. Um, following on from that, so. Um, in terms of visitor use for Mosgiel Pool, you, have you got an estimate of what, what you've done your budgets on and what you expect for a, for a full year? Have you based that on, benchmarked that on similar facilities like um, Salwyn or...? Uh, that was undertaken um, in the early stages of the uh, Mosgiel Pool Tupuna Whakaihu project um, and that's uh, based on forecasts. So they, there was some benchmarking but I couldn't tell you right now exactly which facilities were looked at. Um, a question for me, have we, have we ever had a projected or a, a targeted cost recovery figure or percentage for aquatic facilities? So uh, some time ago I saw a report that had a range of facilities around New Zealand and I think at that stage Dunedin was sitting at around 50% and some facilities went as high as 100 but, you know, in a city, for, you know, well, highly used facilities and some were quite low. But did we have, a, have we ever had a target that we're, what we're trying to achieve? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, the financing and revenue policy uh, has for aquatic facilities, 55% rate funded and 45% user pays at the moment. So your projection for Mosgiel is a little bit less than that at this stage, but I mean, it remains to be seen after a couple of years, you'll be in a better position. Is that right? Yeah, it's very much forecast at, at, at this stage. Sure, thank you. Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to go back to the um, the, the Freedom Camping and, and Shared Ranger Program, and I have information in front of me that other councillors may not have um, read, perhaps, about what is the cost of the security to um, for the Freedom Camping Enforcement? Is it correct that it's $174,000 a year and it's increased by $52,000 for next year? Correct. 
So are we using a sledgehammer for a minor issue? Because I, I have information that sites are visited daily um, that they're managed within limits. And I would, I'm just wondering how many Freedom Campers are coming into the city and, and, and is this a big issue that we're investing a lot of money, $174,000 on, um, in security? If I just want to understand what is, what is the problem that we're trying to solve um, have we got numbers on Freedom Campers? Have we got numbers on the, the infringements, et cetera, et cetera? Thank you, Councillor. Um, I can provide you some historical data, uh, not right now, um, on that, but the uh, the infringement, uh, the security programme and the the wider range of programme was developed under a, um, a normal season and predicted season, so it is a little bit challenging, um, but it would be nice to think that we will get the same numbers of campers that we enjoyed pre-COVID. So, um, so it's it's tailored to um, appropriately to the size of the season. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Thank you. Not to belabour the point, but is it correct that the original funding started with a shared model between DOC and Council? Thank you, Councillor. Um, the, certainly the Ranger Programme, um, and we did receive for the first few years some funding from um, MB to assist setting the programme up. And further, part of the Ranger Programme it was collecting stats, and the, you, there is a, a deep kind of understanding of the statistics and trends over time pre COVID. Uh, yeah, that's correct. That's one of the uh, functions of the rangers is to collect weekly, uh, undertake weekly surveys of campers. Um, so we use that data um, to inform the management of the program, but also pass it on to our colleagues in economic development so they so we can work out sort of uh, the number of nights a camper might stay, um, how much they might spend. Um, so we get really good engagement. So there's the, the data we gather from the ranger program goes wider than just managing the, the Freedom Camper. So further to Councillor Barker's question, um, has the programme moved on such that the educative approach has um, done its job and continues, but the, the, the hammer, the, the, the infringement side is not as perhaps as needed as it possibly was in the early days? Is there, are there savings to be made there, I guess I'm asking? Uh, we, we will continually review the program. It is difficult to say because we've had uh, low camper numbers um, recently. So. so that's something you do on an ongoing basis? Yes. Could I also ask a question around, um, I, I just couldn't find this and forgive me if I, I just couldn't see it. In the fees and charges, I recall coming out of a another bylaw, unrelated bylaw, uh, we made a decision to support lifeguards in terms of the fees they were charged at pools. And I can see Councillor Walker nodding his head. Um, I don't see lifeguards anywhere in there. Can you tell me where that would be found? Uh, thanks, Councillor. Uh, we don't uh, specifically have a subsidised rate for lifeguards. Um, how we manage that, um, we're considering that under the fees and charges review and we'll bring it back to Council in the 10-year plan for their consideration. Thank you very much. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, am I correct in my recollection that originally the pools um, serving relevant, uh, the, the subsidy was 50% and then in fact what's happened now it's 55% because costs have gone up and we haven't changed dramatically the gate door fee? Uh, I would have to defer that to Mr Logie as to the, at what point it changed from 50% in the policy to 55-45? If, if he's aware, but we can bring that back. It's 66% now. Um, um, thanks. My real question though was actually bound to the allied security costs. I remember the days of when we were debating whether we would be enabling or, pro or prohibitive of freedom camping uh, under Ms. Patterson was the um, had your role at the time. And 
I know that I remember in the question and answers at the time that we were looking at around about 250,000 for security if we were prohibiting it, and I thought that the security at that point was around about 80,000. So when you bring those numbers back, could you bring them back to that time as well because it would be useful for us to understand. It seems like it has gone up an awful lot, to be honest, and we were supposedly getting a cheap version because we were offering places to go. Thank you. Councillor Walker. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to labour the point. Um, so, still on the um, the Ranger program, my question is around the fact that the costs and the security costs are not simply um, for lo uh, looking at, at uh, freedom camping and its effects or otherwise, but they're also around the very important um, issue of protecting some critically endangered Tonga species on our coasts. Um, for example, if there's an unruly car driver who can get aggressive, that would be an important element of that work. And I think, um, Mr. McLean, you mentioned economic development and the protection of those species feed very much into the economic part of our city and the attractions of the city. So that's a couple of questions there. Uh, thanks, Councillor, and through the mayor. Yeah, so the, as, as I mentioned, that um, a really important part of the Ranger job is um, the Reserves and Beaches Bylaw, uh, and that's where we have some real synergy with Department of Conservation. In that wildlife management, um, we have the ability to set the bylaw for beaches, um, and that's where a lot of our special Tonga species are found. So, um, so it goes sort of hand in glove, as it were. Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to understand the difference between what we're doing with security for freedom camping, which is the $174,000, which I note is around a 40% increase than what they were previously charging, and the shared ranges. So those are two separate programs, is that correct? C correct, but uh, bought in terms of a budget, they're bought under the same program. Um, so the security... The cost increases uh, result from us going to another, using another security company, so that, that's used right across the organisation. So they also carry out security that's for us that's not related to the Freedom Camping Programme. So when I do my sums and divide it up, it looks like it's 3300 a week for um, security around Freedom Camping. And I just, I guess I want to ask a question of the CEO, if, if, we, if, if possibly councillors felt that this was useful or wasn't useful, how would we go about um, investigating whether we needed to change those figures and that amount of visiting, etc? What I can say is I'm not sure, I, I would want to look at your maths because I think that's part of a broader programme, but uh, based on the numbers you have, that, that's right, but I think um, it's slightly broader than, than what you're taking from it. What um, Ms Austin has just reminded me that um, we've currently got the um, request for um, tender proposal out for security services generally and we've it's in um, it's split into three separable parts which because it's noise freedom camping and general security because we're trying to take a more coordinated approach to security services so there's an ability in that contract to structure it in a way that provides some flexibility but if you were looking to change anything in regard to this I would suggest that it would be sensible given where many of the freedom camping issues arose to have a, a genuine conversation with our community board areas and a, in, in advance of the next season I would suggest and it might be again that's one of those things that you want to do in, in, as part of the 10 year plan because it was community boards if you recall who were the drivers for what we put in place because at, um, at, at Brighton, uh, on the peninsula, and in Waikawari Coast, there, there were the areas of main concern, and some in Mosgiel. Councillor Fisa. Tēnā koe, Mr Mayor. Um, uh, my question is following up um, on your answer, um, Ms Graham, to the, uh, Councillor Barker's question about contracting and the tendering. And I've raised this before. And um, is there are there clauses in the tender um, 
calling for contractors who pay the living wage all the time rather than just when they get contracts from the DCC? We require the living wage from our contractors and so um, we can't compel them to pay it in other contracts but once they're paying it for us I think it puts the some pressure on them to pay it for other jobs. Thank you. We appear to have exhausted questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Would someone like to move the motion? In which case, I, uh, Councillor Gary. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Mayhem, would you like to speak to it? Councillor. I would. Um, and thank you to staff uh, for this report. It seems that um, Parks and Rec have provided quite a number of reports uh, for these meetings and they're very fulsome. Um, I particularly want to uh, speak about the fees and charges to begin with um, and note the 3% um, recommended uh, uplift in most cases uh, on average, some slightly changing ch a change to that. I was very pleased to see that um, things like the preschool charges at St Clair uh, Salt Water Pool were kept at a minimum because I've always talked about the importance of um, supporting uh, swimming for youngsters in this country where we have a, a long area of coast uh, and we have had appalling drowning statistics uh, in even worse in this last summer season. Uh, and I asked about the lifeguards for the same reason, and we've had those discussions around this table before. Um, I was glad that uh, the issue of the increased costs and security for um, the Freedom Camping Program were raised, but I do want to say to colleagues, it's a separate part of that overall approach to Freedom Camping. And as someone who was part of the community board drive to uh, look at the bylaw and drive what was in the bylaw and then uh, to get some education and the other side of it, the infringement side of it set up, the program has worked particularly well. Uh, it's also relevant because I lived this for several seasons given my daughter was one of the community rangers uh, and worked in that area. So I got to know what happened at the, at the grassroots. But I will say in the community in which I live um, benefited, and I know that was around the city, we went from having uh, a very tense situation with residents and opposition to visitors uh, travelling in this way uh, and resentment towards uh, bona fide visitors to a situation where um, the education role and particularly around wildlife and managing wildlife was particularly effective and we had ongoing stats provided to us, I think they were quarterly, uh, of how that played out and it improved things over that period of time. Of course COVID interrupted that uh, and so that's why I asked about a review around the security, whether we needed that big stick to the same degree uh, because I think things have settled tremendously. But it is wonderful to see those visitors coming back uh, and in fact I just had an a inquiry from a resident uh, asking about further areas uh, for Freedom Campus so that's excellent to see. Um, but I would like to see the security costs looked at. That seems an awfully large hike. Um, thank you to staff. Uh, it's uh, a good report and I'm very happy to support it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Walker. Oops. Yep, thank you. I'll, just, I'll be quite brief. I just want to speak briefly about the Dock Ranger program and I just reiterate everything that the mover said actually and thank the staff for their work. Um, I just want to point out, I think you're all aware that the Dock Ranger program has been really critical and integral actually in terms of educating um, 
uh, partic- you know, I, I, I'm like Councillor Gary, I was involved at community board level in advocating for, 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 for some of that, the, the beaches and bylaws stuff, but it's been critical in helping to protect some of our uh, amazing Tonga species, um, and I commend, I commend the work of, 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 of those rangers. In fact, we've had some of them here actually at public forum reporting back how um, how that program went and how successful it's been. And just in terms of economic development and the attraction of this city, um, obviously one of those attractions being our amazing um, range of wildlife, I just it's worth pointing out that if a car um, kills one female New Zealand sea lion or hoiho, that's really critical to an already pressured um, um, species. Um, so I applaud the work and the mahi of of the rangers and helping to be part of of a wider group of people helping to protect uh, creatures that don't have a voice. Um, mm. So yeah, just wanted to to let everyone be aware of that that fact and the work they do. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Gary. Your right of reply. Oh, someone asked. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just, just briefly want to say two things. I absolutely support the shared ranger, and I think it's really, really important that we do this work. We are, as I say many times, the wildlife capital of New Zealand, and we absolutely need to protect our wildlife, and the wildlife rangers do incredibly value valuable work on that. I led the creation of a wildlife care code that we did for um, tourism operators to share with all of our visitors and make sure that they were doing that, which also linked to them, their ability to be able to donate to all of the amazing charities which do look after our wildlife. The second thing, I was really concerned to see the security costs go up about 40%. You know, when we're talking about uh, 7% um, inflationary issues that this was of concern to me and I just divided the 174,000 by 52 to get 3,300 a week so that's why I asked the question about is it using a sledgehammer for a minor issue we have had um, less freedom camping over the last few years it will come back I guess and you know there are a lot of these people in New Zealanders who are also coming in freedom camping in fact my mother was a freedom camper when she came to the and she hates me saying this she was in a van and look what she's done for the city so I hope that we're turning around the perception of, of freedom campers um, who have been very valuable to us during, during COVID as New Zealanders but I do want to highlight that I really absolutely think we do need to look into the security um, if we are indeed investing ratepayers' money in, in the right area. So I look forward to a report on that. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I do not want to bring up Freedom Camping again. It quite literally almost ate me alive at the time. I would remind everybody that the bylaw committee at the time voted two to one to actually outlaw Freedom Camping at the time, and it was the council debate and the cost, the false cost of security which actually swung the debate around and the fact that there actually weren't enough camping sites available anyway so the only place to go was that and I do remember that debate quite carefully clearly um, and the issue really was that security was going to be about 250,000 to be punitive and it was going to be about 80 or 90,000 to be welcoming and the cost of actually being welcoming was cheaper than to be punitive. I also remind well, I, I, at the time, the community boards, and, and Warrington especially, and the Waikawaiti Coast Community Board carry by far and away the biggest burden in terms of numbers before the urban site um, fell down. And while there was division inside that community, the community board itself was extremely welcoming and was offering services for nothing to the council at the time. And I'm wondering if, as we've gone forward with these contracts, have we just stopped engaging with the local community and some of the stuff they were offering? Um, I don't know. I don't know. We'll find out when we get back. But I do want to re-emphasise this is, let's not confuse the Ranger program with the Allied Security um, Enforcement of Freedom Camping Rules. They're two different activities. Um, they might have come under one umbrella in the budget, but as the debate showed and the questions showed, they're two different activities. I'm specifically interested, as is Councillor Barker, in how much the security costs have gone up around enforcement given that we are basically following Manakatanga and basically saying welcome to the city and giving them places to go. Thanks. Your right of reply, Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, 
Councillor Walker touched on um, wildlife in terms of economic development uh, and that theme has continued around being a welcoming city and showing Manakitanga um, and remaining an attractive place for all visitors to our city, uh, some who come as freedom campers and settle here. Um, and the work's done by the uh, ranger programme around the beaches and bylaws, uh, much of it uh, potentially unseen uh, by those around this table, but um, though some of us uh, do get regular updates from uh, community board members and residents around that work and how it has make a, made a difference. There seems to be an overarching theme of concern around the increases in security, so it will be good to understand that better uh, and see if that needs to be reviewed in terms of the level of uh, response. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'll now put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. That brings us to the end of item number seven of 22. So that's day. at this stage we'll break for lunch. I suggest we come back at 1.15. Thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried.
to the report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, I'm happy to take questions. Do we have any questions? No. Councillor Gilbert. Sorry, just one very quick one. Um, <clears throat> I realise this is merely a report, but I noticed, when I say merely, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but I noticed in there that I couldn't find any real mention of sunshades or anything like that. The shelter, yes, but sunshade, no, unless either I or the search function missed it. What sort of consideration uh, can we be um, expecting to see locked into any designs? Is it going to be part of the instructions given to any, to anybody who looks at future designs for the play, station, uh, play spaces, please. Thanks, Councillor, and through the Mayor. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, by definition, uh, destination playgrounds have a whole lot of supporting infrastructure, and shade um, is one of those considerations. Uh, feedback we had from people that um, submitted through this process um, was they were keen on, uh, among other things, sun protection. Um, but sun protection in many cases that doubled as uh, rain protection and wind protection um, and I've met recently um, with the representative from the Cancer Foundation to, so we'll be involving them in any um, design um, not only of destination playgrounds but our other play spaces Councillor Wiley um, Thank you, I just also um, through the Mayor, um, want to foreshadow that I'll move um, decision one to um, around uh, decide develop concept plans for one or more of the existing three destination playgrounds, play spaces, Marlow Park, Waterhall Gardens and Mosgill as modern destination playgrounds. So, but the question, um, Mr. McLean, is when we look at um, the future of the playgrounds and knowing the history, especially of Marlow Park and Dunedin South Rotary Club, is it an opportunity for uh, members of the community to basically continue the, the charity work and the giving of um, an engagement with the playgrounds and um, investing or, or purchasing, uh, bequeathing um, funds to upgrade or and um, <coughs> purchased items? I think uh, absolutely that's uh, something we would welcome and, and encourage. And would you also, um, could community groups like Rotary continue playing a part in the future of the playgrounds? Uh, if, they, if they wish to, then certainly. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for the report, and um, thanks for initiating the the, um, the detailed research and feedback program. Um, so, my question is around the fact: if we look, if we d dive into the numbers um, in pure number counts, I think it's 977 people want a new modern destination playground. Um, can I know, I know it's a difficult question, but I'm assuming that the initial and ongoing costs of doing that are substantial as compared to perhaps looking to upgrade the three. Thanks, Councillor. Just to clarify, the, the substantial cost for constructing or...? or a new one. Building a new one. Get, uh, 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 until we... F if, if Council are of a mind to find a new site um, or a request that we, we found a new site, then something to consider would be what supporting infrastructure is or is not in place um, and if it's not then um, obviously we'd require capital to construct that supporting infrastructure so that's including uh, footpaths, toilets, barbecues, um, water, that sort of thing. So, so uh, I'll rephrase the question, it's likely not to be very cheap. <laughs> until we had some detailed design it and knowledge of the site, which I couldn't comment. It's not likely to be cheap. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and second question is going back to uh, Woodhall <coughs> Memorial Gardens and particularly Marlow, is there any data or sense or a feeling in terms of their resilience to sea level rise and you know, likely continued heavy weather events and 
particularly with Marlow being located where it is. Um, thanks, Councillor. <coughs> yeah, Marlow Park um, has been considered as part of the St Kilda St Clair transition plan, uh, and we're confident that there's a sufficient buffer space to allow for any um, transition and, and adjustment through that. If I may, a question of you, Mr McLean. <laughs> I know these are always the ones you look forward to. <laughs> when we are developing or redeveloping a playground to a standard, how lot, what is the life expectancy of that development? Uh, thank you, Chief Executive. Um, uh, we, we obviously everything's uh, subject to approved budgets uh, and forward planning, but it is unlikely we would um, carry the assets as long as we have at Marlow Park without upgrading. Um, so they've been in there a very long time and they've, they've done a, a very good job, um, but yeah, just in normal asset sort of time frames you'd be looking to upgrade with sort of in, in around like the 15 year mark. Okay, uh, Councillor O'Malley. It's just the same procedural question as the previous one. If we go over option one, as um, Councillor Wiley suggested, um, it says one or more of the existing three destinations. Do we need to clarify that? Okay, very good. And and then we have a second decision on the paper as well. Just right, cool. Are there any more questions? Deputy Mayor Barker. Just have a question about in the cost of a new destination playground. And last year, in one of the reports, I think it said that a capital investment of four to six million dollars um, might be expected, given that Margaret Mahi was four million in the Auckland one was six million dollars. So there's the capital investment, and there's also an ongoing co operating cost. And I wonder, <laughs> on a per playground basis, if there are any figures around that? Uh, I could I could get some rough figures for you and, and get back to you on that. Uh, we've been talking with Christchurch City Council about their operating costs for the Margaret Mahi, so I'm happy to find that out for you. Just to add, just to, add to that, the, the cost for Margaret Mahi, and that was a number of years ago now, so that, that figure will be significantly different. Uh, we appear to have, yes, <laughs> Councillor Hulahan. Uh, could, could I ask, you're saying significantly different, but uh, if we're at an option where you could expand on Marlow Park and you've already got existing things there, that if that's quite different to Margaret Mayhe, so the price should be, in theory, a bit less because you've already got equi you know, some equipment there, like Margaret Mayhe was completely new, as I understand it. Uh, Thank you, Councillor. It's, it's difficult to compare costs now because the, uh, it was just a, it was a completely different time. No. Okay. The uh, yeah, so the the cost of Margaret Mayhe Playground was for the play equipment and installing that was uh, just over four million. But the the entire project was much much more because they had to purchase the land. Uh, move services and that, so there was a lot, a lot more to it. Radio, uh, any more questions? We appear to be done. And thank you very, much. thank you very much, gentlemen. And so, uh, to the motion, Councillor Wiley. Would you like to speak? Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I would like to move option one uh, with a focus on Marlow Park. Um, Redeveloped or invest? Do redevelop develop concept plans. Redevelop or invest? <laughs> develop concept plans. Oh, yeah. We'll just get that, 
We'll just get the motion tidied up. We'll take a second. Uh, Councillor O'Malley. It's again a procedural one. Um, I wouldn't be keen on that and, and I would go for all three. So how do we, if this one is voted down and it's gone forward like this, do we then have to put a subsequent back up with the other three or two back in? That's how we would do it? Yeah, we could amend this to put the other two back in if this was the, or, but one way or the other, there'd be a mechanism by which bringing the other two back in. Okay. I'm happy to accept an amendment um, based on that because the advice I got given a few, a uh, couple of minutes ago was to focus on one, but um. So if we leave it unadulterated and then it would just get um, developed concept plans for the existing three destination plan. Yep. The just a, a, a procedural question, because there'll be those in the room that would want to just focus on one, and those in the room that want to focus on three. When I, when I spoke to introduce it, I had planned on moving the dis, um, option one as it was stated in the paper, and that's what I spoke to in um, foreshadowing that it was going to move the motion. The advice I got from um, CEO Graham was that um, to focus on one would be an advantage. But that wasn't my advice. Yeah. So for clarification, the upshot of that would mean that we're going to develop plans for all three simultaneously. Concept. Is that what it means? Yeah, concept plans. Point of order, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman. Um, if if the mover is procedurally, if the mover is not happy to, um, to 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 amend what he's moved to three, I'm happy to formally move an amendment that we make that change to three. Yeah, that we're already there. The language is still not clear. You yeah, know, we're just getting it written. Calm. That's right. So this is not a decision to make one or two or three of these uh, playgrounds. Uh, it's not, this is not a decision to go ahead with doing, you know, uh, production of the playground. This is a decision to develop concept plan concept plans for all three. Procedural with that amendment that's just been made. In the report, it states that Mosgill was of a good standard and it suggested the three to extend was Woodhall, Marlow and, um, Ch was it Chingford, the one at the north end? Uh, Chingford, is it? Woodhall, Woodhall, yeah. Oh, Woodhall, Gardens, Marlow and... As per the paper. As per, as per the paper. So this is as per the order paper on page 36, but it is, it's changed it slightly to get rid of one or more and, in fact, to focus on all three so that we have concept plans for the three. And it, bear in mind that these are just concept plans at this point. So that is what we would be moving forward should the motion pass. Concept plans for all three parks.
maybe the, and it'll just the, the the spacing and grammar will just tidy up as we go. And Councillor Wiley, would you like to speak to it, please? Uh, the counts the second it was uh, Councillor Hulan. Um, thank you. I think uh, the paper actually, one was very good in a lot of um, detail in relation to what's taken place and how the consultation process has gone through. Um, obviously, uh, as many of the councillors will know, I've always had an interest in Marlow Park and having that developed. It's a great space, lots of room. It's connected to the community, families and schools, has good transport access and public transport is nearby. Uh, it is over 50 years and quite tired and um, the Dunedin South Rotary Club built that park uh, I think 53 or 54 years ago and it does need modernising but we got to, you know, you keep the iconics like the dinosaur and the tunnels and some of the other and the whale and some of those other great old um, playground equipment. Then it's been great to see in, uh, investment from NZTA with the bike park and, and around that area. So that's my personal um, focus is Marlow Park. But at the same time, I also appreciate Wardhall Gardens is a great city asset and so is the Mosgill Memorial Park. And we need to continue focusing on ensuring that our playgrounds stay relevant and kids and families really enjoy attending them. The key is that they've, having community focused playgrounds where people don't always have to travel across town to, to play on the latest and greatest facilities is going to be important. Now, we are in a budget process here, and yes, so cost is going to be important in, the, in asking for the, the three concept plans to come to us. But actually, when you think about it, we were always going to, in the future, need the concept plans anyway. Because once we've finished one playground, whichever one it was going to be, we'd be working on to the second one and working on to the third one. Because we do not want playgrounds to get tired and uninviting. So I do appreciate there may be some additional cost to do all three, but I actually think there'll be some savings because a lot of the um, consultancy work will be overlapping. So please support this, and, um, and again, it is a budget uh, and it's for concept plans. So it's not a decision, it's not going, this is what we're going to do. This is to continue the process and to actually show families of Dunedin that actually we are really wanting to move forward on play spaces. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I absolutely support this. I think we are incredibly lucky to already have three destination playgrounds, which became obvious from, uh, from the report that we got last year. We've got the one by the seaside, one in the bush, and one out in a, in a rural kind of area in Mosgill. I think it's really important because, of course, we want to become New Zealand's most livable city, and we, we had some statistics which told us how what a great quality of life we had, the, the top in New Zealand. I also think it's important to attract and keep the younger demographics in Dunedin, and we have see that great big gap when we look at our demographics about... Um, people with young families leaving the city. So having those those accessible playgrounds is really, really important. Um, in the last ROS survey, 56% of users were satisfied with our DCC playgrounds. That's pretty bad, and we need to work on that. So we absolutely need to focus on making this a livable city and making sure that we are actually delivering um, great assets to our community. I went to the Margaret Mayhew playground last week actually and it's a very urban playground and I, I think ours can be a whole lot better and that's why I really like the idea of putting the concept plans forward because what we would have been doing previously with our budgets, fixing a bit here, fixing a bit there, but we can have amazing playgrounds. Everyone talks about when they come to Dunedin going to the dinosaur playground and I think we can do some, some really great work about that as a destination playground but there are the other two destination playgrounds at Mosgill and Woodhall which also serve great parts of our, our population. When you look at the advantages of, of this decision, it addresses the community feedback requesting the development of modern destination playgrounds. The investment in existing assets is more cost effective than establishing a new destination play space. It will better net meet the, um, the, needs of the service needs of the community if we do all three. And 
oh, it was the recommendation from the assessment report, and also the oh, also the costs are important, and and we can do that within budget to get the concept plan together. But then next year when we come to the LTP, we are going to have to to look at how much we're going to invest in our playgrounds, and I'm sure we'll hear from all of the families during that process. Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think the uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the staff on the way they've structured the paper. I think making a decision about the three existing sites is sensible before moving to a separate subsequent decision about whatever else or not. Uh, <clears throat> and I think we are fortunate, as people have said, that we have three significant sites with good geographic spread across the, sit the city um, <clears throat> that will enable us to make a sensible decision uh, to have three spaces instead of one illusory uh, that certainly wouldn't be um, realised for some time. I guess um, the professionalism of the staff will ensure that what needs attention first gets attention first. I don't think we need to start designing playgrounds or arguing about priorities, but I think the only sensible outcome of uh, this paper is for us to support extensive development of the three existing sites in our ownership, uh, and then what we do with a subsequent decision is for a subsequent debate uh, once we've resolved this issue. Councillor Vandervis. I can't support at this point putting staff time and money into concept plans, three sets of them, which we are, as I understand it, simply not able to finance going forward with. The idea of a, what a destination playground is, I'm sure, varies a lot around the table. Margaret May, he's been uh, suggested uh, often all the way through, and it's been pointed out that the cost of the playground equipment of Margaret May was something like $4 million, but the actual real costs by the time they got land and infrastructure changes was near $40 million. So for me, a destination playground is just one very expensive playground. Uh, which we simply don't have the money for currently and are not going to have the money for in the near future, which is why I don't believe uh, producing concept plans for something now is going to be a useful waste of staff time or money. By the time we actually get to a point where we may be able to afford something approaching a destination playground or even three of them, uh, the concept plans that we're asking them to draw up now will simply be out of date. Um, they will be largely, I think, um, it's probably not relevant. And uh, it seems that the situation where we believe we can do everything in this council and that the money will just somehow be there uh, doesn't seem to have um, dawned on uh, people that there are severe limits, those limits have probably never been more severe, and what are we actually doing here? So I can't support um, option one, I think the option two uh, that staff have presented is the only sensible one. I think that um, getting concept plans at a later date, when we are in a position to actually carry those plans out, does make sense, but we simply, I don't believe, have the uh, headroom, free board, finance, whatever you want to call it, to actually indulge uh, concept plans for any of the three uh, playgrounds that we currently have, all of which are currently popular, all of which are well maintained, uh, and all of which currently, as they are, uh, provide very good service to our community. If you think about Marlow Park in particular, the fact that it's still um, producing a uh, very, very fine play space after 50 years, uh, rather than uh, categorising it as a possible destination playground, you could call it a heritage playground. Um, it has uh, a fabulous uh, design. Um, it has a lot of open space. 
It has uh, been updated by staff to have improved uh, safety fall areas with a lot of rubber around the place that hasn't detracted from the original concept. Anything that you do there is going to, I think, potentially compromise the heritage issue uh, of the playground. And uh, as I said, uh, it's uh, saying that it's only a concept at this stage when we don't have the money to carry the concept out, to me, is just premature. So for those reasons, unless I can hear some really good arguments to the contrary, I won't be voting for option one. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. The heritage issue of the playground, well, as a user of the playgrounds, all of them really, I've been to many of them many, many times and I've also been to the Margaret Mayhe playground where I got on the top of the slide and slid down and ran through the water bits and had a ball. So I think it is important in this report states this too that we have um, play areas that are suitable for all ages. Um, and But what I would say about Marlow Park, Marlow Park is my preference as well um, because it's close to a lot of... Um, a lot of areas of people perhaps where maybe they don't have a lot of other options either um, and I know when we first moved back to Dunedin we were in a smaller house and that the St Clair playground became our lounge you know we were there all the time with the, well I was anyway with the kids and uh, it certainly made our lives a lot better and it's about well-being and it's about um, what do we want people to say about our city after they've visited and left? Because I look at um, in Omaru, they've got the steampunk park, and that is a fabulous playground. And then I also look at Margaret May here in Christchurch, and same goes, it's an amazing playground as well. And we don't have, in my opinion, any playground that compares to those two. Mosgill is good. Mosgill is actually a really good playground, but I agree with what they said in the report, that if you've got two children, they've got a pinned-in area that I used to go regularly when they were younger, which was great because you could contain them. But when they um, get a bit older and you've got one who wants to go the little one and another one who wants to go further field you're really stretched looking out for the older one and when the older one's not that much older but thinks they are it's a bit of a problem um, so I like the comments they made in there to try and make it a bit easier for you know when you've got several kids to be able to keep an eye on them um, my children are a bit older now so I'm hoping some of the equipment will be more um, focused on some children that are a little bit older but uh, you know when you talk about the value of doing this um, I would say look at Bradshaw, um, Bradshaw Street, part, the park at Bathgate Park. Now that was just a plain flat bit of grass basically and then they've added, um, there's a, because oh, I grew up in Bradshaw Street in South Dunedin as a child and I used to play get on the swing and on they used to have a little rocking horse thing that I used to sit and go back and forth on but now you go past there previously that Bathgate Park used to be empty hardly anyone was there except for of course if they're playing sport but now it's live, it's lively. If you go past there, there's kids everywhere of all ages and they're playing on that half basketball port court. They're playing on the, um, I think they've got like a, you know, what do they call them, a ham, hamster wheel or something there. And they've got all sorts of things that the kids are loving. Now that's not a destination playground, but it is, they've upgraded it and put some decent equipment there. So... It changes people's well-being. And a lot of those kids were probably just sitting, I'm making assumptions here, but as a mother I think I can, um, were probably sitting inside watching TV or on their devices. And it's got them out and it's got them doing things and I think that's really positive. Um, uh, my concern with the three options is that we might end up spreading the money over the three and you get three okay parks and not a great one that is my concern but hopefully we can get three really good ones if this is the option we go with because if you're going to do a destination park I think you do need to do it well because Omaru and Christchurch have done it and I think Dunedin as the best little city in the world deserves a best <coughs> fantastic playground. Councillor Lucas then I've got uh, councillors Walker, Lafiso, Mayhem and Gary. Thank you. Um, like Councillor Houlihan, um, I've been a user of playgrounds, um, not so much of recent times, and spent a lot of time at all of those playgrounds, and they had a lot of people from out of town who have often commented, 
what's with Dunedin playgrounds because they're not great, as you know, <coughs> has already been mentioned. And I think um, Marlow Park and Woodhall Gardens, um, I won't use the word tired, but they could be very well enhanced to be much better playgrounds. Um, and both Marlow Park with service, service um, clubs and um, the Mosgiel Playground with the um, Torrey Facilities Trust have really supported the establishment of those playgrounds. And I think with having concept plans in place, then it gives the ability for those other organisations to come on board and to see what they can do to support that. So that's why I think by developing um, three, three um, concept plans, um, as is mentioned in the report, there's $9.5 million in the LTP for playground upgrades. Yes, it's not going to go a huge distance, but I mean, I think we can um, definitely make an impact. And I think with the opening of the Mosgiel Pool, more and more people are going to be using that Mosgiel Playground. And um, we've already been talk talked about about the estimated life of upgrade of about approximately 15 years. And I'm guessing that's about how old the Mosgiel Playground is. So we need to be future proofing that before it um, is too late. And I just think it's a great opportunity. And looking at things like those half basketball courts have definitely revolutionised not only the one at Bathgate Park, the one um, on the um, Nairn Street Torrey Road. I mean, that is bringing our older children in and getting them off their devices. And I think we need to be looking at that across our city as about how we can keep our youth active. So I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Yep, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you to staff for the mahi on this. And thank you to the mover, actually. I'm happy to support this. I agree with all the commentary uh, up until this point, except that of uh, Councillor Vandervis. Um, three points for me. I think. Um, Geographically, we're lucky that we have the spread we do with those three particular parks, which um, sits well with both our access access accessibility and our zero carbon uh, goals. Um, and unlike most of you around here, particularly Councillor Houlihan, I don't have children and I, I also don't have a propensity to hang around playgrounds. Um, but I, when I when I read this, I did come to the conclusion that if we did go ahead with a, a new destination playground without investing in the, in, at the others, it would be completely to the detriment of the others and, and also would then have downstream effects on our zero carbon public transport roles, et cetera, et cetera, goals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am concerned a wee bit that the, the biggest number in terms of pure feedback of 977 was for a new destination playground, but I think if if um, if the concept plans are done, and I have no doubt they will be done um, smartly and cleverly, I think we, we're in a strong position to perhaps convince the community um, that we're actually getting three destination playgrounds, so that's potentially a win-win. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fissel. Tēnā koe, Mr Mayor. Um, tēnā koutou to the staff and tēnā koe to the mover. Um, and tēnā koe to Councillor Vandervis, because I wasn't going to speak until he did. Um, and so, as the report says, destination play space means different things to different people. And um, there have been words that have been used uh, throughout the morning, which, you know, um, evoke context and uh, um, uh, emotion and values. And so, you know, fiscally responsible to me means not only the dollars and cents, but also the social well-being and the environmental well-being and social well-being particularly. So to borrow from kaitahu, mana whenua, mō tātou a mō kauri a muri ake nei for us and our children after us. And so, yes, we talk about being fiscally responsible, but for me and for the peeps that I represent, that means taking into account the social well-being of our people. So I'm going to support this. Kia ora. Councillor Mayhem. Oh, well, Marie Lafiso has taken my social well-being stance, but I will echo her words, uh, particularly in the um, survey, 86% of people said that they wanted parks and spaces for children with disabilities. Now, what I'd like to see in the concept plans is that we don't need to necessarily look at some expensive designs but just maybe Marlow Park needs one piece of equipment that is for disabled children. Um, 
84% of people wanted something for older kids. 70% were asking for shade and shelter, and 90% wanted improvement to our skate parks. Well, we're doing that. We've got Fairfield and Mornington skate parks um, being remodelled. We've already um, made a fabulous new park at Aramoana and an older Rangatahi park at Karatane that is for adults and children, and Bathgate Park as um, Councillor Houlihan expressed how popular that is every time I go past there. It doesn't need to be about money, but what it does need to be about is amenities that are accessible green spaces within a walking distance of your neighbourhood. It says in our current role in social wellbeing, in this document here, urban amenity improvements, community facilities, and that says very specifically playgrounds. That is what we are supposed to be doing in our strategic direction, bringing people together. Playgrounds for children are encouraging self-expression, free, active, natural, exploratory and imaginative play. A park like Woodhall Gardens needs very little enhancement in that gorgeous setting to just encourage all of these things with children. So it shouldn't be about the dollar signs. I'm hoping the concept plans will be something simple and not necessary that we have to put all the money into right now, but that we have in our playground plan in the next few years, we'll do this, we'll do that, and we'll do the next thing. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, and some colleagues around the table will remember, I think he was six, a six-year-old boy who came to, was it long-term plan or annual plan? And he had a drawing of a playground that he'd drawn up, it was on a very large piece of paper. And I've never forgotten that. It was delightful to see uh, a, a young boy, supported by his dad, come and talk to us about what he wanted to see in the city. Um, and it reminds me that uh, as Councillor Lafiso so beautifully articulated um, that this is about the next generation and the generations to come. Um, and we saw in the uh, very interesting responses and, and uh, well-crafted questions um, that people are wanting us to cater for all age groups, uh, those with disabilities, um, and that's pivotal, that it's accessible to all and inclusive. And the three playgrounds, or the play, three that we've included in this motion, uh, cover the wider area of the city. Um, I was very happy in the answer to one of the questions to hear Mr McLean say that he's meeting with the woman from the Cancer Society who came to public forum recently. And so that's wonderful to see that's been followed up around shade. Uh, and, and colleagues have, have alluded to the importance of the social wellbeing strategy, uh, the livability of our city, and free family fun, again, has come up at a time when budgets are tight. And some of us have got personal experience of knowing every playground in the city <laughs> with the young child. Um, I think the concept uh, raised by Councillor Lucas, which we talked about in relation to the barbecue at Outram Glen, is, is a valuable one around involvement from community groups and particular service groups, uh, because often they are looking for a project, as I said before, and um, this in involves that feeling of ownership, of pride in helping to develop, uh, to develop such an amenity. And yes, um, it is a time of, of fiscal responsibility and we are thinking about money uh, that's uh, we're looking at draft budgets for goodness sake um, but there's always a staged approach so what we've asked for we can do those concept plans within the current budget what we do then that's the point of decision making and I think uh, one of the things we need to flag with our community is to manage expectations um, that this is not going to be uh, something that's done immediately necessarily uh, or necessarily all at once, those are decisions yet to be made, and there's always a staged approach, but at least if we have a plan, uh, we can move this forward. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, for my recollection, this is coming out of a, of a bigger program that started because of the rundown status of all of our playgrounds, um, and the, the, the one at Bathgate Park, the one at Tyree Road, the new one at Karatane, 
um, Te Raoni. There's a number of them built that are responding at that level, and this is in the, in the going up to the next level of what we do in terms of destination. Um, I acknowledge Councillor Vandiver's point about Margaret Mayhew where um, having to purchase the land and moving the services underneath of it gave extra costs and that would be another reason to do it in the existing sites because we don't have those issues so we wouldn't be expecting to face those background costs. Um, um, uh, Marlow Park's quite funny because it might be the only time where we can actually say three generations can speak to each other and say, I remember sliding on that very slide. Um, <laughs> and that would be something I presume would sit in the concept plan. How much would you retain of the heritage value of that? Um, I um, had the pleasure of speaking at Dunedin North Intermediate in Matua Witherall's class a couple of weeks ago about councils and, and being on council and, um, and said, what do councils do? And I brought up the beaches and reserves bylaw, which they didn't find very interesting. <laughs> Although one of the kids did say, yes, you are right, cars are driving all over the beaches at Waikawa AT. Um, but then I said the other thing we're doing is play playground reviews. And I said we're looking at potentially building three destination playgrounds in the city. And the look on their faces is I just basically, like I just come out and said, free lollies for all right now. It was excitement, smiles, genuinely, wow, this council is actually doing something for us. And I think we've got to remember that. Um, and that's where we, and also i go back to DNI for one more piece of ever, uh, thing to think about. They were presented in their school playground with a concept plan by the board and they said yeah. this is not what we want at all. Yeah. And they came back with a, with a whole new concept plan and that's what they built with the flying fox and the climbing stuff and all that. So concept plans wheel. and hamster wheel or child mo for pill mobility wheels or whatever you want to call them. Because um, um, you know we shouldn't denigrate hamsters like that. Um, <laughs> Um, I think the point is the concept plan allows you to actually get an idea of what you want to do. It's not the most expensive component of planning. Um, and by doing all three, we can explore whether we go with themes. Marlow being by the sea, as Councillor Barker pointed out, Woodall Gardens in a woodland setting, and Memorial, Mosque Memorial Park in a Botanic Gardens township setting. So they could even have quite different themes in them. And, and in terms of economic benefit, not only are we talking about um, serving the people of Dunedin itself, but people have already said that Mar Margaret Mayhe Park in Christchurch is an actual tourist draw. So what, what if we present the three jewels in the crown? A completely different experience where you come to Dunedin and over three days you can experience the three different parks. So these could all be positive negative going forward in this. We're getting up more modern, we're dealing with our communities, we're, we're putting out um, city-wide designs that fit with our carbon neutral policy and accessibility policies. So I think it's a no-brainer ready to go forward and I figure we're going to have a pretty good vote on this one. So uh, in speaking uh, in support of this, uh, I think it's a really good idea to develop all three of uh, concept plans for the parks so that they're all ready to go and we can certainly do them sequentially. There's no need to do them all at once and you know to implement the plans all at once but it is good to have all of the plans uh, ready at once so that we can have more and more public input into them as Councillor O'Malley has just pointed out uh, sometimes that uh, the users thereof, the actual stakeholders in those parks might have really good and positive suggestions that can uh, strongly influence the, the outcome. I just make one note that um, Councillor Mayhem talked about accessibility and accessibility park. The um, Woodhall Gardens currently has the um, the uh, bushwalk that uh, that is the most accessible in Dunedin. So it's wheelchair suitable. So there may be others, but that is the one that uh, immediately sprang to mind when the question was asked at a previous mm. uh, consultation. So it was great that it was right there at top of mind amongst the team and uh, it is actually a very accessible area for all manner of other things and I particularly like Woodhall Gardens because of the shallow water pool which is very good for very young kids. So it also has a good operational barbecue it is, as far as in my observation has not been vandalised, possibly graffitied but I haven't seen that either but I've certainly made use of that well, with young kids and uh, in larger groups of uh, especially young families. So uh, I think all our parks are pretty well used, but I think they would be even more well used if they were upgraded, and that makes a, a significant difference. Having, uh, well, having up-to-date and modern and you know freshly reinvigorated parks going forward, just as we have that with any other facility, 
uh, so it makes sense to uh, be doing exactly the same with our current playgrounds. Um, thank you and thank you all for your comments. Um, again, this motion is about developing concept plans. It's not about a building a playground uh, or playgrounds, as Councillor Gary said. Uh, it's, we've got to watch community expectations. These playgrounds aren't going to be built immediately or all at once. And I think that's going to be a hard one to navigate as we go forward. And um, I can imagine the 639 uh, submitters that gave us feedback may uh, would like us to do all three at once, but there is a process to go through, budget to find, and it will take time. But the key thing is indicating to the community we do have a vision on how we're going to move forward with playground spaces. Uh, I also think it was important that Councillor Barker highlighted the, the ROS survey and the 56% satisfied satisf satisf with our current playgrounds. Councillor Lafiso focusing on the social wellbeing of our people um, was a key point. And um, I think, again, it's about when we look at it across the community. Um, and I liked Councillor O'Malley's three jewels in our city crown. I think that's um, really important in the fact that actually if they've got three playgrounds to go to, then they're going to spend a little bit longer in our city and um, our residents are going to enjoy our playgrounds more. So um, thank you for supporting this. And um, Very good. So I now uh, put the motion. All those in favour, say aye. Division. Division. Councillor Ackler. Aye. Councillor Barker. Aye. Aye. Councillor Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Hooley. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Mayhem. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vanderbilt. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. Yes. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried 14-1. Uh, thank you. Now we have uh, decision two, and um, I would like to um, move uh, option one. So, hang on a minute here, uh, option two. So, decision one, we went with option one. Decision two, I think we should go with decision two, with option two. So, not to progress uh, investigations for the establishment of a new destination playground on council owned land at this point in time uh, because we have three uh, existing playgrounds to work on. Seconded, seconded Councillor O'Malley. And so um, in putting this forward I think we are in a time of budgetary constraint and we, um, we have been working steadily on our playgrounds and the response that probably we all have been getting from the public has been uh, Quite fantastic, but you know we've got three destination that are you know that we consider destination playgrounds at the moment, and to upgrade them uh, into uh, the modern world and attract a whole new set of people, I think is a, a really good mission to set ourselves in the meantime, and I would like to see them done on a sequential basis, but you know we can have all of those plans to consult with, and then by the time we come to doing a brand new playground, we might have a completely different style as things move on. So I think it's appropriate that we park this in the interim, but it can always be there in the back of our minds. So, do we have uh, any other speakers to that? Councillor Melly. Your Worship, in my opinion, this is just basically tidying up a series of resolutions that went down recently where we were to investigate a single destination playground and I think it's just good to just get it off the work plan and back to what the staff recommendation was which was to the three destinations which we've now agreed on so um, I look at it mostly as a tidying up event and I'll be happy to support it. Is there no other speakers? I'll put the motion up. Sorry. 
Councillor Hearn, do you want to speak? I'll, I'll just say, <coughs> yeah, I, I won't be... Uh, I will support this option too. And the reason is, <coughs> if we've got spare land, I think we need to keep it for housing. And we've got three key areas that are really good... Um, to expand on and um, create hopefully really great destination playgrounds and because a lot of ours are old and need repairing. Some might call them vintage but they're run down and old. Thank you. I'll put the motion. Division, hang on. I'll just before we do that. Councillor Acklin. Aye. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Mayhem. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. Aye. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Carried unanimously. Just for your information, people, the, uh, we've just swapped microphones because that particular microphone stays on. And it's actually a different, uh, slightly different spec of microphone, apparently. So as we've seen uh, during divisions, uh, there's quite a, uh, a competition. You know, the, the to and fro happens so quickly. It's better that um, uh, Lynn uses that one. So, Mr. Mayor, can I, while you're talking about microphones, can I just remind people that because it's not, and that's not a different spec mic, it's just the way it's been set up. These mics around the table here have been set up in such a way that when you push your button, you turn your mic on, but you turn the other any other one off, and there's only one on at a time, except for that one that you've just highlighted. The key thing is when you speak, don't turn your mic off because as soon as the next person goes to speak, when they turn theirs on, it will turn your mic off. What's been happening all day is that somebody finishes speaking, the next speaker turns their microphone on to respond, and then the person who was speaking goes to turn theirs off, but it's already off, so now they've turned it back on and then they've turned the other one off. So the, the bottom line is just don't turn your mic off. So I hope that's all clear. You just need to, you do not need to turn it off. Just turn it on when you're ready to speak. So uh, next item on the agenda is Aquatic Facilities Review, item number nine on page 45. So our, our gents have returned to the chair. Uh, do we have any questions, please? Deputy Mayor Barker. Did, did you want to open with anything or you just, no? Cool. Um, I just want to understand about the delivery of um, swimming opportunities about what council can deliver and what are the Ministry of Education's responsibility because I remember that during the LTP we put over $200,000 for a roof for one of the swimming pools which came out of our council's budget. Do you have clarity on what the Ministry of Education's role, are, role is in providing swimming pools looking after swimming pools um, and their focus on that going forward. Um, <coughs> thank you, Councillor. At a time I've got low blood sugar. Um, the Ministry provide the assets and swimming lessons are part of the curriculum, um, but I can't speak for the Ministry um, in terms of how they invest. Just want to understand if they're providing the assets, are they also providing the upkeep for the assets, or are they just the asset in the ground and they're not providing all of the the care around the pools? Uh, it's my understanding that schools get allocated a uh, asset maintenance budget, and the schools decide. But but again, I'm it's outside my uh, area of expertise. Councillor Vandervis. Oh, that was my question too, thank you. A follow-up question to that, is the issue that a lot of the school pools 
are ageing, and that's the problem, in fact, that they need a lot more upkeep than they used to, and schools don't have the operational budget to manage that. Yeah, the school pools are <coughs> throughout the network are, are fairly old. I think the, the most recent one is 47 years old. So, yeah. Councillor O'Malley. And I guess the follow-up question to all those questions is, and we're being asked to step in where the central government is not probably, right? Anyway, my real question is Moana Gao Pool. Um, it's sort of separated off the list because it's not a school pool and it's, it's a legacy pool from the old Cherry Farm days. Is there any um, appetite or future plans to consider it as a community pool or DCC facility pool going into the future given it there's nothing much up on the north coast that is a community pool otherwise and it kind of functions like that at the moment. It's getting a pretty big grant. Uh, yeah, at the moment, council do uh, does contribute funding towards that, but uh, I'm not aware of any plans to take over the management of that pool at this point. Councillor Hulahan. Thank you. Have we put questions to the ministry and um, even written them a letter asking them to upgrade or asking for evidence to show whether they're even maintaining what they've got here? Because, I mean, I've sat on a school board before and I can tell you, this, you know, schools complain about the funding they're getting. So, um, And we could give the example of, of already the schools we've had to top up the funding for their pools. Are we putting those questions and hope, asking for answers from the Ministry? Thank you, Councillor. Um, we work with, uh, we're working with the Ministry um, and I think you'll see as one of the options that we're looking at is to progress that work into potentially looking at co-funding um, opportunities. <coughs> How is that a benefit to us when the Ministry, why isn't it a case that the Ministry should be paying for those pools? I'm not sure that's a question uh, that I should be answering. I'd just say, councillors, that part of the review of the aquatic network was to look at where we had bodies of water, which ones council controlled, which ones were school operated, and then to take an all of city approach to potentially managing the network. Now, the, what staff are suggesting is that we look at, once we have a formal direction from the council about what you're interested in us doing, doing something more formal with some of those other providers to see if there's a way of, of working collaboratively to make sure that we've got adequate provision of of um, space across the city. Because, and you know, we have the new Moscule pool, we've got Moana, our community pools, but the, this shows that there is different sorts of needs out there that we, we don't currently control. So that's the point. Without a direction from council, so staff have done the review, we've said, here it is, Provide us with some direction about how you would like us to progress this, is essentially what we're asking. Councillor Mayhem. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you for this report. Um, my question is, what is the level of community usage around the 16 school swimming pools? Do you have any data on that? Um, thanks, Councillor. Um, <coughs> A lot of uh, school children use the pool, so they um, some school pupils at schools that have pools actually go and use um, the municipal pool because it's they're not deep enough. Um, we did talk throughout this review to uh, principals who are the sort of primary operators of of the pools, um, and. It, the start of those discussions were: Can we work together to get more community usage? There was a bit of a reluctance um, that requires a lot more management to have it open to the community. Um, all sorts of things can happen uh, that render water quality um, out of check pretty quickly. Uh, the aforementioned eight-foot log springs to mind, um, and schools are really struggle to deal with. Um, with things like that when they just pop up, so um, <laughs> so to speak, yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, the, the the schools were sort of, in their view, um, the support they could get off us was more around that technical advice. I, I raise this with you because I live out near uh, Moana Gal Pool, but 
Um, you can't go there on a casual basis. You have to buy an annual key subscription. But I note that Warrington School has just opened their facilities two mornings a week for a one-hour um, session, and, and it's uh, I guess it's aimed at toddlers or parents who might want to do some lane swimming once they've dropped the children off at school. And I, I it's not a question, but I think this is brilliant. And I wonder, I wonder, here, here comes the question. I wonder if other schools might uh, take up this opportunity to offer lane swimming, you know, that, because these are recreational facilities that are spread across 16 different destinations for people that might not have access to um, Moana Pool. I know some of them have hoists too, which is an opportunity for people with um, disabilities to utilise those facilities. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, I know through discussions with Otago Boys, um, they're looking at upgrading their facility um, and they will be inviting um, other user groups to, to come through and, and use the use their pool. So, um, but they'll, th those sorts of things will form our ongoing discussions with um, particularly the Ministry of Education and the, and the school principals. Thank you. I've got questions from Councillors Gilbert, Acklin, O'Malley, Gary and Houlihan. Councillor Gilbert. Thank you kindly. Thank you kindly. Uh, mine is in relation to the OTPT, uh, the physio pool um, on page 52. Now I, I note from that that the DCC is in communication with the uh, Otago Therapeutic Pools Trust. I'm merely curious as to whether we have any idea on time frames of the, uh, the feasibility study that they are undertaking. Thanks, Councillor. I don't, uh, <clears throat> I don't have a sense of time frame, but they've recently established a steering group, and we have a staff member on that. So that was as of about last week. So they're working through their options um, now. So. Councillor Eklund, uh, you've just met me to it, Councillor Gilbert. I was wanting to ask some questions around the physio pool as well. Just, um, yeah, obviously. Must be running short on battery. Um, you're just wondering, you know, obviously the, the council has nothing to do with the ownership or control or operationally control of, of that pool. Uh, what sort of assistance um, can council be to getting this pool back up and running and where the, where's the communication gone or conversation gone uh, you know, with the trust uh, to date? Um, thanks, Councillor. The, uh, the the support that we've given the consultants running the feasibility study has been predominantly around uh, operational matters to do with pools, so providing that expertise and supporting them through that. And I suppose the next part of it is uh, the cost of getting that pool back into operation. Uh, have any of the discussions or has, is there any intention from DCC to be um, potentially contributing to that. Thanks, Councillor. That would be a matter for, for the councillors to consider. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, it's just on that list, the Strathtyree School, is that effectively the Middle March pool? Because I know that Councillor um, Wilson in the past used to refer to it as the Middle March pool. Is that it? Thanks. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, is it correct that many of the communities that have pools in their schools have done a lot of fundraising in the past themselves to um, provide better, better parts of the pool, be it covers or whatever? Has that been part? Is that correct? Has that been part of the deal? Yeah, feedback from a lot of the school principals was they have to raise funds from the from their school community and the wider community f to help out with those operational costs. Yeah. And is it also correct that there are examples amongst community pools, and I'm thinking of uh, Portobello School. I know have that summer program where you can buy a key, as has been alluded to, and families can use the pool over the over the summer, and it works very successfully under that sort of scheme. Yeah, I think that's available too uh, in some schools, but again, that's the the decision of the school. 
and would it also be the case that um, the technological support is really important? I'm not sure how that's dealt with on a school by school basis, but I know that the chemicals that is it correct the chemicals you're working with in pools are, uh, can be highly dangerous. You know, if they're used incorrectly, there's a real expertise required, which would be I assume very difficult to replicate from school to school. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, that, and that's some of the support that we currently provide the schools. So we purchase, um, uh, well, the schools use our purchasing um, contacts to purchase their chemical uh, at cost. Um, schools that don't have bulk chemical storage facilities, we will store um, that in our storage facility um, and provide technical advice on water quality and how to maintain it. And my final question would be around if we were to do these investigations and continue down this track of the possibility of, of co-funding but investigating that possibility, would that allow staff to look at the opportunities for community use as part of those discussions? I think they would be part of those discussions, yeah. Yep. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yeah, my questions were around the therapeutic pool as well. Um, it just, I'm wondering, is there anything, any other pool in our city that compares to the services that that pool used to do? Can you repeat that question? Sorry, Councillor. Obviously, with the the pool not operating now, that's left a gap. I've certainly known, I know other councillors have, I'm sure I'm getting complaints regularly about it not being open. I think some people think the council owns it. But um, what, you know, are there any other pools in our city that could do the job that it, it used to do? So we have provision in at uh, Te Puna or Whakaehu for hydrotherapy. It's not uh, a, a replica of the physio pool, um, but all of the pools at that facility have ramps. So um, the spa pool, you can wheel a wheelchair into it. Um, the therapeutic pool is ramped as well. So, um, so but it's not a, a replica of the, the physio pool as such. With the physio pool, is there more? Um, are there more things the council could do to help, you know, speed along the possibility of it opening again? Well, yeah, the the, the trust have engaged a consultant to run that process, and we're we're inputting into that. So it'll be going at uh, the the pace that the consultants are are working at. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you. On the same topic, uh, I know one of the previous um, delight reasons for delay with the said physio pool uh, was the lack of a, a lease arrangement with the DHB before it became defunct. Are you able to tell us whether that um, was put in place or is in place now between the Trust and Te Whatu, uh, Ora? for the use of the building? I can't comment directly on whether the, the lease is in place, but I know that one of the options uh, of the feasibility study is to look at uh, using the existing site, and one of them is to potentially look at an alternative site. So that's the two stream work streams of the feasibility. Councillor Lucas. Thank you. Um, of the list of schools, um, which about half, I think it is half, get funding and fa half don't, is in their arbitrary amounts. Is that historical, those and, and the amounts? Uh, yes, yeah. And so potentially by highlighting to those schools who currently aren't getting funding, are we raising expectation that there may become a more of a level playing field? Uh, I don't think we're raising any expectations. I mean, if we went down a, a sort of a, a route of investigating co-funding, that you know those sorts of things might be teased out a little bit further. Um, and further, you comment that Lee Stream schools close, their pools closed, and that the Mosgiel West one will close. Is that because, and I'm aware of the Mosgiel West one, is that because it's just got too financially difficult for them to fund, and would they potentially reopen if there was a co-funding arrangement? Uh, I'm not sure of the answer to that, Councillor, whether they'd reopen. Sorry. 
Councillor Gary. I just want to signal that I'd like to move option one when the time's right. Uh, thank you. I think the option's right. The time is right, yes. Do we have a seconder? Second. Councillor Ackland, thank you. In a, a summer, ending a summer that has had the most horrendous drowning statistics that have come very close to home um, for our community and nationally, um, it's always my view that um, being a, a country with a long coastline and access to beaches and rivers as part of the Kiwi experience that we should turn our mind to how we can support um, swimming people having good swimming skills, and particularly children. Uh, when I was a primary school child, I remember our school pool. It was part of, it was an integral part of our school, and we had lessons on a regular basis, um, and, and that was really important. I also have memories of actually being put in a pool, uh, or put in the sea with a life jacket on and a line to teach me to swim a little bit more by my family, and I've never forgotten that traumatic experience. However, um, School pools are very important. Um, and there's a lot of money tied up in them. And we're in a point in time when a lot of our school pools are ageing. And communities have had to raise money, as we've heard. Um, and they have done so. Communities have chipped in uh, to, to ensure that their children have those opportunities. But there are many schools that don't have school pools. And they pay extraordinary amounts of money uh, to transport. That's the big cost for them, is transporting the children to Mawai. A pool. Um, and as we uh, work towards our zero carbon goals, uh, that doesn't fit at all. Uh, we have these resources, we're already giving support, and I'm certainly aware that um, those chemicals that are dealt with uh, need very expert skills to manage them. And I don't know how that's been done in the past, but I'm really glad to hear that our staff are able to support that technical knowledge because schools have so many things to address and they have a set budget and it's difficult to do that. Um, so that, that's a really good partnership, I believe. The motion uh, that is before us is to investigate. It's not to go down the co-investment track just yet. It is to investigate the potential for co-investment options. And I just want to remind everyone that the co-investment suggestion is between um, DCC in partnership with the Ministry of Education, School Boards and private, private investment. Uh, and, and given we have those pools already, that seems like a very good resource uh, to uh, support and would give us some conversations, opportunities for conversations around how communities can use those pools more. And I was very pleased to hear Councillor Mayhem talk about that. Um, also, uh, we have been told in our report uh, around how it will ease demand on Moana Pool. And I found this um, review, aquatic review, uh, particularly helpful. And I want to thank the staff for that work and the report and the way it's written. Um, we don't have a budget for upgrading pools, um, uh, and so we do need to, again, carefully manage expectations. But we we, we do have school pools, we do have uh, stress on our Moana pool, and we do know that learning to swim is a really important skill uh, for our children. So again, investing in our future generations is part of this. So I do hope that you will support this, and I remind you again, it's investigating this particular uh, track that we might go down. Councillor Huyan. I have um, serious concerns about um, the Ministry of Education getting an opportunity here to perhaps get out of fully funding these pools that are in their schools. While I fully support our community having access to as many pools as possible, because I agree with what Councillor Gary said around the benefits of being able to learn how to swim, um, having sat on a school board, I find it frustrating about um, the Ministry of Education and its lack of, um, or the, just, you know, the board, 
I was on, we didn't, it wasn't an issue with a pool. It was an older building that was on the site and there wasn't a lot of money coming forth from the ministry. And I believe a lot of these other schools have the same issue around the pools. If the pools are already there in the schools, they need to put it in their budgets and pay for them. The problem we've got is that it's going to end up being a long-term burden on our ratepayers for years to come, paying for these old run-down pools. It is not fair, it is not reasonable, and I'm not keen on it at all. I am keen on us having really good facilities, and what I would urge is that the Ministry of Education um, do the thing and fund it. Fund your old buildings, do them up, fund your blimmin' pools. Don't leave it to us to do it because we're struggling to find money for just, you know, everyday things. It's not fair that we should pick up the budget for government for this. I mean, the budget has a much bigger pond than us. Excuse the pun, but um, yeah. I, I, and also, what I would say is that the. Um, any parent knows now if they take the kids for swimming lessons it's extremely hard to get into swimming lessons at Moana Pool there's demand huge demand for those lessons and um, I mean I've tried on several times to get the kids in and I couldn't get in because the, the, the lessons it fill up so quickly so there's definitely demand and I just want to give a plug um, that the Saltwater Pool, if you haven't been before, which I'm sure most people in our city have, but if you haven't go, it is an exceptionally good place to go for your well-being. You come out of that pool and I just think you feel incredible. So, um, yeah, the Saltwater Pool is an asset in our city that I think we should um, continue to improve and keep along with our other pools because they are so it's such an incredible facility thank you councillor o'malley thank you mr mayor i'm just looking at next steps and um um the uh, staff will talk to we'll investigate also with moe and other potential partners and i really want to when i look at other potential partners the reason i asked about the middle march school and moana gal and you could talk about portobello school as well is that with local government reform of the 90s and absorption of those areas into Dunedin, I think we f may have not necessarily given full um, focus to the resilient communities component of our district plan and our spatial planning. Um, and so we need to be looking at those pools as offering a spatially related service to their communities where the big pools are too far away for them to be able to get to. Um, and actually, I just want to acknowledge Tony Parata here um, and his role in the Moanagao pool, which um, in the end was so great that there was no need for anybody else on the board at the time. <laughs> Thank you. Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I support this because, uh, number one, it takes a, a strategic investment approach rather than an ad hoc approach. I think that we, we came into the LTP last time and put over $200,000 to help fix the roof on a school pool, and I guess that would have opened the floodgates perhaps to, to, to lots of schools whose pools are in varying states of repair to, to perhaps ask council to help. And I, I think we really need to understand what the Ministry of Education is doing about providing school pools. Because I hear, yes, they're providing the capital asset, yes, they're providing some operational costs, but in the report it says that schools are actually having to fundraise themselves. So I think we need to cl get clarity on that. And I also think that if we put together a, um, a strategic plan around these, then actually we might be in a stronger position to talk to the Ministry of Education about whether or not they're neglecting Dunedin and whether there are cases for investment. So that also it's not all about council having to, to underwrite everything. I also note that um, in the what are they called summary of considerations it says that Dunedin has sufficient pool space for its population and the challenges is a lack of usable deep water and it says school pools will not be able to meet the need of needs of the increasing number of older adults. And I really like that it has some population forecasts and demographics in that. So we have challenges with less children, which of course we're going to attract with our amazing playgrounds. Um, but we also are having to cater for the needs of older people. So I really think that looking at this strategically is really, really important um, for all the reasons outlined in the report. Um, and it was great to get it. Thank you. Councillor Mayhem. Um, I like what... Deputy Mayor Barker is saying about a strategic approach. 
Um, at the moment, we're suffering from a water crisis, and I think if people in uh, Mosgiel didn't have their own private swimming pools in their backyards, or people in my community with private swimming pools, they could be going to a school facility. My seven-year-old, I don't know if anyone else has got a seven-year-old, she gets up on the morning and the weekends, packs her togs and takes herself down the road to the neighbour's house because they've got an outdoor pool. Waitati School used to have a pool that in my time we fundraised for solar panels and heating and upgrades to the changing rooms and at some point the Ministry of Education stopped funding that facility. Now what Waitati School has is a vacant lot, a big old concrete pad where the pool was demolished and nothing ever went there as a replacement. And if you look at the north coast, we've got Moana Gale Pool, which is too cold for my kids, they're fussy, and we've got Warrington School. Warrington is fortunate to have theirs covered in and enclosed. Um, one thing that was very useful about the Warrington School Pool, from a resilient aspect, there was a huge power box hedge fire that threatened four houses. It was a local parent that smashed in the door to the swimming pool and gained the local firefighters access to that body of water, put out the hedge fire and saved four burning houses. Swimming pools are volumes of water in our communities that can be utilised not only for recreation but as a, as a firefighting potential too. I raise that with you. Thank you. Councillor Lucas. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm aware of the capacity um, issues at Moana Pool. I'm aware of schools that have missed out on being able to um, book in swimming lessons um, because there physically was no, no time available. Um, and I guess by the time that this report, um, if this motion is successful, comes back, we will have had more than six months operation of the um, new Mosgiel pool to see how that has helped alleviate the capacity. I mean, I like the idea of um, bringing the school pools um, in to um, help um, alleviate capacity. I mean, I'm aware of, you know, um, Arthur Street School children go for, a lot of them go for swimming lessons at Otago Boys. I'm aware of all that that's already happening. Um, but it is a major issue for our schools to be able to access swimming lessons and it is in the curriculum. Um, and so if this can help um, free up capacity in other pools, but I am very, very um, conscious of what Councillor Houlihan said is that um, are we raising expectations and are we simply going to pick up funding that the Ministry, I mean having sat on Board of Trustees myself, the Ministry be pretty quick to pass the buck I'm sure and I'm just, that is my note of caution is that when this report comes back um, in a year's time that we do not end up with a huge um, funding issue for us. Thank you. Right of reply. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Councillor Houlihan uh, talked about a burden to the ratepayer. I just remind colleagues that this motion is investigating the possibilities. Uh, but Councillor Houlihan also and other speakers talked about the um, pressure and the difficulty of getting access to um, lessons. Um, I would remind colleagues this is cheaper than building a new pool, as we know. Um, Councillor O'Malley um, talked about resilient communities and the distance to travel to pools and I certainly know that um, some of the little semi-rural schools uh, who pay for transport is a huge cost for them. Uh, Councillor Barker talked about the strategic, um, a strategic approach versus an ad hoc approach and that for me was a really attractive part of this motion. Uh, and it does, I believe, give us the opportunity to talk with strengths to people like the Ministry of Education. Um, I think if we think the Ministry of Education is going to suddenly start funding polls, uh, it would be nice to think that's going to happen, but I, I think um, that's most unlikely to the level that they need. Uh, and it's only going to be through partnership of some kind or another that that's going to happen, in my view. Councillor Mayhem um, talked about resilience too in terms of firefighting capacity, and that is a real issue in um, rural outlying areas uh, of the city. Uh, at a time like this, when we have a drought um, and, and fire risk is a real uh, problem and any bodies of water uh, are, are certainly an asset. Uh, and I think Councillor Mayhem described 
um, very clearly what it's like to lose an asset like a school pool in a community. It's much wider than that particular group of children. Uh, and the geographic spread is important. Um, and Councillor Lucas um, warned us about raising expectations and that's something we've talked about today uh, and that's something we need to manage but she also mentioned the pressure on pools and learning to swim and I come back to my original statement that we live in an island nation with a long coastline and many rivers as part of the Kiwi experience and we've lost far too many people from drowning which is so preventable if more people knew how to swim and how to have the skills in the water. And we owe this to our children to uh, do whatever we can to support um, them getting lessons and having the ability to learn the skills. So I do hope that you will. I urge you to support this motion which investigates the co-investment opportunities. Could we take ABC separately, please? Yes, I don't see why not. So uh, let's do that and we'll see how we go, whether we need a division or not. But anyway, so first I'll put the motion A, that Council notes the aquatic facilities review. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Against? Carried. B, request staff to investigate potential co investment options and reporting back. All those in favour, say aye. Against? No. Do you want that noted? No. Okay. Thank you. And thirdly, that uh, council notes staff will continue to work with the Otago Therapeutic Pool Trust. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. On we go. Item number 10. The Sports Facilities Review. Our gentlemen have returned. Questions? Do we have any questions? Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I just want to ask some questions around the ice stadium. Um, so it is a, a local facility, but do I understand that teams come from the Northern Hemisphere to use the facility during their summer? Thanks, Councillor, and through the Mayor. Um, yeah, we have some visiting international teams. Um, so it's uh, Sport Otago classified that as a, a regionally important facility. And my next question, just because it says it's getting a bit old and tired, I guess, is when will it need to be replaced? Can we, continue, can, can we keep on maintaining it forever, or is there a time when we will have to replace it? Uh, so the maintenance is undertaken by uh, the, the trust. Um, I can't comment on exactly when it would uh, need to be rebuilt or replaced um, at this stage. <coughs> Councillor Bits of Pope. Um, two questions. The first one is a follow-up on that, but the issue with the ice, um, with the frozen area below the ice causing a problem, has that been rectified into the future when that repair was done? Uh, thanks Councillor, sorry I can't answer that. I can. Uh, what I can do is find out from um, the management of the ice stadium and, and let you know. Okay, and the second question. And the sec thank you. The second question is about the gymnastic issue um, that has, as you report, has been um, lobbied um, to us so on several occasions, um, and you talk about the discussions progressing favourably, um, given how long those discussions and how many iterations of those discussions have taken place, uh, do you anticipate a satisfactory outcome that is not going to end up back on our doorstep? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, I can't say whether gymnastics won't be back in front of you. Um, uh, what I can say is that the option that we're looking at at the moment uh, will require a decision of council. So, um, so that, that if it progresses favourably, um, the issue will come back in front of you, um, but it'll be for a decision on another matter. To talk, we can and say that that will be around the um, use of a piece of council green space 
that we've signalled in the report that we've identified, but um, the nature of the green space is such that it would require a council decision for us to be able to free it up. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Can um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, synchronicity of questioning. Uh, mine's also on the DGA, the Gymnastics Academy, and I think you've partly answered this now. My question was basically, are they amenable to us providing them with a piece of green space? And I guess the answer is yes, from what I've just said. Uh, yes, and the, the area that we're considering is not currently used. It gets, uh, it's a little bit wet in winter, some, turn somewhat into a wet slide to play anything on. So, um, But yes, they're definitely amenable. And the second is round point 51. And I think it was pointed out a few times during the report that there's a, obviously there's a, a lot of pressure on some courts during peak times and the su suggestion that you're going to um, work to address this. I mean, how, how is that, I mean, how do you see that being possible in, in the context of obviously people's working day and that demand obviously from four till seven? Um, thanks, Councillor. Uh, yeah, so that's that, that's the challenge. Um, people are either working or at school. Um, so it's about um, how we look at the all the facilities and can we repurpose some of the existing indoor facilities and do something elsewhere to perhaps relocate a, uh, an activity um, to free up court space. So those are some of the things that we'll consider, um, and particularly when we work with um, Sport Otago and the spaces and places plan and the development of a sub-regional plan. Great, thank you. And the final question is around 46 and the changing rooms and the, you know, the fact that it's been identified that improvements and upgrades were required. Is this primarily just the dowdy state of changing rooms or <clears throat> is it more addressing um, 2023 needs around including more people? Thank you. Uh, it's probably fair to say it, it's both. Um, some of our change rooms are tired and uh, we would we will modernise them. So, yeah. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, point 32, you mentioned Logan Park and the Oval as significant outdoor facilities, but you don't mention Memorial Park, Peter Johnson Park, um, or Sunnyvale. Any particular reason? Is it, it's just, are they just, just quick examples and, and the list is bigger? Uh, you know, you're correct. That's uh, if, if you look at Sunnyvale um, and Peter Johnson, um, this we were sort of primarily focused on the multiple codes all at once, but um, yeah, you're correct. Because I'll touch it in speech time, but no, I'll touch it in speech time. Uh, Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I just want to explore something that I don't think has been explored, and I kind of asked a question when I asked about the outside teams coming in for um, the ice stadium, and I noticed on all of the um, the engagement, I didn't see the, that Enterprise Dunedin were engaged, and I, uh, I see that you also talked to a number of academics, and I just wonder if... Um, Sports tourism came up because we're talking here kind of about the sports facility in relation to our residents and the number of our people that use them. But I'm also extremely aware, as are all of us that see people in uniforms visiting the town, about the effect that visitors and sports have on the city. So has there been like an economic impact lens and visitor impact lens put, put on these facilities review? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, no, so this this was just a review at this point, um, and then when we come through to, well, we'll work with Sport Otago on the regional plan and then the sub-regional plan, um, that's what we'll be looking wider, so economic impact um, it will definitely be part of that work. Councillor Gary? And just following on from that, will that also ta take you down the track of the international teams that come here, but also the and I'm thinking of the curling team, members of the international curling team who represented New Zealand with several from Dunedin at the, at the Worlds that trained in the, in the uh, ice stadium. Will it take into account that kind of activity as well? Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, look, what we have to be is uh, 
when we're thinking about future facilities and and upgrading is have to be fairly nimble. Sports change and trends change, like uh, something that's growing rapidly that we've been approached about um, a few times lately to provide facilities for is pickleball. Um, it, uh, it's a rapidly growing um, sport, so I mean, who knows? In the future, it could be a facility for hunt the tasseled bobby gong. I don't know. So, but we have to provide the facilities and be kind of agile and nimble. So. Um, yeah, yep, it's about thinking wider. Councillor Lucas. Thank you. Um, it doesn't say, but I'm presuming that the Sport Otago um, plan will be done in time for the 10-year um, long-term plan, because there's no time frame. I know it's driven by another party. Yeah, I'm, I'm unsure about that. Sorry, Councillor. Um, it's It's... It started, um, but because it's a, it re relies on the other TAs in Otago, um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to say that it will be ready for us. Um, yeah. Because I, would I be right in presuming then that would then drive our investment, for example, in doing upgrades, say, at the Edgar Centre, my second home, which I'm on. So for things like that, that would, that would really drive our decision making. Correct. It would. Uh, it'll inform it. Um, it'll inform where we might need at a even at a regional level to invest um, and leverage off potentially uh, wider funding opportunities. Councillor Mayhem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Kia ora, thanks for this report. Um, my question is around item 41, indoor sports venues. I wondered if you had any statistics about the usage of the Caledonian Gymnasium. How? frequently it's used or will the will the review of this provide some of that information? I see that as a wonderful facility that's perhaps underutilised. Uh, thanks Councillor. So the Kelly Gym and Andy Bay Road, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's quite heavily used. Um, yeah, we have some uh, long-standing bookings in there so the, even the downstairs part which always, was always just the foyer um, that's used um, it's booked out for um, some form of martial arts type training and the upstairs is, is fully utilised. So, um, but I can, I'm happy to get some bookings data to show you. Um, it's no, that's wonderful to know that it's being used. Thank you very much. Uh, we appear to have exhausted questions. Any more? Thank you very much, gentlemen. So, would someone like to move the resolution? Councillor O'Malley, seconded. Councillor Mayhem. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, it's good to see this review. It's been moving along for quite a while and it's good to see it get to this point. Um, I'm going to give fairly specific point um, notes on it, though, so I'm a bit reluctant to be the mover. Um, point 32, and when, when staff are talking about open spaces and, and, and noted um, Logan Park and the Oval, I really need, I do want to draw attention and I was quite satisfied with the staff answer that there are other large open space sites in the city and notably from my experience Sunnyvale and Memorial Park and Peter Johnson Park and I kind of have a personal request of the city and that is please stop investing in Logan Park. Um, it's having some rather unusual effects down there um, and I will declare a personal interest here and that's the University Football Club. Clubs that have spaces down there that require grass fields are losing their spaces and are actually being squeezed out. So the biggest football club in the city only has two grass fields left. Um, and, and also things like the turf down there are putting pressure on those spaces from other clubs who see it and want to be there. And that's one aspect. So the other side of it, that means there's underinvestment in other parts of the city. So I would like to see in the future that investment being spread geographically further around the city. Um, my other conflict of interest, I'll, I'll declare while I'm here, is I sit on the ICE Stadium board as the council representative and I have a fairly good understanding of what they're doing down there with that building. To Council Benson Pope's question, they, they completely fixed that. They melted the ice, went under, they found the, cool, the heating tubes that are required to stop that iceberg forming again and reconnected them. Um, when that stadium was being built, a digger hit them and the answer was to turn them all off, which was not probably a very good answer. So they eventually pressure tested them, found the damaged ones, separated them, got it all back in. And that speaks to the high quality of the management down there at the moment, um, and Paris um, High especially running it. 
um, it is classified as a, as, as a geographically significant um, um, stadium. I'd actually say it's nationally significant. It's the best ice in the country. Um, it hosts all of the big international tournaments, and that's because of the size of the of the um, of the ice facility, and also things like good and cheap accommodation nearby. So it has a large economic impact, and I'm glad that Councillor Barker asked for that because, and I. And I'm glad the staff gave the honest answer, which is it hasn't been done yet, because I think when it is done, we'll have a better understanding of what and, should, and what we should and should not be investing in. Um, it is good that we're having a holistic approach, because the issue is that we're going to have a lot of hands out asking for stuff, and we will not be able to necessarily address all the, question, all the requests with the full funding that they'll be asking for. And we will also, and I've worked with the I Stadium in this regard, these, every one of these people requesting are going to have to figure out where they sit in the long-term planning of the city and the long-term investments of the city and they need to bring their stuff to us early and it's good now that we're reaching out to them and getting information from them so we have a, a truly holistic understanding of both our, facili our indoor facilities and our outdoor facilities. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are no other speakers and I presume you don't need a right of reply. So. I shall now put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. And at this stage, we'll have uh, seven minutes break till five past three for a uh, walk around and stretch your legs. Uh, sorry, seconded by Councillor O'Malley. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Carried.
That's budget. And so, does anyone have a question? Councillor Benson Pope. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm just trying to get a handle on what these properties are. Can you give us any information about of the 260 odds that are on the register at the moment? With oh, wrong report. Terribly. <laughs> Item 11, yes. Yep, item 11, yep. Yeah, 12 is next. So, uh, item 11, any questions? Councillor O'Malley. Uh, just to item 5 and the Waka Katahi um, co funding and all such stuff. Are we to read that, that, that renewals is coming down quite dramatically because there's no money left in Waka Katahi? <laughs> Sorry, I think it's a little bit too early for us to say there's no money with uh, Waka Kotahi, but it has been going down progressively over the years. There's a little bit of uh, work that we have to do to uh, to establish the impact of, um, of the recent events in the North Island on some funding. And if I can add, I think um, Mr Logie, who isn't here at the moment, but highlighted this morning that this is where we needed to do some work to assess what impact the changing fire rate and the, how much we've been paying ourselves for our renewals, what that impact was going to be. So that's that further work that we're looking to do. And then the background is obviously just what's happened in North Island and the massive destruction to the infrastructure up there. Do you, <coughs> will we get clarity? Do you, no, you can't answer this question, but when do you think we might get clarity on that? I think you answered your own question, <laughs> Councillor. I'll answer it. Has Waka Katahi in any way given any indication yet where they are? Yes, so we had a uh, we had a meeting with Waka Kotahi yesterday. We have a regular monthly catch up with them. It was entirely around the um, the Lower North Island East Coast rebuild efforts. Um, at this point, uh, one of the first things that Waka Kotahi will do will be looking at the kind of the kind of arrangement that they stand up to deal with the rebuild, which sounds, in my language, to be a little bit like the um, Kaikoura earthquake. Uh, recovery, rebuild organisation Nectar, um, but we don't have another catch up with them until May of this year on further details on that and or um, impacts on funding, but at the moment it's about what organisation they'll stand up to respond to Cyclone Gabriel. We won't be the only Territorial Authority giving them that feedback. It obviously will be giving them the feedback that we need to have some clarity as we get into the final version of this. I take it. Thanks. Councillor Vanivis. On page 38, we're looking at another half million dollar increase in cost, staff cost personnel. Um, um, the um, increase of uh, three more full time equivalents. Um, what are these largely for? I note that they're going to re hopefully reduce a bit of consultant cost than one from three waters, but why is it that we seem to be getting more staff all the time? So, uh, good question. Um, we, so in, in the paper we've talked about the fact that, that uh, I think we've got slightly over $100,000 in terms of consulting costs as being offset by a full-time equivalent, but um, we also have some contractors that we are employing on an hourly rate that we want to turn into full-time equivalents. So essentially, from a cost perspective, it's fairly neutral. Thank you. That's questions. Thank you very much. So, someone like to move the resolution? Councillor Malley, seconded Councillor Walker. Please speak to it. Uh, would anyone else like to speak to it? No. In which case, I'll put the resolution. You can see it on the wall behind me or in the, yeah, uh, the wall behind me. So, all those in favour, say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Item number 12, which is uh, <laughs> dust suppression. 
on unsealed roads. So. So, I welcome Mr. Hogan and Mr. Drew to the chair. Questions? Councillor Bedsford. Try it again. Um, can you give us any uh, idea of the breakdown of the nature of the properties? Um, farmhouses, lifestyle, residential, of the 260-odd that currently are on the list for suppression? Uh, yeah, I'd have to interrogate the list a wee bit more, but uh, there's a there's a broad range. There's all of what you suggest. There are um, dust suppression sites where, uh, for instance, Henry Street in Waikowiti, where there's you know many residential ac uh, residences in a row, uh, but the majority of sites are a singular household in a rural setting. Because the whole length of Henry Street, that'd be quite a like, substantial. It would be quite a substantial proportion of the 260, wouldn't it? From the highway through to where Henry Street runs out when it hits Beach Street? Correct. There's 60, I think, from memory households along there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and my second question was, Have you given? has any thought been given to um, considering the use of a targeted rate to fund this matter on the properties who choose to who are exposed to dust choose to <clears throat> want suppression? No, we didn't consider a targeted rate, just the options that are presented. Is, is there any reason for that or it just didn't get considered? There's not a... I'll answer that. We, we looked at what other councils had been doing and none of them um, reported the need for a targeted rate and had done it through um, other administrative tools. Uh, any more questions, Councillor Mayhem? Um, yes, I'm sort of somewhere between options two and option three, but I have a couple of questions. So if you were living on a dusty road and there was a lot of activity, um, and my example is city forest using Double Hill Road on a regular basis, not all of the road is affected, but there is a cluster of houses and I would be reluctant to move that they fund 100% of dust suppression. Uh, I wondered, um, and I don't think this would be a targeted rate thing, but will there be uh, instances where the council would look into their impact on house, because this is city forestry and it, they're creating the dust for people who are collecting rainwater off their roof, would there be circumstances where something like Otter Seal would be appropriate funded by the city, not the residents? Um, what I would say is that we tried to indicate in the report there will be some complexity. Uh, and in next steps, we talk about an implementation type plan. So we could consider those kind of elements, but we wanted to get council's direction first before we start going into details such as those, but, but we will need to think through some of those complexities. Um, so you're saying it's possible that you would consider the impact on residents that is not created by them? I, I would say yes, we will consider the impacts of these sites that don't fit the normal mould. Great. Um, I've got uh, Deputy Mayor Barker, Councillor Walker, Councillor Gary and Councillor O'Malley. I'd just like to point out to everyone that uh, Councillor Vandervis wishes to move option one, which may affect uh, the questions that people want to ask. So, uh, Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I just want to interrogate some of the options there and we'll, I guess we'll just start with um, option one. So. If we were to go with option one, would that be $270,000 basically for council to, to fund in the plan? Is that correct? At 50%? That's correct, of which in the annual plan budgets that you just um, proved previously, there's $110,000 already allocated. So we would be adding another 
$160,000 onto the budget that we've been looking at. Correct. And if it's a 50% subsidy then, so would it be, they're given there's 260 households approximately, so each household would therefore choose to put, a th well, be asked to put $1,000 towards the dust suppression if they wanted it. Um, yeah, correct. That I mean, as um, noted in I think paragraph thirty, go out, assess the site, quote the works, and then determine the fifty-fifty split. So would we also look at some public? God, I've had a message from someone who talks about is it Islay Street? Is that how you say I S L A Y? pronunciation, um, says it's quite unique in the city that it's a gravel road in suburban Dunedin and, and lots of local people are using it, because when we think I guess about the roads that are asking for sub, for dust suppression, kind of like really rural, but this is a rural central, so there's a lot of, one would perceive public good in, in, in that road and in the dust suppression and the amount of um, traffic going through it, so if we commit to a 50-50, are we then endangering I guess um, people who, who have a road that's basically a, a shortcut and, and is there a way of giving ourselves an out to consider the amount of public good in in these options? Yeah correct I guess I refer to the same thing I said to Councillor Mayhem there, there will be some sites that don't fit the normal mould that will need some thought and an implementation policy. So my next question is around option two, the status quo. Um, my question was, is this possible for Dunedin City Council to fund 100% of dust suppression activities within the existing budget of $110,000? Um, my question is, is it possible given that the, the budget looks like it would be $540,000? So does that throw up a whole can of worms in how the, the, the few properties that are able to be funded are funded? Correct, you wouldn't be able to um, apply treatment to the existing dust suppression register. So my next question is around, is that a disadvantage of um, DCC funding 100% of dust suppression activities is that uh, this dust suppression is subsidised by all ratepayers of whom the majority will not receive the benefits from it and I wondered if that was actually a disadvantage for pretty much all of the options, would that be correct? Uh, other than option four, correct. Uh, sorry, just trying to look at option four. So there is, how many councils do option four? So in our local area there's just Waitaki District Council who, ha who have 100% funded by resident. I'm curious as to how many residents when faced with 100% of the costs actually take up the auto ceiling on request. The feedback from other councils was that it, it definitely reduced um, the uptake when they introduced the fees. So I wonder if one of the presumptions, if we went with option one, where people have to 50% fund it, because we're looking there at $160,000 extra in the budget, is, <laughs> I don't know if they were a multiplier or divider effect of the number of people that would actually want to get their, um, their areas dust suppression, or is that making an assumption that we have no data on? C correct. Uh, um, and, and I guess if depending on the outcome of Council's decision, it'll take us a couple of years to understand what the actual cost will be. Councillor Walker. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, just a couple of questions that have emanated from other questions. I guess go, going back to um, Councillor Mayhem's question, um, are there any, um, you might not know the answer, are there any circumstances, I can actually think of one locally in, in the West Harbour, where we're talking about a bit of res reverse sensitivity, s s sensitivity coming to play, where already there has been a dusty road that's been open to development and people have built. I'm actually thinking of some like shortcut road. So is that something that is in play and will be factored in? 
Yep, and, and we speak to that in many of the disadvantages of the options, that there will be complexity that staff will need to mediate. Sure. And going back to Councillor Benson Pope's question about a targeted rate, um, is it fully off the table or is there a situation, for example, I'm thinking of how the residents in Blanket Bay again in the West Harbour banded together in terms of three water and now pay a targeted rate to get onto the reticulated system. So there was a situation like that where a dozen or so residents made an approach. Is it completely off the table? And that's probably to the... We haven't done any work on it. Um, and my sense is that we're really problematic for because it's not a permanent thing. I'll get Carolyn to see. Um, yes, and we would need to consult on it. So, you know, ideally it would be part of the 10-year plan consultation. Um, if we introduced it for the annual plan round, you'd have an amendment to the previous 10-year plan. Very good. Uh, Councillor Gary? Just a follow-up question to that. Over what period did the other councils transition from the um, oil-based option, and presumably it was at that point that they went on to the funding option? I, I presume that corresponded with the prohibition period, or was it earlier than that? And over what period did they transition in terms of the funding? Oh, I couldn't answer with... Um, great specifics, but um, a lot of the transition has come about due to planning rule changes banning the use of waste oil. Um, but a, a lot of the development in this space has been over the last five to ten years, the changes. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, two questions, um, somewhat trans. One of them was um, somewhat covered by Councillor Benson Pope. Do you have any idea of how many of these current customers are actually in a relatively built up area? In other words, there's a, there's a decent number of houses sitting in a row versus a house sitting by itself? Uh, yes, we've said in the report, excuse me if I refer to it, um, of the 159 locations, 145 locations serve a single adjacent residence. Um, and 13 locations serve multiple adjacent residences and there are 121 residents in those multiple zones areas. So the example was Henry Street and Michael Eddy have 60 houses or I think Islay Road might have seven or eight. Um, yeah, yeah cause a slightly different number than is 100, 121 the number of residents is, is the number rather than the number of locations. Um, but I reckon just looking at that, about half might be dense and then half are not dense. Um, there's 100, um, 145 residents that are, that are sitting by themselves and then 121 residents sitting in a bulk group. So roughly, you know, let's not get too carried away with the math there. Um, because my question really is, um, seal extensions were suspended a long time ago, and do, do we have a mechanism at looking at the cost effectiveness of essentially doing seal extensions that have come from the response, um, the needs come from developments that have occurred since that policy was suspended and, and we now have, and shortcut roads already come up and sh it's got lots of other reasons you would want to think of looking at shortcut road, but many more houses have gone onto that road since we stopped seal extensions, when do we have any plan to ever bring seal extensions up for assessment again? Uh, no, it wouldn't, not from this council. Um, so we're still working to the previous resolution. Um, and I guess as a broader comment um, for the New Zealand Transport Network, um, there is probably too much sealed network for the country to afford so if, um, if we're a more denser <coughs> country population density sorry um, we could afford the current sealed network that we have but largely the the um, some of the thoughts and funding around transport is that we 
uh, we have a network that has too much sealed. Uh, so I haven't been into the details of Dunedin's network, but my sense is it wouldn't be an efficient way of spending council money to seal more parts of the network. If I a slightly shorter answer, um, building on that, unless council directs otherwise, we've got no, um, there, we have no mandate to do that work. And council would need information in order to man change the differential, and I guess a definition of efficient might help before we got any further. Um, I would agree that many parts of the country don't have many houses per kilometre, but we're not going to turn state highway land into gravel into those areas. Um, so, so a qualitative statement about the whole of the network in New Zealand may not necessarily directly relate to 200 metres of road where 40 new houses have gone in in the last 10 years. Would you agree with that? And I'm just going through the four options and as I see it, if you just correct me if my math is wrong, because I'm just sort of helping us all, I think, here. Option one um, would mean the DCC would put in an additional 160 for 270 towards the 540 component. Option two, DCC would put in no more, but would still be funding 110, but would only have 110 towards the anticipated 540, so anticipated to be underfunding. Option three, we'd be putting in an extra 430, which would be the most, but we'd be funding the whole lot, but we would be now funding 540. Then option four, zero, 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 and pay for yourself. Correct. Very good. Uh, Councillor Mayhem. Um, so my question is around the 540 price tag, so that is just for bio oil. Now, I just don't, is that right? No, it would be used to fund Otter Seal um, over a t period of time. Okay, so our options say bio oil or auto seal, but um, well the the feedback I'm getting is that the auto seal, uh, the bio oil, sorry, is nowhere near as efficient as the previous oiling scheme. Why? I know it's more environmental, but it's very expensive. The auto seal pays for itself in the long term. Why are we giving the why are we having the option of one or the other in each of our options? Should we be stating otter seal when we move these? Um, well, the upfront cost to otter seal all 260 properties at once would be five times what's in front of you at the moment. So it's a way of spreading that cost out over four or five years. Okay, so I guess what I'm asking then is, um, I, I know this is a big price tag over time, um, do you think we should be looking at otter seal rather than the bio oil? Councillor, I, I draw your attention to the report to um, the first recommendation, which is a noting recommendation that we will be moving to um, otter seal operationally. So then the 540 is only for the bio oil costing, though? Uh, no, no, so we'll do a quarter of, let's just random maths, we'll do a quarter of the 260 sites in auto seal in the first year. That means the other three quarters are bio oil. And then as we work through the following year, uh, we'll do the next quarter in auto seal, and that means only... 50% of bio oiled. By the time we roll out the end, everyone's auto sealed. But there's an interim period. There's an interim period while we're bio oiling as we go through the transition. Well, why would we bio oil though? Because I can't even tell when the road has been bio oiled. So would we just. I just think that's a waste of money. I'm sorry. It's not it's not effective on high traffic areas particularly like shortcut road. <clears throat> you can't tell it's been oiled right after it's been oiled. Yeah, uh, well uh, I guess that 
tried to cover it, I suppose, but the, what we can't afford in the current budget to auto, auto seal now will be bio-oiled in the interim until we can get to an auto seal, which will be sometime between now and the next five years. Um, it's so I guess to your <coughs> point, then staff would have to mediate. So if we were to just do auto seal with the 540 and then do no bio-oiling, um, and my understanding is there is feedback uh, that bio oil is not as effective as waste oil, but it is more effective than do nothing. Uh, then staff will have to mediate who gets auto sealed and who doesn't for two or three years. So that's a disadvantage with what you're proposing, I guess. Pretty good. Uh, Councillor Ben Spoke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just on that last issue, a couple of questions. The first one in respect of the shortcut road or other rat run type roads, is that not a, de a detractor uh, uh, in the sense that if there are roads like that, there are other methods that could be used to discourage their use rather than the fact that they are a shortcut and, and people happen to like it as being an incentive to get some sort of seal or some sort of dust suppression in place? Do you see what I'm...? It, yeah, it is a potential um, consideration. Um, yeah, the other... Given the other, question, the other questions about the Kiwi do-it-yourself mentality, uh, and while I think we'd always, we'd all be glad that um, use <coughs> the use of used engine oil, recycled or not, um, has been an effective dust suppression method but hardly very good for the wider environment and welcome the regulation change about that. Are you confident or is there any evidence of people um, taking a do-it-yourself approach to their own dust suppression outside their places with God knows what sort of oil? or? Uh, is the requirement to use the contractor being followed? Uh, mostly using the contractor is being followed. There was a recent example about a year ago of a, of a DIY uh, method that didn't wasn't very successful, and ironically, we had to apply dust too to control it. Um, so yes, uh, ORC were alerted in that instance. Yeah. Very good. Deputy Mayor Barker. Some of this is quite confusing, I must say, and it's, it's challenging to find enough information between the, the difference in the, the bio oil and the auto seal, because I think the Councillor Mayhem asked a question around why we're we not just doing auto seal, all of them, and not doing the, the, the bio oil. Um, was there ever an option thought about which was to do all of the auto sealing? starting now instead of, I guess, wasting money on the um, bio oil? We, we did consider that. It's an OPEX cost and it would be a, um, yeah, it would be a $2 million rough water cost uh, in one year. And then what that means is that all of the other seals will come up for renewal at the same time. So you have these big kind of one-off hits um, so staff uh, um, recommend a transition period that that manages that kind of upfront cost and also provides a kind of ongoing, consistent, manageable um, renewal work. So just a couple of maths questions. I'm just looking at the difference between the options. So if option one adds $160,000 on to the operational budget, is it is that a nearly 0.2% rates rise, adding making it about 6.7% rates rise? Is my maths right? So that would be a rates increase of 0.2%, okay? So option two doesn't affect the budget if we kept it at 110,000. And then option three, if we were to look at that, would that add $400,000 to the um, annual plan, which would be a 0.4% rates rise. I'm going on 1% is $2 million. Is that correct? Yeah. 
the 160,000 is, um, it would take the rate increase to 6.58%. So an extra 400,000 would bring it to 6.7%. And then if we went for option four, that would save us, if it was 100% um, user pays, then it would save us $110,000, is that correct? And because we we have a, a public-private um, that's coming up in one of our papers, it, but we haven't actually formally decided on what is the public-slash-private benefit, are we making this decision too early, given that we don't have all of the information? Or is that a question for ourselves as councillors? It is a question for you to consider, but the staff, the clear recommendation from staff is that Auto Seal is a better product um, and that we should be looking to begin using that for dust suppression generally. And so staff would recommend that we should at least begin that process. The quantum, it is up to council. Um, I'll just ask a question. Uh, at this stage, because it appears to me, option one, um, fifty percent, the extra cost uh, to the budget would be one hundred and sixty. That's if all one hundred and sixty thousand. That's when. That's if all of the two hundred and sixty um, households decided to go with it. But the experience of other council has shown that that at fifty percent, there are still quite a few that drop off. So we don't have a. We probably don't have a number on that, but if we said, for argument's sake, that a third of them dropped off, that would put it down to close to 100,000. That, that's correct. The budgets are, um, have been assumed on that everyone that's on the dust register continues on the dust register, regardless of the option. So I'm correct in saying that the chances are the increase on the budget using option one would be less than 160, somewhere bound to drop off, less than 160,000 extra. So. Um, could be you know, down to if it got down to a hundred thousand, that would only be half of um, one percent. Yeah, based on um, feedback from other councils, that would be likely. Uh, and the other thing is, if we uh, funded a hundred percent of dust suppression acti um, uh, uh, activities from our hundred and ten thousand option two and just did auto seal instead of the bio oil, and then it would take us 25 years to get around because uh, auto seal, um, and that's just doing it once. Oh, don't put my maths on the spot, but it will certainly take longer. If we were going to do 100% of the funding, the only really viable option would be to do the 540, and even at that, we're going to have to do it every five years. You know, so I mean, every year we we're spending 540 every year, and the auto seal will be renewed on a given stretch of land, say Shortcut Road or whatever. Every five years, it would be done again, and that would uh, put the budget uh, up from 110 to 540,000. Is that right? Where Whereas option one would uh, put the budget up from 110,000 to possibly 210,000. That's correct. Councillor O'Malley. I think option one's already been flagged as being moved, right? Um, and based on the questioning, I think it probably will. My question is you got a house, you got a row of houses, and there's four of them, five of them on the row and three of them elect to get dust suppression and two of them say, not me, um, what do we do? It doesn't really relate to our decision today, but it will relate to how this rolls out. Yeah, that's what we allude to in terms of the uh, complexity and, and negotiation. So, yes, it will be an issue that we'll have to resolve. So we'll work with other councils that have been through this before. We'll learn from them and, and our implementation plan will be based on their learnings. Righto. So, a question? Councillor Mayhem. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. So, my question now is how will we prioritise which roads get the otter seal first? Will it literally be the squeaky wheel <laughs> gets the seal? Oh, go for the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> 
and clearly not the oil. Um, uh, in short, yes, to be uh, there, there are um, problem more. There are more problematic roads than others. Probably the the target would be the ones with a greater amount of houses on it than the than the. So this brings me back to my original question. In a road like Double Hill, where city forestry is the main perpetuator of the dust, why aren't we funding that on behalf of the five residents that it's affected? We, we can't answer that here. Um, we do acknowledge that there is further work to do to work through some of the detail of these um, exceptional sites. We, we do have a criteria to, to meet the register now and that is the sort of three factors, how far away is the residence from the road, what's the AADT, the amount of traffic going on the road and the speed of the speed zone of the road and sort of those are considered the three things that are going to make it <coughs> worse or better. So. Um, that could be a, we could come up with a similar criteria to prioritise how we work down our list. Thank you, that's good information. Radio. So, uh, Councillor Vandervis. Are you ready to speak to the motion? Uh, have you got a seconder? Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. Um, I very much appreciate that staff have gone to a lot of trouble to give us four separate options on what is obviously a pretty tricky uh, thing to negotiate, um, that they have been in uh, discussion with other councils that have been down the same dusty old road, and that they have uh, given us a recommended option, uh, which despite the complexities gives, I think, uh, a range of uh, good reasons to go for this particular option. The good reasons include the fact that we don't want to go and auto seal everything straight away because that would be a, a $2 million peak and then uh, the economies of scale would disappear for four years until you had to do it again. So you want to be rolling this stuff out over time. So I think it has to be a given that there is going to be a progressive rollout of the other seal. So that's option one speaks well to that. <clears throat> then there is the um, more complex argument about uh, public-private good. Um, the idea that um, people that live in rural, er rural areas should uh, have a, some kind of right to a dust-free environment, although desirable, um, is simply not achievable. And people choose to live in these places and pay lower rates and pay a lot less for the properties because they don't have a tar seal road that's dust-free outside of their house, homes, just the same way they're not connected to um, a town water supply and uh, other um, urban amenities. So as I see it, uh, looking at the options that are available, um, there needs to be a sharing of the benefit of being dust free. Uh, I'm very aware personally of the downsides of dust. Uh, you only have to look at the back of my car in the car park to realise that I'm regularly um, in, in the thick of it. Um, it's not healthy, it's uh, very unpleasant and if it costs anything between $200 to $1,000 a year to not have it, I think that there will be a reasonably good uptake of it and that that is, under the circumstances, probably the best that we can do. So the recommended option, I think, really is the one to go for. Uh, it's a blunt instrument like a lot of the uh, taxation and rating things that we do around this table but in this case I think it's clearly the preferable blunt instrument um, for dealing with what especially this hot summer has been a really quite testing problem. Thank you. Very good. Do we have any more speakers? Councillor Malley. Thank you Mr Mayor. Um, 266 total residents, the number 
we might expect to go down um, with this co-funding, but it's also been my experience that um, sometimes when something gets this public, a lot of people weren't aware of the scheme, so the number could very well go up. Um, but really what I want to touch on is seal extensions, um, because some of these are grouped houses, and we have stepped away from seal extensions for what might have been good reasons, and I would certainly not necessarily argue with the idea of kilometres and kilometres of sealed road out into the countryside that only had... Point of order. Sorry, seal extensions aren't on the item. Uh, we need to speak to the item, and the seal extension issue has been addressed by staff. Well, uh, it is a difficult one. However, it's not part of this motion, and so I think you've made your point, and it will come up in a future um, future meeting or report or something else. So we'll just leave it off the agenda here so that we can move along. Thank you. Oh, happy to withdraw it, um, and we'll probably end up having little seal pieces that touch each other. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. I'll just be very quick. Um, there is a line that we need to, to walk between providing a dust-free environment for residents and not passing the charges on of services that could be considered to be more targeted or certainly of benefit to a specific few. I have, uh, as the uh, council representative on the Saddle Hill Community Board, have sat around a table, as we have discussed, or more particularly they have discussed, uh, the dust suppression in the area. Uh, and I sat there listening and I heard what they were saying and they almost to a person agreed that uh, sharing of the load is far more preferential. Obviously uh, every homeowner would rather have, it, have things like this paid for completely but they also understand that somebody who lives in South, East, uh, South Dunedin or North East Valley or something that <clears throat> Only takes public transport, isn't going to be using it, should not, shouldn't be paying for uh, the dust suppression in the area. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, to acknowledge that um, the, the community boards for having their say and putting it forward. But I, that's why I'm seconding this. Is simply I have listened to the people to whom it's going to, uh, who it's going to affect, uh, and this is the uh, the option that certainly my community board put forward. Fantastic. I have uh, no more speakers, so I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Now, uh, next motion is that the Council extends the meeting beyond six hours. Uh, seeing as we're at the, uh, so, uh, seconded Councillor Walker. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Okay. Now, uh, apparently we need to alter the agenda a little uh, due to staff availability. Which item should we discuss next? With the leave of the meeting, if we could um, defer items 13 and 14 until Mr Logie is with us in the morning. That would be great. And move on to item 15 and following, which is three waters next. Do we need a resolution on that? No. no. Very good. There's no argument about that, I would imagine. So, a budget update for three waters. Item 15 on page 69. Mr Drew. Just an apology for Mr Ward, who unfortunately has an appointment right now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that he couldn't shift. Just, it was only one hour he couldn't shift. Any questions? We have no questions. Oh, yep, a question, Councillor Malik. I just think the obvious one, bringing it up, so the depreciation has increased dramatically with the revaluation of the asset. Um, to what extent are we confident in our stormwater asset valuations? Um, so the, as Mr Logie pointed out this morning, um, the valuations are going through a review. Um, so once that review and the improvement actions are um, complete, there will be confidence. Um, um, but uh, as councillors will be aware, there's still the public-private split, so we don't have uh, the stormwater assets in our asset database that are defined private, which are stormwater pipes in people's backyards. 
so that's where I'm heading basically. So we're at, we're confident on our asset valuations and, and for that stormwater that we know we have, along with the drinking water and sewer, but we don't we won't have any value. Have we put any valuation on the private? Uh, not yet, but um, staff and through the strategic work plan that was approved by council last year. Sorry, I can't remember. Um, there is a program of work to do condition assessments across all of the stormwater assets, including the private networks. So that work is in progress. Thank you. And I, this is probably again for next year, but I sort of want to prep this in advance. <clears throat> if the individual limb, someone will have it on their limb that they own five metres of, of a stormwater pipe for 10 metres down in their backyard. Um, and we have seen evidence that they simply can't afford to fix that when it happens. So we've got that fund already in place to settle in. If, if Surely that must have an impact on our asset management plan as those start to fail, would it not? Well, correct. There are um, many elements of the private network are integral to the overall functioning of the stormwater network, so yes. But in many respects, we're waiting for legislative lead now from central government as to whether that will be an issue we have to deal with in the future. Yes, and that's probably better addressed at the 28th of February council meeting. Uh, Councillor Vandervis. Depreciation has been uh, um, increased by $32 million, 91%, which is based on the latest asset revaluation. Does, is one of the contributing factors the fact that um, we haven't really uh, had 100% depreciation put aside in the past? Uh, or is it simply uh, noting that if we are to replace those assets now, that they are simply going to be that much more expensive to replace? It's more an accounting question, sorry, but my understanding is the latter. I think it's a different methodology for valuing the assets, and it's been detailed in previous reports from, the, from Mr Logie. So we have been um, funding our depreciation for the three waters renewals. And this latest massive depreciation increase is basically for, for next year. Is this uh, depreciation going to be um, increased again by 7.6% or whatever the inflation rate is for each of the subsequent coming years? That is to say, is it going to keep going up at a rate of inflation or is it going to go up at a rate of higher than inflation because of anticipated problems with supply of various materials and, and contracting? The, I've looked at Ms Allen and that is a question we can't answer, Councillor. But it, um, but to, uh, it's not, it's not a question you can perhaps answer. But can we anticipate that this isn't going to be the last increase that we're going to see for depreciation? That potentially it could go much higher uh, as time goes on. I don't think we can anticipate that um, based on what we know at the moment, because this was a, a change in accounting approach to how depreciation was um, calculated. To say any more than that, I think, would just be speculative. Thank you, oh. Thank you for that. And finally, um, uh, if we were to 100% uh, uh, depreciate the asset, supposing that we kept it, um, would that be uh, a, a, a putting aside too much, do you think, um, for uh, maintaining the asset? Um, given that it's such a massive change from what we've done before? Or um, is it a reasonable um, valuation to, for, for councils to actually say this is really what we need to put aside um, to keep this asset going in perpetuity? I think one of the challenges with Three Waters asset valuations is it's done differently for different councils. Um, and, and what I would say is that 
uh, Mr Logie has confidence in the current valuation when he looks at it against the valuations of other councils, in particular Wellington City Council? When you say current valuation, are you talking about this massively increased one? Correct. Well, C correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Thank you. A couple of questions around the fees and charges on page 76 under waste. The tankered waste charges I see, uh, contrary to most of the others, that are 3% increase. This is a 58.10% increase. What was the thinking behind that uh, fairly large percentage increase? So I'm not across the details of the model, but we have a model that... Um, that looks at the cost of providing treatment, so how much does it cost per cubic metre to treat wastewater in Dunedin, and then we look at the, the costs for trade waste for the previous year, and then um, assign the costs against what it costs versus what we've received. Understand, and so what does that cover off in terms of tankered waste? Uh, what does that cover? Uh, it covers a range of things. I guess the the most is septage from portaloos. There's also um, waste from rendering plants. It, it's all sorts of kind of liquid waste. Thank you. And my second question is around uh, is around water purchased water. And I see down under Central Water Scheme tariff for water sold by meter. Where do the contractors p that provide waters to water to farms and households who are on their own private supplies, where does that come into the charges? Is that under that section? I didn't see anywhere else where that occurs. Are, are you referring to tanker operators that take water from the network and then fill up people's tanks? So they yes. So those operators are licensed or registered, so I can't, don't know. So they have a, a hydrant with a meter on it, so they, there are a number of locations across the city they can use um, specified hydrant points and then the meter on the hydrant. Um, and so where's the charging indicated for them, in, in, or is it in, included in here or is it somewhere else? So that's for the having one of our hydrant upstands. It's the um, so I can't find it, but it's the. Would it be the bulk raw water tariff? No. Treated water per cubic meter. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor May. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I think um, Christine partially asked my question under fees and charges, the tankered waste charges. So um, if you have a septic holding tank, and my example would be um, Blue Skin Bay Library or our public toilet in Waitati that are regularly emptied out, but also any new builds, a lot of people on low-lying properties have to have a holding tank that they are clearing. So they choose um, Dakin's or Mr Vacuum, I don't know, I'm trying to think of some companies. Do they pay this fee too? So this 58% increase, will that, be, will that be applied to the waste removal private contractors and then does that come back to the homeowner, that additional cost? So rather than, you know, any community that's not on reticulated sewerage is incurring this extra waste removal expense. I can't speak to what the tank operators will do. All I can say is that they will be charged the uplift for when they dispose of tankered waste at the treatment plant. So I can predict that anyone emptying their septic tank on a regular basis or living in a low-lying area or having a holding tank is therefore going to incur a doubling in fees to 
have those tanks regularly emptied? Um, I think it would be safe to assume there'd be an increased cost uh, given the tank operator is incurring an increased cost. Very good. Uh, I think we've exhausted questions now. Councillor Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. However, if they're not connected to the reticulated system, their water charge will be lower on their rate. Is that not correct? Correct. Which is now $1,100 a year. Um, I'm getting to follow up Councillor Vandervis's question, and it's really again for next year, but I want to flag it now, because it really hasn't been in the public's eye. <coughs> If we're talking at a $32 million increased depreciation and $2 million counts to 1% rates increase, to fund that in a balanced budget, it would be a 16% rates increase. My math's all right there. I don't think I need a yes on that one. Um, and if we have a $2,700 average rate, I think the answer to that is $432 would be the increased charge. Would that, I assume that would go onto the water bill, would it not? If, if that's the cost of providing water? I'm not, I'm not in particular about the actual number of 432, but it'll be somewhere between four. If we funded the three waters depreciation, it would go on to water and drainage rates, correct? And the um, for commercial customers, the metered water? Very good. So um, I'll just touch it in speech this time. Very good. So thank you very much. Oh, it's a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a general question, Mr. Drew. Um, in the context of, I appreciate the difficulty in the context of uh, the volatility of this whole area, what, if any, work is continuing around the investigations of alternate sewage disposal methods for the North, methods for the North Coast? thinking, bearing in mind the issues that have been raised at Warrington in particular, but also in the Bluescombe Bay area and other developments in uh, Waitati that have been required to um, have a centrally managed system for their whole development with a view to eventually the city picking up that effluent. Is any work continuing at the moment about that or is that all in the too difficult basket? No, that's a live project. It's part of the strategic work program. So there is ongoing work. We um, have project governance meetings. We're connected with Okaha, who are supporting the work. Um, and uh, as the future development strategy work has progressed, we'll need to line up the Three Waters system plan, uh, master plan work with the future development strategy. Uh, we're still working through better off funding, but not the not the funding of work, but the funding of the investigations. That's funded. Yeah, correct. Thank you, Councillor Hulan. <coughs> Thank you. Um, with the amount that Councillor O'Malley um, mentioned that might be put on to ratepayers, would that be a cost that DCC would incur? and we'd have to charge that for having those services, or would that be the new entity? But do we not, we possibly don't know that yet. Oh, so um, if service delivery reform was to occur and um, Dean's assets were transferred to a new entity, they would pick up the cost of charging ratepayers and covering <coughs> depreciation. Right. So, that, so that cost, if it was increased, would go back to the new entity? So we're not proposing in our draft budgets to cover that cost because of the uncertainty with but but if our assets transfer to the new entity they'd have to consider how they wanted to then um, recover that cost. Radio. Uh, so we've done with questions. Thanks very much, Mr. Drew. Would someone like to propose the motion? Thank you very much, Councillor O'Malley. Do we have a seconder? Seconder, anyone to second that? Councillor Lucas. Would you like to speak to it? Councillor Romelli. Yeah, just um, 
there's really nothing particularly unusual in this annual plan budget, and I just hope I can get through the end of the sentence. Um, this should be moved on to next year, but by time this time next year, we will have certainty as to what we're facing. And something I've been saying, maybe not loud enough, is that the undervaluation of the asset and the way we've been evaluated means we have not been funding the depreciation correctly. That is basically what central government is also saying. Um, what I like about this, I know this, you might go, wow, is that this adds up to 1,600, which is actually less than the 2,200 that the government was predicting that would be if it stayed on our asset hand, which will obviously be something we debate in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and thank you for the leave of not speaking directly to the item. Thank you. Uh, any other speakers? No, nope. then I'll put the motion, as you can see on the screen in front of you. Uh, all those in favour, say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Item 16. Mr Pickford will be coming to answer questions. Are there any? Councillor Lucas. Thank you. Um, I note that in this you've included a 2% increase in the Otago Museum levy. Um, what was the basis for including only 2%? Uh, so through two years ago we um, had a conversation with the museum and set down the, the increases up to the LTP and 2% is what was built into the budget. So, and that, we picked up that conversation with the museum just recently and confirmed that's what we're putting in the draft for consideration. Councillor Gary. Um, thank you. Mr Drew, in the fees and charges around Alberston, I noticed that um, there are still so many different fees and charges. Has any thought been given um, to consolidating those in any way? They're all very valid, but I just wondered if that had ever been part of the discussion. Through the chair, I, uh, to be honest, no, I, I haven't had that conversation um, with the manager, but um, there are a lot of fees, but they do offer a lot of different services with, with different sectors that they're providing service to, whether it's education or um, special interest groups and different levels of tours. Um, but I will pick that up with, with the team. Well, I would just add, sorry, I would just add that we've signalled already that fees and charges and a review more holistically across the council's fees and charges is something that we'll be looking to do that will get wrapped up in that. Thank you. And my second one, just a, a detail on page 79, um, C at the top of the page. Um, the, can you speak to the um, external revenue budget is reduced mainly due to reduced revenue from the collection rental? Can you talk more about that? Uh, certainly, so the, we're seeing a, a significant decline in the number of DVD rentals that, we've, um, that we have through that collection, and it's a, it's a legacy collection. It's very hard to um, actually find DVDs nowadays. So this is just reflective of the actual activity, um, and so we decided that relative, it, it wasn't really worth um, um, having that revenue line in there because it's so, so minimal. Uh, most people are using streaming services. And this was a way of providing a, 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 a service to the community uh, for those folk who maybe couldn't afford those streaming services. So would you look at phasing the DVDs out eventually? Would that be part of what you're thinking? Longer term, that would be, that would be likely. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any more questions. So, so thank you, Mr Pickford. And uh, Councillor Gary is ready to move the motion. It signals you want to move the resolution. Seconded, Councillor Acklin. I'll now put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Uh, 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 <laughs> thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll be quick. Um, because I think it's important to speak to this because it's the cultural part of our city. Uh, and I really think that these facilities punch above their weight uh, in terms of adding to the livability and attractiveness of our city and attracting people here. Um, we've got some real jewels in the crown in this collection here and uh, the importance of the library in um, particular uh, for social wellbeing is very evident. Um, 
and we've added a book bus to our library contribution if we see how that is used around the community and the way it engages and the potential for that. Um, so I'm very happy to support this uh, and the fees and charges changes have been kept to a minimum, 0% um, mostly, I think, almost all, which is great. Uh, and that speaks to it being accessible to the community. So thank you, staff, for the report. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against. Carried. Thank you, and my apologies. Uh, next item is item 17, community and planning. Mr Pickford is back to the chair. And Ben. Mr. Hendra. And Mr. Hendra, yes. And <laughs> Mr. Drew. Questions? Oh, did you want to speak to the port at all? Uh, just um, in relation to uh, Councillor Gilbert's question at the very beginning of the day regarding the uh, Thieves Alley market. So there's a $60 non commercial rate for, for stalls and $110 for commercial um, stalls and but 150 this year, 150 in total? Uh, 182. Yeah, 182 stalls in total at Farmer's Market this year. Sorry, Thief Sally. So you happy to take questions? Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just um, <coughs> point eight, just looking for clarification around uh, that cost there, suggesting that it accrues to the V2 Greenfield rezoning legal um, legal fees. Uh, and the, the the appeals period doesn't close till March 21st. So it, what does that actually apply to? Is it the NPS HPL stuff we did or not? Uh, no, it was a... Uh cut and paste there, the um, intent of it was for any appeals uh, remaining on 2GP, uh, any appeals on variation 2 and development and notification of variation 3. Thank you. That appears to be the end of questions. Do have it? Oh, Councillor Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I have kind of a bunch of questions on different pieces, but anyway, I'll, I'll start with the um, community development and events where I see there's a 17% budget increase, and I just wanted to tease out some of the figures around that, especially, I guess, around the increase in events. So I see that there's um, page 89, 6A, an increase of 384 for FIFA, and then it also says that there is a revenue of 312 thousand dollars from the reserves and recreational facilities group budget so do those kind of cancel each other out correct thank you and then i just wonder about the reinstatement of event costs for new year's eve and thieves alley given that we had them this year were they unbudgeted we met them with an existing budgets so did something if you've got existing budgets, <laughs> I'm just trying to understand why it's, why, why it's there to be reinstated if there's existing budget that covered it. Did, did we not do something else? So previous, the previous uh, New Year's and Thieves Alley events was, was cancelled due to the red traffic light system. And when we were looking for savings uh, for this current financial year, um, we, re we reduced those budgets significantly. So uh, we just cut the cloth accordingly. Um, to deliver those, but it was it was a challenge to deliver those, and we've put those back in um, 100k for New Year, approximately, and 40k for Thieves Alley. So my next question is just around the of uh, so, sorry, so that was a hundred thousand dollars for New Year's Eve, and then what was it for Thieves Alley? Was that 60? 40. So the other 260 thousand dollars. Is it just for Matariki or are there other events? It's Puaka Matariki and, and other various events. 
So given that we had a submission to the long-term plan asking for more money for the, um, the grants funding for events that our community put on, was that looked at as an option for asking for or is the intention to do more events in-house? I'm not sure if this answers your question, Councillor, but we, um, as part of um, the work that we're looking at for the strategic refresh, um, we are looking at our events um, and our funding. And there is an events plan which was developed in 2018. So we are looking at that review presently and as part of that strategic refresh work into the LTP, there will be um, the chance to review events and the events funding. And I'll just add, and, and we circulated the answer um, earlier to the question, that there was um, a placeholder amount included in the draft budgets of circa $180. 160 I believe. Sorry, I've cut you off. <laughs> 160 I thought it was 180 but uh, circa that amount, and it was a placeholder that was missed in, um, when we were doing the reviews, and that will um, be tweaked when we, uh, before the budgets come back in May. So that would almost pay for the for the surfacing treatment that we had that point just pointing out. Anyway, moving on to my next question, um, just on the the planning side, is there a heritage action plan in the work plan for next year, or in any work plan? No, just implementation of the current work plan, current heritage plan. So I note that the current. Um, Heritage strategy is from 2007, so I don't know if we're talking about different things because we don't think we have a heritage action plan. No, I think you are talking about different things. So there isn't a current heritage action plan. Is, I'll just ask the Chief Executive, is this a good time for me to signal that I'd like to move that, we de that staff develop a heritage action plan? Would there be a subsequent motion? It, it, I don't know if this has been moved yet, but if you were the mover, it would be part of this motion and you could make it part C. Councillor Lucas. Thank you. If I can just follow up on Councillor Barker's questions to do with FIFA. Um, it's not actually, we don't actually break even. It is actually quite a significant cost to Council, if <laughs> my math is correct, something like that. Yes, correct. It's, yeah. I mean, there's because the cost of fever is spread across um, lots of areas of council. Um, significant part is traffic management. Uh, the fan zone is a significant cost, so it's not all contained just within here. Um, but there is a there is a cost spread. But they, these were these were put together when we initially made the bid for FIFA. Sorry, and similarly with Masters Games, Masters Games is actually an increase in net cost of about eighty thousand. Would that be correct? So the increase that the uh, due to FIFA is because it's an on year, so we have an off and an on year. So for 2024, in February, it'll be an on year, so hence the increase. Right. Question for the question, Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also giving my colleague a little bit of time. Um, uh, just two clarifications. One, uh, not to belabour the point, but today is my day for belabouring points. The thieves alley charges you just uh, told us, is that pre or post COVID? So those were the charges for this event just gone. Perfect. And no, actually there is no end. Uh, so going back to FIFA uh, with the extra charges that, or the, the costs that are being mentioned, um, roughly how many unique visitors are we expecting in the city for FIFA? Do we have a number on that? The estimates are 100 and, uh, sorry, 17,012 bed nights, yeah. 12 bed nights, um, which is I mean, a significant impact when you compare it to, to a concert, for example, which you might get a couple of bed nights, um, but it's um, a significant impact for the city with 24 million uh, estimated return to the city. 12 bed nights? Yes. 12, 12 bed nights, yeah. Yeah, over... 
in the normal uh, ones I've been uh, with through hotels, we get the cumulative, not the individual bed nights. So, twelve over seventeen thousand seems like a ridiculously ridiculously small number. Uh, and the other question is, uh, roughly how many people are likely to be viewing? Do we know? One point five billion. One point five billion. We're done with questions. Very good. Uh, so, uh, Deputy Mayor Barker, thank you very much, gentlemen. Deputy Mayor Barker has indicated that you'd like to move a resolution. I'd like to move. That we, I'd like to move that we approve the operating draft operating budget for the community and planning group. Uh, is above, <laughs> and B, approve the draft fees and charges, and then ask staff to develop a heritage action plan in time for the long-term plan in January 2024. So I just want to speak to a couple of... Oh, I need a seconder. Thank you. So, moving right along, um, I ask some questions around events because I did have a concern that the the events budget was going up by 12% um, and that we haven't really got a strategy around it so I was really pleased to hear that the events plan of 2018 is being reviewed and I also asked a question around whether they'd look, looked at putting more money into the events grants poll because I sit on the um, grants subcommittee and, and also we've, we've set through the long term plan where People from the uh, events community have come and said that they're really struggling to, to get funding for the events, who want to start new events, have an amazing creative city, etc. So I'm really glad to see that in play as part of, we keep talking about a strategic refresh, but we will get there for the long term plan. The reason that I um, ask about the Heritage Action Plan is that we do have a dusty old strategy. We can all do the maths on this, uh, August 2007, so this is probably as ancient, it is a special piece of our heritage I guess, um, and it's time to update it. We've all been reading in the ODT, seeing the letters to the editor, seeing the articles that people are doing about the loss of heritage buildings and the facts that our hands are a little bit tired and we don't seem to have our each together around heritage buildings and one of my key things that I absolutely want to focus on is having a heritage action plan so we can protect our heritage, enhance our heritage and actually have a, have a, a planned approach to it, um, address the issues in a holistic way. We need to address things like demolition by neglect. Everyone drives around the town, sees those buildings falling down, reads about them in the paper. It's not a good look for us as the... Um, the <laughs> heritage capital of New Zealand. I also want us to look at some heritage precinct because sometimes we are going to have to make some tough decisions about what buildings we may keep and what but what buildings are kind of falling a little bit behind. I looked up somewhere and we've actually got, um, where did I write that note, about 860 listed heritage sites in Dunedin. It's huge. We are obviously the heritage capital. I'd love us to become a, a centre of excellence for heritage. We've put a lot of money into restoring the um, railway station, one of the most photographed buildings in the southern, southern hemisphere, and we're also putting money into restoring our own heritage buildings. But we need to be able to have the tradespeople to do that, so we actually need to put the pipeline in. And I was um, really pleased last week to see that the Polytech were putting in a Master of Architecture, I think it was, or an architecture degree, with an emphasis on heritage. So we can really build on that stuff and build on having the tradespeople available. It has a huge role in economic development. Over 50% of visitors to Dunedin came because of the heritage. And when we talk about the value of heritage to, um, of tourism to Dunedin, that was worth over $700 million GDP and employs a huge amount. So heritage isn't just that, that nice to have old buildings kind of thing. It is an absolutely vibrant um, and economic powerhouse for us. We do need to protect our historic heritage from inappropriate subdivision. Um, and promote best practice in the management of heritage and also create a pathway for sustainable management of Dunedin's heritage because we haven't had a pathway, we've had a kind of um, piecemeal approach towards it. It's vital to get this done as soon as possible because we need action kind of yesterday. The plan's 2007, it's time to move. Um, I would welcome everyone's support for this really important piece of work for our heritage city. Thank you. 
Councillor Walker. Thank you. Um, pretty hard not to support that passionate um, uh, appeal there, Councillor Barker, and I support ABC, and thank you for bringing this. I just want to briefly uh, mention a couple of things, just for the pedants amongst us, can we please put a hyphen in long term? Um, and I just want to remind councillors, when we're looking at the, th of the costs of things like the Masters Games and uh, the biggest female sporting event on the planet, <coughs> we just can't, we can't forget the accrued benefits that that come to this city, particularly the massive international exposure and the phenomenal amount of bed nights, uh, coffee drunk, beer drunk and food eaten and the support that that provides uh, to our community and events like World Cups last, they have a long legacy. So um, just, just, just a reminder to be cognizant of that. Thank you. Councillor Gary. And speaking to the Community Board Chair of the Banks Peninsula Community Board at the weekend for a particular reason, uh, his words to me were, I've just come for the, from the Pofuri for the sailing GPS, I think it is, I think that's the right initials, um, reclamation, and he said if you want something done quickly, uh, have a sailing event. Well, we're not likely to have that anytime soon in an international sense, uh, but we do have FIFA. And um, I think Councillor Barker is absolutely correct that we, we shouldn't underestimate uh, events such as FIFA uh, for putting Ōtapoti Dunedin on the map um, and the importance of that. And, and also the community events that we put on. Um, our new event, Matariki for Matariki, uh, was a, a great draw card for our community, adds to the vibrancy of our city. Um, and I spent a lot of my weekend encouraging bankers from uh, Sydney to come and visit Dunedin. I was wearing a Dunedin t-shirt at the time and, and clearly uh, the ones who'd been here briefly, every single one of them talked about um, the vibrancy of our city, the character of our city, the, the compactness and all of the attractions. I recall two Le Clay Le Tre Clefs. Uh, I don't think I've got that right. Le Tre Clay. No, that still isn't right. It's the concierges, the 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 echel top echelon of concierges in New Zealand, uh, who came for an AGM here last year, and I uh, was speaking to a number of them at the opening night, and they were adamant that the heritage aspect of our city uh, was a huge draw card. They were astonished. Many of them had never been to Dunedin and that was something that had really opened their eyes. And Councillor Barker's right. Um, we do need to keep our pipeline of, um, of specialist bespoke craftspeople. We have extraordinary skills here in terms of stone masonry uh, and stained glass and other such crafts that lend themselves to the restoration of heritage buildings and I think uh, I'm very happy to support uh, this motion and uh, the addition of section C around a heritage action plan. Councillor Vandervis. Regarding C and to develop a heritage action plan, heritage action plan, um, it's a laudable idea but I wonder first, from the point of view of staff, where would you start? A heritage action plan could be a one-page summary of, of what would be desirables, or it could be years of detailed actions along the line of a climate action plan uh, where you put enormous amounts of staff resource into something uh, for which there is no real uh, effective possible action available. I'm concerned that um, if we put a lot of resource into an action plan uh, that um, the uh, real value of the heritage fund in uh, encouraging building owners to maintain their buildings uh, might get compromised. Um, I'm all for having a plan if our Chief Executive can assure us that it can be done uh, uh, relatively cheaply in summary form um, and, and throw some ideas out there. Uh, what of course would need to follow if we had an action plan is 
financing the actions, this could be quite considerable. And uh, I would be very interested to see what kind of actions, other than what we are already doing with the Heritage Fund, what other actions would actually have a, uh, a positive effect on maintaining the heritage character and heritage buildings of Dunedin. So um, I would like, if possible, for the Chief Executive to give some idea of how staff would view uh, being asked to develop a heritage action plan um, and some idea of what that might cost and the ongoing for action um, uh, prior to voting for it. I'd like to vote for it but I'm concerned that um, it may not be effective or even affordable. Well Mr Mayor it will be irregular for me to talk at this point but with the leave of the meeting, I am happy. Um, so, Councillor Barker spoke to me in advance of moving this, and we discussed um, how um, doable it was um, in line with the work that is happening in both um, the planning teams and the regulatory teams. Um, I am comfortable that we have the capacity to pull something together um, in, t in the time frame that's been asked. That's a perfect answer from my point of view, and thank you very much, and it allows me to vote for it with ease. Thank you. Councillor Hulan. Thank you. Yes, our CEO has sort of touched on that slightly, what I was going to say, but I'll add a little bit further. But I was just going to say, because a few councillors have raised this demolition by neglect a few times, and what I would say to everyone around this table is um, just wait. It's a, a paper that is going to come to the Customer and Regulatory Committee, and we will have advice from the staff, and it will be a report looking at a whole lot of different options because there are quite huge implications with that. And also, I'm, I noted that um, the Deputy Mayor mentioned that in relation to solely heritage buildings, and I'm very aware from the initial discussions we've had that it's not something that always just relates to solely heritage buildings, so we need to be careful with some of the wording around that, but I'm looking forward to that report and um, hearing the expert advice from our staff and others around that topic. Thank you. Councillor Gilbert. Uh, thank you. Just very briefly, I too spoke to uh, the concierge community when they came, and the the name is the Le Clef d'Or. No problems. And they, yes, they said to me exactly the same thing as you were saying that they were just to a person blown away by the history. They knew we were were old, but they didn't realise how much we had it on display. And the only other thing I would say is. I regularly see people and point people in the direction to take photos of the likes of Fortune Theatre, the train station and any other myriad of our heritage buildings. I have never once seen somebody take a photo of a tilt slab um, building nor sent them in the direction of something like the Big Safe Furniture Building. So having a heritage action plan makes the utmost sense to me. Very good. We seem to have uh, speakers. Your right of reply. Just like to thank everyone for their enthusiasm, and I thank the CEO for allaying um, Councillor Van der Vis's concerns about the plan. I think we already have some really good building blocks. It's not like this this plan would come out of nowhere. We've got a good heritage strategy. We just need to update it and make sure that we we have some actionable items on it. Fantastic. So at this stage, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. And on that note, uh, we'll finish for the day, and uh, because we need to leave something for tomorrow. And uh, the Chief would also like us to, uh, would like to update us on some items. Once we lose the media, though, bless you all. <laughs>